Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Welcome back, Senators. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees will lodge proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, just briefly before we move on, as I've advised uh, whips and leaders, Upon the call, calling of divisions, we will be recommencing locking the doors again. The doors will be kept open during the sittings of the Senate, but they will be closed by attendance for the purposes of the count. Secondly, I'd like to offer my particular thanks to the Usher of the Black Rod and his staff and ACT Health and for the understanding of my colleagues and their staff from Western Australia uh, for their cooperation and particularly the assistance of ACT Health and the Usher of the Black Rod over the weekend during a, a, a difficult circumstance. Thank you, Senators. The clerk. We go to the Minister who has a message. Senator Rustin. Oh, oh no, I have, I have it. Oh, there we go. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Improved Home Care Payment Administration No. 2 Bill 2020 for concurrence. Senator Rustin. I move be read a first time. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law in relation to home care subsidy and for related purposes. Senator Rustin. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator McAllister. Uh, supporting this bill. Uh, as outlined in the explanatory memorandum, the purpose of the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Improved Home Care Payment Administration No. 2 Bill 2020 amends the administration arrangements of paying home care subsidy to approved providers. This is the next phase of amendments to the home care payment arrangements. The first bill changed the payment of home care subsidy to approved providers from being paid in advance to being paid in arrears. Under this bill, home care providers will only be paid subsidy for the care and services delivered to a home care recipient during a month, with Services Australia retaining the unspent subsidy for which a home care recipient is eligible to receive each month. This changes the current arrangement whereby the Commonwealth will hold the unspent funds rather than the approved service providers. The explanatory memorandum states these changes will provide for better transparency over the use of home care funds. The bill will introduce a mechanism whereby providers who elect to return unspent funds can start doing so within six months of the bill coming into effect. Providers who elect to return unspent funds will do this through a 100 per cent subsidy reduction until the unspent funds are exhausted. Any unspent Commonwealth subsidy withheld as a result of this bill will be available for a provider to draw down on behalf of a home care recipient as care and services are provided in the future. There is no change to the consumer's access to their full subsidy and no change to the treatment of consumer contributions. In the lead-up to introducing this legislation, the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians sought the advice of ACFA. I understand the government is expecting to implement these changes by September 2021. I do want to put on record Labor's concerns. Firstly, there has been a growing concern around the increasing amount of unspent home care funds that are currently held by the approved provider. These unspent funds are a combination of the Commonwealth subsidy and consumer contributions. 
According to the Aged Care Financing Authority in its eighth report released in July this year, unspent funds continue to increase significantly, with home care providers holding $751 million at 30 June 2019, an increase of 39 per cent from the previous year, where $539 million was held at 30 June 2018. Based on the current rate at which unspent funds are increasing, ACFA estimates they could be around $1 billion by 30 June 2020, although it may be even higher due to some consumers putting their services on hold during COVID-19. According to aged care accountant Stuart Brown, the average unspent funds per client is approximately $7,000. As with the first bill, there remains an increase in financial risk for some smaller service providers and those in regional, rural and remote areas that don't have adequate cash flows to deal with the payment changes and are unable to hold unspent funds. As suggested in the ACFA report, some service providers may have to revert to finding other financing arrangements, including loans or equity injections. Some service providers are concerned that as a result of cash flow pressures arising from changes, they may be reluctant to take on new consumers during the transition phase. With the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety to hand down its final report in February next year, there may be more reform required for the home care payment system. This leads me on to the Morrison government's lack of serious reform across the home care system. We know that the Morrison government has turned its back on older Australians waiting for care and support in their own homes. And if the Morrison government really cared, it would have done more for older Australians. This month marks the fourth anniversary of the government's increasing choice in home care reforms. Almost four years on, and the question is what has been achieved for older Australians choosing to receive aged care services in their own home? Well, there's not much to show for it is there. These reforms have done nothing to address the growing home care package waitlist. There have consistently been 100,000 older Australians waiting for their approved home care package over the past two years. Shame. More than 100,000 older Australians are on a never-ending wait list, and sadly, more than 30,000 older Australians died over three years still waiting for their approved home care package. More than 32,000 older Australians entered residential aged care prematurely over a two-year period because they could not access their approved home care package. Waitlist times have blown out. Older Australians waiting for their high-level package are waiting almost three years, three years to get the care that they have been approved for. Now, the government has made improvements to the transparency of home care fees. However, we are still getting reports from people all over the country about rising costs. People are concerned about administrative fees, about exit fees, about other fees they are being charged and that is limiting the amount of care and the hours that people are able to receive. Now, the former minister said he would have a look at the fees and he was going to do something about this, but again there doesn't seem to be any action from the government on that. We do need to hear from the government about whether or not he is going to do something about these fees and the concerns that I'm sure are being communicated to all of the people on the other side in their electorate offices as well. If we're getting them from all over the country, then the government must be too. Then there is the Royal Commission's uh, interim report, which was handed down in October 2019. In that report, tellingly titled Neglect, the Commission has put forward three recommendations that required urgent action. They recommended that the Morrison government urgently fix the home care package's waitlist that was described as cruel, unfair and discriminatory. But has that been fixed? Has that waitlist been fixed? No, it has not. The government's response to the interim report was woefully inadequate—a meagre 10,000 packages when the waitlist at that time was 119,000 persons long—119,000 older Australians without the care and support they were approved for. Now, this was a mere drop in the ocean when you consider how chronic this never-ending waitlist is and the impact it has on older Australians, their families, their carers and their loved ones. But this is the hallmark of this Prime Minister. It's the hallmark of the Morrison government, drip-feeding home care packages on an ad hoc basis, the majority of which are not the higher level packages that tens of thousands of older Australians have been approved for, are entitled to and continue to wait for. 
The Morrison government has no plan to deal with the growing waitlist, no plan to deal with future demand, no plan to help the older Australians who need care right now, and this government needs to do better. Sorry. Uh, Senator Seward. Uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Improved Home Care Payment Administration No. 2 Bill of 2020. This bill builds on the changes that were passed at the end of 2020 around the way home care subsidies are paid to providers. It will ensure that providers are only paid home care subsidies for the services they actually provide to the consumer, instead of receiving the full subsidy each month regardless of services delivered. This bill also makes changes to unspent funds from September this year. The Commonwealth will now retain unspent funds on behalf of the home care recipients instead of approved providers. Providers will also be able to return unspent funds to the Commonwealth within six months of this bill coming into effect. Unspent funds have been an ongoing issue in aged care. The current pool of unspent, unspent funds sits, sits at around $900 million. Unspent funds provide older Australians with flexibility to pay for future care needs or budget for unforeseen events. However, there have been serious problems in allowing providers to hold on to this money. Some providers have been using these funds um, as part of their working capital and, and make money from interest earned, sometimes even allowing the money to be held by a third party. This practice does not encourage, encourage openness and transparency in the way consumers' funds are being used. The Australian Greens support this bill because it introduces a new level of transparency to the way home care subsidies are paid to providers. However, I would like to raise some serious concerns. Um, concerns we have with the implementation of the new payment arrangements um, and other matters. During the consultation phase of this bill, some providers raised concerns about the costs that would be incurred implementing these changes. The Australian Greens share the concerns raised by COTA that these changes must not adversely impact on the outcomes for older people and their families. I will be seeking assurances from the minister that this bill will not result in providers passing on additional fees and charges to home care recipients and indicate that I will be seeking uh, a short, hopefully, um, committee of the whole to address some of the, these issues. This bill also introduces um, or, uh, administrative uh, changes to software and business systems for both providers and the, com and the government. Some stakeholders raised uh, some concerns about the capacity of Services Australia, and I don't blame them, to implement the required changes to their systems to allow for a smooth transition. I would like to take this opportunity to again urge the government to continue its discussions with providers and put in place a robust transition plan. These changes should not result in any disruptions to the delivery of home care. I don't want to see any older Australians left disadvantaged by these changes. As providers have traditionally held on to unspent funds, some are concerned about how these changes will impact their financial viability. This is especially concerning for providers who are operating in thin markets who might find it difficult to adjust to the new, syst to the new systems and arrangements. I understand providers will be eligible for transition support funding and businesses and business advisory supports if needed. The Australian Greens will be monitoring this process closely. We do not want to see aged care providers failing because of poor support during this transition phase. This bill takes a small step towards improving transparency and accountability in aged care, but there's still a lot of work to do in this space. I'm convinced that a fundamental lack of transparency, especially around funding, has contributed to some of the abuse and neglect we see in aged care. There is currently no requirement for providers to publicly report on how government funding is being used. This means that we do not have access to public information on the number and skills mix of staff, staffing qualifications and training, the amount of money spent on direct and indirect care, including medication and food. Without improved transparency and accountability across the aged care sector, we will never see the level of reform and change we so desperately need. I have a range of questions that I will put to the minister, uh, or that I want to put to the minister during, as I indicated, the whole committee of the whole stage. Some of these questions regard the issue of protected information under, under Division 86 of the Aged Care Act. For years, stakeholders and constituents have raised concerns over the 
uh, over the years about the definition of protected information under the Act. COTA believed that the broad definition of protected information means that very little information about complaints or decisions is published. Access to information about family members in aged care facilities or information about complaints is often denied on the basis that it is interpreted as protected information under the relevant acts. This distracts from the community's confidence in the complaints system. One constituent who has contacted my office um, has made appeals right up to the High Court but never got to the bottom of the understaffing issues in the aged care facility that his mum was living in. The department Commission and courts have all denied this constituent access to information on the basis that it is considered, in inverted commas, protected information under the Act. People should be able to access information easily about the experiences of their family members in aged care facilities. This is an extraordinarily uh, concerning uh, matter, and I will be asking questions about it as I articulate it. One of the key issues here is how we, obviously, fundamentally, is how we look after older Australians and how older Australians are treated in aged care, whether it be home care or in residential aged care. But we also need to think about the journey before somebody is in the aged care system and when they are applying for an aged care package. And at the moment, it is my belief that we are seeing more people having to enter uh, or having to apply for uh, going to residential aged care because we are not managing the journey into home care, home care supports properly. We have ad hoc systems across the country where information is not provided to the older person or to their family. Services are not connected up. And we need to be thinking about that very, very clearly because at the moment people are having more uh, incidences, more falls, more lack of attention, a lack of understanding of people's journeys into uh, aged care is not thoroughly being addressed by, people's, uh, by hospital services, by uh, GP clinics, by anybody that comes into contact with, a, an, with an older person. Sometimes it's the luck of the draw, depending on who you get as your contact person or as your support person when an older person has an incident. That has to stop in this country. We need to be making sure that we are providing the sorts of services that support older Australians in their home, if that's why they want to stay, or in residential care that provides support to family members and an information flow and transparency about how decisions are being made, what decisions are being made and how money is being spent. Finally, I would like to foreshadow, uh, I would like to foreshadow a second reading amendment I have circulated that notes that this bill does nothing to address the urgent need for additional home care packages. Every year, 19,000 people who are approved by government for home care are forced into residential aged care before they receive a package. We need the government to act immediately to ensure that home care package, wait that home care package waiting lists are cleared by 31 December 2021 and that people in already receiving aged care packages are actually receiving the aged care package that meets their needs and that people aren't forced to take a lower package because they can't get access to uh, aged care package three and four. And you don't get people having to second guess the system because they, can't, because they know that they'll have to wait a long time to get an aged care package that actually meets people's needs. What you're getting at the moment, which the government said they wanted to avoid, is people staying on CHSP rather than going in onto an aged care package of one or two or three or four, because you're actually getting support, better support from the CHSP and less hassle if you're on that particular package or that particular funding round, rather than going into the aged care system. People don't know when to actually get an ACAT done, because we're not properly got the system meeting people's needs. And I speak from personal experience here, so I actually have some 
knowledge of the troubles that people are having actually trying to get services, joined up services in the system. We have to do better in this country. I'll be asking the minister some questions around the funding package, around this bill and around the funding that's currently available for these packages. Because older Australians' home care needs are not being met, that is very clear. While people are passing away before they can actually get the care they need, while they are sitting on packages that don't meet their needs, while they're not getting access to accountability and transparency, we cannot claim, and we know that because we have a Royal Commission on right now, we cannot claim that this system is meeting the needs of older Australians, their families and carers and support people. We need change. We need it urgency, urgently. This bill makes part of that step. But there's a lot more that needs to be done in this country so that we can assure older Australians that they have a system that will meet their needs, that will provide the care that they need, will reassure families that their loved ones are getting the appropriate level of care when they need it and where they want it. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Sheldon. Oh, um, just before you speak, Senator Sheldon, um, Senator Seawitt, do you want to formally move that second reader? My yes. second reader amendment as circulated in the chamber. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Deputy <laughs> Chair. I, I rise to speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Improvement Home Care, Home Care Payment Administration Bill. Along with my Labor colleagues, I ask this bill be referred to the selection of bills committee for further scrutiny. Under the changes contained within this bill, home care providers will only be paid for care and services delivered to a home care recipient during a month, while Services Australia will retain the unspent money that a home care recipient is eligible to receive each month. In other words, rather than service providers holding on to unspent subsidies, the Commonwealth Government will. Labor understands the rationale of this change. Currently, many aged care providers are holding on to large and growing pools of unspent subsidy money, and these measures provide a degree of probity for these balances. Aged care accounts, accountants Stuart Brown estimate the amount of unspent subsidies could already exceed $1 billion. And yet, while the sums of money grows, the government continually fails to provide enough funded places. There are more than 100,000 older Australians waiting for care. Like most legislation this government proposes, this bill is another wasted opportunity. The government has missed a chance to act on the tragic shortcomings in our aged care system. According to the report on government services in 2021, in 2019-20, there were around 840,000 older Australians on the Commonwealth Home Support Program, which is the entry-level support package for those living independently in their own homes. These recipients receive basic services like domestic assistance, personal care, social support, allied health and respite services. There were a further 172,000 clients of home care packages, which are more intensive packages for people who require additional care in their homes like help with showering or clinical care. That is over a million Australians taking advantage of home care services. But these most advanced home care services are not adequate for the needs of older Australians. More than a third of older people who are living in households and in need of assistance reported that their needs were not being fully met. One third. This increases to 42 per cent for those with a profound or severe disability. With these sorts of numbers, it's clear we are failing our older Australians. The recipients of these packages are in their late 80s, maybe their 90s, with chronic or terminal illness and they are waiting up to three years to receive the services they need to function. The ABC reported just recently, in September last year, a story about Evelyn Mikulev. Evelyn is 93, has dementia and can no longer walk. 
Her daughter Anne and Anne's husband Steve use a hoist to get her out of bed and into a wheelchair every day. They feed, dress and take care of her. Despite the relentless work, they do not want to send her to a nursing home, particularly due to the threat of COVID. Evelyn gets by in a low-level home care package worth $15,000 a year. She was approved for the highest package available worth $50,000 a year in May last year. But like more than 100,000 older Australians, she is still waiting for the federal government to fund it. In the meantime, her home care provider charges as much as $550 a month just on administration. A third of her $15,000 package is gone before her family have used the money on the simplest things, like a carer to help Evelyn shower. The interim report of the Royal Commission to Aged Care said this. The Australian Department of Health, which oversees this system, has no mechanism to follow up with people on the waiting list to give them updates, including about whether they have progressed up the queue or how long it will be until a package is available. According to this interim report, the direct result of these shocking waits includes declining function, inappropriate hospitalisation, carer burnout and premature institutionalisation, all because necessary services are not being provided. The last three years, more than 30,000 have died waiting for their homes care packages to be approved on this government's watch. That is more than the number of additional places the government has recently announced. This government obviously has not prioritised older Australians, and older, older Australians have had to pay the ultimate price. In January 2020, the Productivity Commission released the median wait time for home care packages. It had blown out in the last year by more than two months. Some older Australians are entering residential care or even emergency departments instead of receiving their approved home care package. The aged care system is broken and, as the Royal Commission has noted, it suffers from neglect. And of course, that's why the title of the report is Neglect, Neglect by this Government. And yet this government does does get complaints related to aged care, and of course nothing happens. A government who's been in power now for eight years. The aged care watchdog failed to issue a single fine or warning despite receiving more than 2,000 complaints from April to June of 2020, of which 340 were directly related to COVID-19 infection control. From 2,000 complaints, not a single regulatory action appears to have been taken. According to expert evidence provided to the Royal Commission into Aged Care by the CEO of the Presbyterian Aged Care New South Wales, Mr Paul Sadler, unspent money accrues for one of four reasons. A contingency amount negotiated between the consumer and the provider, the consumer deliberately saving for a large expense such as equipment or a period of respite care, the consumer exercising their choice to refuse certain services, or their assessed level of need exceeding their actual service needs. We can easily see pressure from the provider being a reason, as well as a desire among home care clients to have their funding for a rainy day. Allowing the Commonwealth to maintain control of the money rather than the aged care provider has support in the sector. But there are serious and unanswered questions about how the many aged care providers on thin margins, like rural or regional areas, can manage without the reserve of funding. The government again fails regional Australia. In the wake of the pandemic that has deeply shaken aged, the aged care sector, is now the best time to upturn the entire funding model of aged care providers. The better question to ask is whether 2021, a year where COVID-19 has deeply rattled the aged care sector, is the best time to upturn funding models that aged care providers rely on. The best way to manage these questions is to refer this bill to the Selection of Bills Committee for further consideration. 
Home care is a devastatingly underfunded sector. The demographics have been clear for many, many years. Demand for aged care services is only going to rise. Reform the sector is a good thing. But if reform puts aged care providers on the path to unviability, we must determine what can do we do to soften this bill's impact on marginal providers. And we must provide more in general aged care providers to be certain that they do not need to take shortcuts while providing their critical care. Today, the ABC told another story about aged care. An article by my Michael Atkin told the story of Kristen Raddick and her 95-year-old father, Herbert. Herbert has dementia and physical ailments, which means Ms Raddick needs to assist with every part of daily life, from getting out of bed to going to the toilet. Ms Raddick is trying to keep her father out of residential aged care, but managing each day is a challenge. She said her father felt guilty about how much help he needed because he lived independently until recently. They received some help through a limited, federally funded home care package worth about $16,000 a year, which for Herbert means a support worker showers him three times a week. But in June, Herbert was assessed as needing the highest care package available known as Level 4, which provide another $36,000 in funding. The Radics don't know how long they'll have to wait before more federal funding is made available to them, only to expect it will be at least another six to nine months if they're lucky. Ms Raddick is trying to cherish the time she has left with her father, but looking after him is challenging. Older Australians shouldn't have to spend their final years feeling like an imposition on their children. Older Australians deserve much better than this. And it's time for this government to do much better. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Like the number one bill before this, I'm happy to support this bill, which came about following questions I asked at a number of past Senate estimates about the handling of unspent home care funds once someone passes away or goes into residential care. When I first raised this issue, it turned out the Department had very little oversight of these funds. There was absolutely no auditing. The Department pretty much relied on an honour system to ensure these funds were paid back to the Commonwealth. According to the latest report from the Aged Care Financing Authority, the amount of unspent funds held by providers soared by 40 per cent to $751 million last financial year and was predicted to top $1 billion by June this year. This is a huge amount of money needlessly paid out and sitting in others' bank accounts. This bill changes the administrative arrangements for paying home care subsidy to approved providers of home care. Home care providers will only be paid for the care and services delivered to a home care recipient during each month, with Services Australia retaining any unspent subsidy the home care recipient is eligible to receive each month. The bill will also introduce a mechanism whereby providers who elect to return unspent funds that are held by them start to do so within six months of the bill coming into effect. The efficiencies and better transparency created by this bill and the earlier legislation already passed will mean much less waste, which must translate to more aged care packages. At the moment, there is a massive shortfall in packages, especially for the most acute level of assistance. This is despite an announcement of 23,000 additional places in the budget over the next year, on top of the 6,105 places announced last July, and just recently an additional 10,000 places that were announced in the MAIFO. Whilst the 39,000 places are very much welcome, there are still more than 60,000 senior Australians needing care and assistance on the wait list for a home care package. More than 60,000. The drip feed of packages must stop, and it must be replaced with a comprehensive plan to deal with the wait list and provide places for packages uh, that people actually are approved for. Figures released from the Department of Health in September 
show that in the last two years, 28,000 people died whilst on the wait list. 28,000 people died whilst on the wait list. This is absolutely appalling. The consequences of the long wait list for home care is traumatic and often comes with dire consequences. Many elderly Australians wait up to two years for their home care package following assessment. By this time, their condition has often deteriorated and many families can no longer care for them or they can no longer care for themselves and often are forced to go into residential care. Every year, a staggering 19,000 people who are approved for home care are forced into residential aged care before they receive a package. Our senior Australians should have the right to receive care and assistance in their own homes if that is their preference. Our senior Australians deserve respectful, affordable, accessible and safe aged care options that are offered in a timely manner. So whilst I support this bill and the efforts by government to more efficiently allocate the limited funding available to home care providers for our senior Australians, there is much more that needs to be done to fix the home care system. Prime Minister Morrison recently said, and I quote, the health and well-being of older Australians is an absolute priority, end of quote. I agree, and all of us here should hold him to those words when the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety hands down its final report next month. Thank you, Sen Senator Griff. Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to make a short contribution on behalf of uh, people in New South Wales, in particular in the retirement capital of the state, uh, the seat that I live in, in the seat of Robertson, and adjacent to that, the seat of Dobell, where so many people who've lived a great life in the city have worked, have made a profound contribution to the country by their endeavours and efforts. They've run businesses, they've worked in factories, they've done everything you can imagine, and they seek retirement on the Central Coast. They believe, when they move to the Central Coast, some of the rhetoric of this government, that the government claims it will be there for them. But sadly, all too often on the Central Coast, we are finding more and more people who fit the descriptions that have been so aptly put here before the chamber by Senator McAllister, uh, Senator Seawitt, Senator Sheldon and Senator Griff. This is a horror story that we've been listening to here in the chamber this afternoon. A horror story where the government pats itself on the back when it leaks out a few more home packages. And that's what we see constantly. That is the pattern of behaviour of this government. A big claim, the rhetorical flourish of the kind Senator Griff just alluded to in his closing comments. We care about Australians in their aged care stage. We care about the contribution. We'll be there for you. That's what the Prime Minister says. And that's what the Minister for Aged Care says as well. But when they're needed, when they're wanted, they are absolutely missing in action. To the degree, and I want to restate these figures, 28,000 people died on the waiting list. Imagine the scale of that. 28,000 funerals, all the grief, all the sorrow, all the despair, all the brokenheartedness of people who believed Mr Morrison and his government and thought that they would get what they needed because that's what they were promised by a government that simply lies through its teeth to the Australian people day in and day out. 28,000 people died waiting for a home care package. That is a great shame, a great stain on the social compact that people believe they have with the government, that they've paid taxes to for all of their working life. What do you think that's like for those families who had that degree of trust? 
And this situation has been exacerbated. It's got completely out of control under the Liberal National Party governance of the last eight years. In regional Australia, this situation is worse than it is even in the cities. I've spoken about the fantastic place that I live in, the seat of Robertson. I have meetings regularly with the service providers in aged care. They are heartbroken. It's not just the banks of these smaller providers that are teetering on the brink in regional Australia. The people who've invested their life in working with aged care, who felt a calling to that profession, who give us an expression, in many cases, of their faith, not just a business to them, a deep sense of care for aged Australians, finding that they cannot provide the care that they need, finding that people who really wanted to stay in the community in their own home are being forced into aged care settings, formal aged care settings, that they never wanted to be a part of because they are waiting and waiting and waiting day in and day out for the money that they should receive to have home care. Senator Griff correctly quoted the figures. 19,000 people approved for home care who couldn't get anything from this government and were forced into aged care. Now, I don't know about everybody in this chamber and I don't know about the people who might be listening to this, but conversations about how you're going to look after your mum or your dad or your aunt or your uncle or somebody that you care for in the community that you're a guardian for, those conversations are carefully undertaken. Promises are made. Mum, I'll make sure that you're looked after. I'll do my best. And in the back pocket and in the back of their minds is a trust in the government, in this Liberal national government, that when the time comes, if they need a bit of a hand, they're going to be able to get it. But this government has failed to deliver. There, right now, as I'm standing here in the chamber, there are still one 100,000 Australians who need and want a home care package. And this government will spin the story that they've come in and they've put this legislation in the chamber and they're doing great work in aged care. Well, it's not great work. It's not meeting the needs of Australians. It's disingenuous. And what we're seeing here is just another punctuation mark in an ongoing litany of failures with regard to aged care. How bad is this government? How bad is their treatment of older Australians? It's so bad that the Aged Care Commissioner put out an interim report entitled Neglect. Neglect. That is the signature of this government written all over the aged care sector. Neglect at every turn. So this piece of legislation today, another little bit of window dressing to tinker at the edges, once again reveals the cynical attitude that this government has to Australians. The abuse of trust of older, older Australians, particularly older Australians, who believe that this government is there for them. Well, 28,000 of them got buried while they were waiting. I bet they regret voting for this government many, many, many times. Because if you care about the people you love who are ageing, you cannot afford to vote for this government ever again. Because their track record, their track record is a wreck. You only have to look back over these eight years to see the steady decline of actual investment in systems and care for the aged, care, aged people. And I, 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 I will report that the minister who is so responsible for aged care, sitting over there, Minister Colbeck, 
dared to look up at me and mouths that he doesn't believe a word that I'm saying. And that is the kind of hypocrisy that we see from this government, a failure to accept the facts, the facts that thousands and thousands of older Australians are dying on your watch because you can't raise a finger Senator, about it Senator, Senator through, the through the chair. I appreciate The fact is thousands and thousands of Australians are dying on the watch of this government. So if you care about your family, if you've got an older Australian, you've got a mum or dad that you care about in your family and you're banking on this government to give you a bit of help if they become unwell, if they have a stroke, if they develop dementia, if they need somebody just to come in and give them a bit of a hand to have a shower, if you're banking on that support from this government, well, I'm sorry to tell you it won't be there. It won't be there. And if by some miracle they should deign to give you acceptance of your request and provide you with a little bit of care, be pretty confident that if you have a sudden health crisis, say your mum has a sudden health crisis and is assessed as leading, leading a high level of care, level four is a high level, this government will think it's okay to give you a level one package. They actually think that that's okay. That's like going to, I, mean, I don't want to sort of trivialise this, but the lunacy of it, if you went to a shoe shop and you asked for a size seven and they gave you a two, it doesn't fit. And that is how ill-fitting this government's policy around aged care is. So I urge Australians, don't accept the ridiculous rhetoric of this government, this self-aggrandising government that pats itself on the back day in and day out, that spent a billion dollars telling you how good they are. Well, if they'd spent that billion dollars on aged care, maybe some of the 28,000 people who got buried while they were waiting for a package might still be here. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Um, Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> the aged care amendment, aged care legislation amendment, improved home care payment administration number two, Bill 2020, amends the way that home care providers are paid subsidy to address stakeholder concerns regarding unspent funds and to align home care arrangements with other government programs such as the National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS. The measures in the bill improve financial accountability and allow for better transparency over the actual use of funds for home care service delivery. The bill will amend the Aged Care Act 1997 and the Aged Care Transitional Provisions Act 1997 such that home care providers will only be paid subsidy for care and services rendered to a home care recipient during a month, with Services Australia retaining the unspent subsidy that a home care recipient is eligible to receive each month. This unspent subsidy will be available for providers to draw down on behalf of a home care recipient as care and services are provided in the future. There is no change to a consumer's access to their full subsidy. This builds on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Improved Care Payment Administration No. 1 Bill 2020 that amends the Aged Care Act 1997 and the Aged Care Transitional Provisions Act 1997 such that providers of home care will not receive a payment in advance but in arrears. Uh, can I thank senators for their contribution to the debate and commend the bill to the Senate? Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seward and contained on sheet 1189 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, just, just what Senator O'Neill. Yeah, Deputy President, would you mind putting the question again so we can just make sure that we're out there? And, and I'll read slowly. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seward and contained on sheet 1189 be agreed to. Senator <laughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm sorry Thank to interrupt. I'm seeking leave um, to 
amend the amendment that's been circulated in the name of Senator Seward. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McAllister. Uh, I seek to amend um, the amendment on 1189, deleting the final four words by 31 December 2021 and replacing them with as a matter of urgency. Senator Seward. Um, Chair, of course, it's up to the chamber to, as to whether they accept the amendment, but as mover of the amendment, I will accept that. Um, I'm hoping as a matter of urgency means that's before the, 21st, the 31st of December uh, this year, but as a mover of amendment, I personally will, uh, the Greens will accept that amendment. Thank you, Senator Seward. Thank you. Now I'm just going to clarify. So, subsection B will read: "Calls on the government to act immediately to ensure the home care package waiting list is cleared as a matter of urgency." So, the question—it's an am amendment to the amendment, Minister. So, the question is that the second reading amendment, as amended, moved by Senator Seward and contained on sheet 1189, Minister. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. Can I acknowledge? Uh, the amendment from Senator Seward and the intent of the amendment from the opposition. Uh, we are in a circumstance right now where we are just some weeks from the final report of the Royal Commission. Uh, clearly the government will seriously consider the report of the Royal Commission. And I note that Senator Seward's um, amendment, second reading amendment, is based on Council Assisting's draft recommendations to the Royal Commissioners. Uh, we don't yet know what the Royal Commission's final report will say. Um, we are expecting that there will be some expectation of uh, further reform and, and urgency with respect to the management of home care waiting lists. Uh, but I want to put on the record uh, the, the fact that the government uh, continues to invest, as has been noted during the debate. There, was, there, are, there will be an additional 39,105 packages allocated within the system this financial year, Minister, reaching somewhere like 195,000. I am just aware the question hasn't been put, and in effect, I guess in terms of meeting procedure, you're speaking to something that hasn't been put yet. So could I suggest I that maybe this might I be raised in, in committee? But I will just put the question, and the question. The question will be raised in committee. Yes, it will be. The question is that the second reading amendment, as amended, moved by Senator Seward, be agreed to. So, the amendment as amended, moved by Senator Seward and contained on 1189, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I think the ayes have it. Okay, the ayes have it. Um, the question is that the motion for the second reading, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I'm going to restate the question just to ensure the chamber is aware of what we're voting on. The question is that the motion for the second reading as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to home care subsidy and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed.
Senator Seward. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, through you, Chair, to the Minister, I, I flagged this issue in my second reading contribution, and that is what is the government doing to ensure that the additional costs that providers may incur, as they have articulated they may, due to these changes, um, what are you doing to ensure that these aren't passed on to consumers? Minister. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Chair. Uh, Senator, one of the things that we have done as a part of um, uh, previous reforms uh, and is the requirement for all providers to um, publicly list uh, their fees and charges. Um, I acknowledge the comments that you made in your contribution in your second reading speech with respect to costs, and I think that might have been reflected by some other colleagues. It is an issue of concern for us. We are currently considering our options with respect uh, to those elements, particularly with respect to our policy reform off the back of the Royal Commission report, which I've made a note, uh, noted a moment ago, will be um, reporting on the 26th of this month, so very close now. So it is a concern to us. Uh, we are monitoring all of those things closely uh, and, uh, and we'll be keeping an eye on that through their public reporting process as they're, as they're required to do on the, on the MyHK website. Senator Seward. Through you, thank, uh, thanks, Minister. But uh, it's good if they do they do publish them. But what are you going to do when they go up, or if they go up? I should say. What what do you intend? What undertakings are you giving to older Australians that, in fact, if providers do do that, that you are going to come on down? You're going to do something about it to ensure that those charges aren't passed on, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, Senator, at, at this point in time, there are no price controls with respect to the delivery of home care services. Uh, the issue of costs, as I've indicated, is one that we're concerned about. We're watching it very closely. I'd be very disappointed if um, providers would be passing on costs. You would be aware through the report that the Aged Care Finance, Financing Authority uh, provided to us that um, uh, the view is that the industry, the sector, should be able to uh, manage this process. We are concerned about some smaller providers, particularly in regional areas, that might have additional costs in relation to this. We have a limited, um, for, limited for qualification program in place to assist those providers through that. We don't want to see the loss of services as a result of this um, review. Um, there is discussion with respect to the technology that might be required to be taken up. To be frank, my view is that the take-up of technology would be a, a good thing. It will b, provide some efficiencies for providers, uh, and, and uh, thirdly, c, if you like, it will um, then facilitate better reporting both to us and to consumers. And so we will be using that information in the interest of consumers because, as I've said, we're clearly concerned about it. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, you've obviously foreseen one of my answers. I'll come back to, to that, um, with some of the issues you just touched on. But I want to ask, have you sought an assurance from providers that they will not pass on the costs? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Senator, we've had a number of conversations with providers. Um, as I've said, there is no provision for us to prevent them from passing on costs. Uh, they can t take this conversation as a clear f message from me that I don't expect that there should be costs passed on to providers, uh, to consumers, uh, and we will be monitoring that very closely. Uh, and as I've said, the, the process that we go through off the back of the Royal Commission report, which will uh, do a number of things. Uh, that's been talked about during this debate. One, we want to increase the capacity of the system, but we, need, we are also looking to reform the delivery of home care services uh, and uh, the, ac the actions and the way that the providers conduct themselves as part of this process will certainly inform what we're looking to do, including how we manage the issue of uh, fees and charges for provider, uh, providers charged to consumers. As I've said to you a couple of times now, this is a significant area of concern for, for the government. 
Senator Seward. Now, I've heard you say this is a significant area of concern, and I, as I articulated in my second reading contribution, um, aged care recipients and CODA have indicated that they are concerned about the possibility of passing on costs. So there's general concern about this issue. However, it's very Sorry, I shouldn't say very clear, but it appears to me from your answer is that you haven't sought assurances from providers that they won't increase the costs. Have any providers given you an assurance that they won't increase costs? Um, there, there is no mechanism for us to control or manage costs within the Aged Care Act at the moment. Uh, we've sent a clear message to providers uh, that uh, we don't expect that this should uh, in, uh, result in an increase in costs for those that are at risk. We have a process in place to support them through that process. Uh, I'm sending a very clear message through the, this debate right now. I don't expect that there should be an increase in costs, so the providers can hear that message from me now. Uh, nobody has provided me with that assurance directly if, so, to, to respond specifically to your uh, question. Uh, but it is a point of discussion that's obviously been part of um, the debate, and that's one of the reasons that we asked the Aged Care Finance Authority to get a good sense of what the potential impact of this me measure might be uh, with respect to the sector, um, because we, we wanted to understand it as well as possible. Uh, this is a very important move in the context of our reform of the delivery of care at home. Senator Seward. And, and that's why the Chamber is, has indicated their support, because we recognise it is an important move, um, Minister Gree. Um, can I ask, would you, name and, would you be prepared to name and shame providers that put up costs directly related to this particular um, measure? Minister. That's certainly something I'm prepared to consider. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, Minister, in one of your answers to one of uh, my uh, questions, you started um, to touch on the issue that I wanted to go to briefly next, which is the providers um, that uh, may fall over as a, in the transition phase due to these changes for those in, the thin, um, in thin markets. What do you have in what other things do you have uh, in mind to assist those providers, particularly in the thin markets, is it the existing measures that you've articulated, or are there other things that you will undertake to ensure that in those thin markets, where providers are in fact likely to be the only provider, um, that they don't, um, that they're not going to fall over, or that there's not something to put in their place? Minister, uh, th thanks, Senator Seymour. We, we, as I said, we have, a, uh, have had a good look at the sector. I think we have a relatively good handle on the areas where there may be concern, uh, and we've made provision um, for a uh, limited application grants program to be directed at those providers who we think uh, may need some assistance to manage the transition to payment in arrears. So uh, uh, there, we think that we have a, an appropriate level of coverage to support those providers who may be at risk. We clearly don't want to see uh, services ceased as a result of this measure. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, uh, is, uh, are you confident that Service Australia has the capacity and the time to implement uh, these changes to, in order to ensure a smooth transition, given some of the issues we've seen with Services Australia in the past. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. All of our conversations uh, and the timing that we've pl put in place to implement these changes would indicate that the, that capacity does exist. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, it's obviously one that we're going to be watching closely through estimates. Um, can I ask about aged care uh, packages? In, two th in the 2021 budget, um, the budget allocated 20 per cent of the new packages to level one. Um, why is the government continue to announce level one home care packages and 
recent fundings, you know, done a quarter, quarter, quarter to the various packages. Why are you continuing to do that, given that people assessed as needing level one packages make up about three per cent of those that are currently waiting for a package? Why is, why is that occurring rather than putting more resources into particularly three and four? I acknowledge that some more has gone in, but it's not enough to make demand clearly. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so the investment that we're making and in the package levels that we're making um, is based on the advice to support reduction in waiting times and waiting lists. That's the objective that we have. Uh, we acknowledge that there's more work to be done. Uh, I think I've done that on a number of times in the chamber uh, and also publicly. Uh, and uh, clearly that uh, will be the subject of some of the recommendations from the Royal Commission. But uh, the work that we're doing is to provide assistance to senior Australians and support them getting assistance as, uh, as soon as possible. So we're looking to facilitate the reduction in waiting time and waiting lists. Senator Seeley. Some of the, uh, thank you, Chair, um, through you, Chair, to the Minister. Some of the, the is the government prepared to reallocate some of the funding that's been allocated to other levels in order to meet the needs for levels three and four, if needed? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, as we continue to grow the capacity of the system, some of that will uh, create a reallocation between package levels. Uh, as the capacity of the system grows. Senator Seaver. Uh, thank you. I'm sure we'll be uh, continuing to pursue that issue in estimates as well. Um, can I move to the issue that I raised during my second reading contribution, which is protected information? And I'm sure you're aware of the issue that I raised in terms of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Um, has found on occasion that section 86.9 of the Aged Care Act, which is about information uh, the Secretary may make publicly available about aged care services, um, that, it, that it refers to protected information. You, I'm sure you heard what I, the comments I made about um, people having deep concerns about that being used in order, that provision being used in order not to provide information. Um, what is the government doing to ensure that information listed under section 86.9 of the Aged Care Act is available to members of the public who request it? Minister. Senator, we might have to have another conversation about this, but I'll give you the, the information that I have, and I'm happy to provide some further discussion with you in a, in a briefing with respect to this. Um, so I'll give you some information around government-funded residential aged care homes obligations and responsibilities around record management. So under the Aged Care Act 1997, approved providers of aged care have the ability for personal information to be given to a person having the power to require the production of documents or the answering of questions such as a person who has an enduring power of attorney over the resident's care. If a person has the appropriate legal authority, they should be able to access their relatives' records. So uh, the, another point that I would make in respect to this is that quite, quite often um, you will have circumstances where family me members other than the particular person may be seeking information um, and a provider may be restricted in providing information in that context. Uh, and Unfortunately, sometimes complex situations within an aged care facility then get entangled with complex family circumstances and people get frustrated that they can't find information um, in relation to their direct family members' care and circumstances. Um, it is an issue. Um, and it's certainly one that came to light a couple of times during the last 12 months where family members weren't aware of the circumstances in relation to their direct family member, but other family members were very aware of the circumstances. Um, and um, I understand that 
becomes quite problematic from a number of perspectives. In the context of, of information um, and public information with respect to uh, delivery of aged care services, it is certainly an issue that we are quite cognisant of. Um, so the, the Royal Commission's talked about a rating system for the sector, both in the context of home care and residential care, better financial reporting. Uh, they are certainly matters that we are giving very, very close consideration to to provide more information to users of both residential and uh, aged care and home care so that they can make, uh, have better information to make their decisions about with respect to the care that's being provided uh, and that they might proceed should they choose one of those options. Um, and I uh, would be very confident that will be one of the outcomes of the reforms that will come out of the back of the Royal Commission. Senator Seaver. Uh, thank you. And I, I do appreciate the point that you made about also potentially complex family issues as well. However, having said that, there are circumstances where, author in effect, authorised people ha are being denied uh, so-called protective information. So I'm um, pleased to hear that you're, you consider the Royal Commission. Um, there'll be changes coming out of the Royal Commission. So then my next, my, you'll be pleased to learn. Um, my final question, depending on the answer, I will uh, just force a, uh, just let you know, um, that will you then, cons are you then proposing that that will be then part of a new Aged Care Act? Minister. Thanks, Chair. The, 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 the the possibility or the option of a new Aged Care Act, again, is one of the draft recommendations from Council assisting to the Royal Commissioners. The Royal Commission uh, reports on the 26th of February. We will very closely and carefully consider um, the option of a new Aged Care Act, uh, and I think I'm on the public record as saying that previously, so I'm happy to repeat that that will be part of our consideration um, subsequent to the Royal Commission's report. Senator Seward. Sorry, I, I appreciate the answer you just gave, um, but if, in the circumstances that there is a new HK Act, would this issue be addressed in that Act? Minister. In the circumstances of a new Act or even modifications to the existing Act, this is clearly an issue that we're considering. So if there are no further contributions, the question is that the bill standards printed. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Aged Care Legislation Amendment, Improved Home Care Payment Administration No. 2 Bill of 2020 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to home care subsidy and for related purposes. Government business orders of the day number one, native title legislation amendment bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Dodson. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Acting Chairman, President. Uh, when the Native Title Act was passed in 1993, Paul Keating described it as an opportunity, and I quote, to do justice to the historic Mabo decision. According to Keating, the Act had twin goals, one to protect the Native Title held by First Nations across the country, and secondly, to ensure workability certain of the certain, certainly for land management. Yet even in 1993, it was widely recognised that more was needed to redress over 200 years of dispossession endured by First Nations. 
As Keating said at the time, the Native Title Act represented a mere modicum of justice for First Nations. It was meant to be accompanied by a land fund and social justice package, and that never eventuated. Far from building on the promise of Mabo, subsequent years have seen the progressive erosion of Native title rights and interests under the Act. The destruction of the Jugan rock shelters by Rio Tinto earlier this year demonstrates the extent of this erosion. It reflects that we have <coughs> it reflects what we have heard in multiple reports and in the inquiry into the bill, that the original undertakings of the Native Title Act has been brought into disrepute. This bill makes a number of reforms to the Native Title Act. Labor supports the bill because we have no desire to delay the progress of those parts of the bill designed to improve the operations of the Act. This includes changes to allow historic extinguishment over areas of national park and state park to be disregarded in certain circumstances. It also includes a number of changes that make modest improvements to procedures, procedural and te technical elements of the Act. These changes were widely supported by First Nations stakeholders. But I want to make it very clear that Labor remains concerned about several other provisions in this bill. Moreover, we recognise that the bill falls well short of the comprehensive reforms necessary to restore honour to the native title system in the wake of Jugan. Along with my colleague, Senator Carr, I had the privilege of participating in the committee's inquiry into this bill. As outlined in our minority report, in the inquiry progress highlighted several specific concerns about the bill. One of these specific concerns involves the amendments to section 24EB and 24EBA, which deals with the deregistration of Indigenous land use agreements. Concerns were raised in the inquiry process that these changes purport to validate future acts done pursuant to the Ilua even where the Ilua has been deregistered as a consequence of fraud, duress or undue influence. The government has said that these amendments implement a recommendation from the 2016 COAG investigation into Indigenous land administration and use. Importantly, however, this recommendation was opposed by the expert Indigenous working group appointed to inform the investigation. Many submitters to the inquiry also expressed concerns about the consequences of validating future acts under later that are later deregistered Ilewas. The Native Title Council raised concerns about these changes, that these changes would mean that any future act authorised by the Ilewa that had been done through fraud, undue influence or duress remains valid and will still affect Native Title. Similar concerns were raised by the Law Council of Australia, which continues to oppose these amendments. While it does not fully address our concerns, we welcome the additional clarification the government will add to the explanatory memorandum at our request, which confirms that, and I quote, these measures do not affect the court's power under section 199C of the Act to remove the detail of any agreement from the register and order appropriate compensation where an Ilua is affected by fraud, undue influence or duress. A second concern for Labor is that this bill creates a new ground enabling ORIC to place a registered native title body corporate into administration for failure to comply with its obligations under the native title legislation. While Labor supports better transparency and accountability, this new ground appears to apply not only where there is not only uh, uh, appears to not just where there is serious failure, but also where there are numbers of failures. A constant theme of the inquiry was the significant underfunding of registered native body corporates and resulting struggles to discharge often overwhelming legislative and, regu and regulatory obligations. The Social Justice Commissioner told the inquiry 
that the limited financial resources and governance capacities of registered native title body corporates hindered their capacity to effectively discharge their statutory obligations, and most importantly, to fulfil the cultural, social and economic aspirations of native title holders. Without further funding for rep bodies, Labor shares the concern raised in the inquiry process that the increase in Oryx power risks curtailing the rights of self-determination of the native title holders. Again, we welcome the government's clarification in the explanatory memorandum that, and I quote, it is not intended that this ground would be utilised in circumstances of multiple inadvertent and trivial breaches. It is intended that this ground would be utilised where the nature or cumulative consequences of a series of failures is more than trivial." End of quote. However, we remain cautious about the potential impact of this amendment and calls on the, the government to substantially increase the technical and financial resources available to represent to uh, rep bodies to enable their compliance with their obligations and to ensure their capacity for self-governance. Uh, it is clear that these amendments require careful oversight and monitoring. And in our mi minority report to the committee inquiry, we recommended that the government include a formal evaluation mechanism to review the proposed changes in relation to their effects on the rights to culture and self-determination of First Nations peoples. This was also a recommendation of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights report on the bill. We thank the government for accepting these recommendations and agreeing to an amendment to this bill requiring an evaluation and report on its operations within five years of commencement. Our firm view is that the amendments I have outlined should be reviewed as a priority as part of an independent evaluation of this bill in five years' time. The more fundamental problem with this bill, however, is its failure to engage with the deepening fractures in the native title system. The last substantive legislative amendment to the Native Title Act occurred in 2007. In the years since, there have been significant developments in the native title sector, which the government has only selectively responded to. A number of significant inquiries into native title have been made and have made recommendations to reform that are yet to be acted upon. In 2013, my colleague from the other place, the member for Isaacs, uh, directed the Australian Law Commission, when he was the Attorney General, to inquire into a number of aspects of the Native Title Act. The terms of the inquiry focus on the law governing connection, connection, connection in Native Title claims. This is an area of the law that, is, that has proved a, a notoriously complex and ill-adapted to its task failing to acknowledge the living and adaptive nature of First Nations cultures. The uh, Law Reform Commission carried out this, that inquiry and provided a comprehensive report to the Coalition Government in May 2015, 30 recommendations for reform. This bill only addresses a selection of technical refinements suggested by the review. It fails to address any of the recommendations in relation to the central focus of the review of the test of connection, uh, recommendations that, uh, would not, that would do the most to protect advancement of the rights of First Nations peoples. More than five years after the report was tabled, the then the, the government has still not formally responded to the Law Reform Commission's substantive recommendations for reform. Unfortunately, as our minority uh, report indicated, this reflects a clear pattern from the government of being unresponsive to native title holders while being expedient to accommodate the interests of third parties. And this is not protecting native title. Many submitters to the inquiry process noted the need for a comprehensive overhaul of the Native Title Act that calls for reform has only, only grown uh, since the devastation that has not only grown since the devastation of the Jugan Caves exposed the hollowness of protections afforded to the Native Title Act. It has shocked many to discover that Rio Tinto's destruction 
of the 46,000 year old rock shelters was entirely legal. The multiple legal frameworks, ostensibly designed to uphold First Nations rights, failed to protect and maybe even facilitated the destruction of those precious pieces of human history. In this context, a thorough detailed investigation, perhaps even a royal commission, is needed to investigate the operations of the Native Title Act and to recommend reforms that will restore honour and integrity to the native title system. For over 20 years, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner produced an annual report on the state of the native title system. This was ended because the government amended, amended the Act in 2017. I welcome the government's commitment to instruct the Social Justice Commissioner to undertake a, re a review of the Native Title Act once the Commissioner has finished all the current work on, on her uh, plate. This is an important step along the path to reform, and I call on the government to provide the Commissioner with the time and resources she needs to make this a meaningful review. In conclusion, Native Title is an area of the law that goes to the very heart of the relationship between the Commonwealth and First Nations. Importantly, native title is not an act of largesse of the Crown. It, is uniquely, it uniquely originates with and belongs to native title people. It predates the Australian common law, and since Mabo has been uh, recognised by it, that, recogni that recognition has been converted to statutory form by the Native Title Act. But we must take steps to ensure that this law, which is intended to recognise and protect native title, does not dishonour and destroy it. Those of us on this side of the chamber have a deep commitment to the native title system and of making the necessary changes to ensure its integrity. I call on those opposite to join us in that commitment. And the passage of this bill certainly doesn't represent that the job has been well done or that the job has been done. The reforms, comprehensive reforms are still required and they must be followed up with meaningful reform, reform in particular that will restore the honour and truth to a system that is essential as a source of pride for this nation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I rise to speak against the bill, otherwise known as the naive title bill. I wish to remind senators that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UNDRIP, Article 32, reads as follows. States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the Indigenous peoples concerned through their own represent, representative institutions in order to obtain their free and informed consent prior to the approval of any project affecting their lands or territories and other resources particularly in connection with the development, utilisation or exploration of mineral, minerals, water or other resources. This bill does not affirm the rights of our people to free prior and informed consent. This is why it must not be allowed to pass as it is. The position of the Australian Greens is very clear. Free, prior and informed consent must be obtained from all traditional owners before anything happens on their land or their waters. It doesn't matter, or at least it shouldn't matter, how much the big mining companies and the politicians that they have purchased want this bill passed. If all of the traditional owners of any sovereign First Nation do not want it, then that should be the end of the discussion. 
It is for very good reason certain areas of country or water should never be disrupted or desecrated. I will be moving amendments to this bill to separate Schedule 3 from the rest of the bill. In my view, Schedule 3 is the most beneficial for our people. It will allow for native title applicants to be made over national, state or territory parks where currently this is not available. However, Senators will note that my amendment goes further than just opening up national, state or territory parks for native title claims, but rather all Crown land by negotiation and agreement between the relevant government and traditional owners. Sovereign to sovereign. I'm calling on the support of my fellow senators for my amendments. This issue is too important for our people to just waive this problematic bill as it is. I am a traditional owner, and I know that the native title process is an obstacle course and this bill mostly adds even more obstacles. It's destroyed country, destroyed families, and in the main, only the lawyers, anthropologists and mining companies reap the most benefits. It's hardly surprising that mining and exploration interests are the ones who are most in favour of this bill because they're going to rake in the dollars which is all they care about. The naive title system or native title system is not about returning the rights of our people to their lands and waters, lands and waters that were stolen and never ceded. The native title system is about doing everything possible to keep us from them. Native title is not land rights. Mining companies, with the permission of the politicians that they've purchased, have absolutely no problem getting access to country, which tells you everything you need to know about who this bill really is for. Rio is still making millions after desecrating country by willfully destroying the caves at Jukun Gorge. If the native title system was about us and our rights to free prior and informed consent over country, then this bill would never have seen the light of day. This government's problem is that it can't take no for an answer. Our people do not give you consent. That should be enough. The desecration of Jukun Gorge, traditional owners, did not consent. Fracking in the Northern Territory, traditional owners do not consent. Mining at Jabaluka, traditional owners did not consent. A nuclear waste dump in South Australia, traditional owners do not consent. The destruction of sacred Jackbarung trees, Traditional owners do not consent, and yet here we are with this bill that does not affirm our rights to free, prior and informed consent. This right belongs to all Aboriginal people, not just the ones that government likes to hear from. The na naive title system is just reinforcing the aims of the colonial project. It's all take, 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 destroy and destruct. The colonial project has taken our lands, our waters, our children, our women, our laws, our country, our totems and our lives. And what do we get? We get thrown scraps and told to be thankful. Good old ration style, like we are still on the mission. This government would have us feast on scraps and then tell us that we should be grateful when we demand what was denied to our ancestors. 
Auntie Margaret Colbung, a proud Wadjuk elder, who said the following at the committee inquiry into this flawed bill, and I quote, I've been fighting and I've walked these streets for law and justice for my people for many years. Naive title or native title was never a part of my future for myself and for my grandchildren and everyone else. I have not ceded my rights to my country." End quote. I honour your words, Auntie Margaret, and I speak them here today because they must be heard and they must be followed. Also, proud Menang Nunga man Mervyn Eads, brother boy, also told the committee, and I quote, native title, where it's come from and where it is today, serves our people no purpose. Native title has turned into the interests of the mining companies and the states. They've taken all our rights away from us. End quote. The Wan Peru Aboriginal Corporation put it best when they said, and I quote, Can you please change the rule, change the law? Because my people want to live out there. They want to hunt and gather. They want to do our ways of life as we've lived and the way our ancestors have lived." End quote. That's what we, as people in this parliament, must do. We must change the rules to allow our people to live the way they want to live, in the way of their ancestors, if that is what they want. If the government was serious about working with our people, it would genuinely involve traditional owners on all decisions over country and facilitate them getting free, prior and informed consent. In the same way, it moves mountains when mining companies come knocking on these halls. This bill doesn't do that. This is why I am seeking to amend it. Let's keep the section that will benefit our people most. Let's open up areas of Crown land to native title claims by agreement, sovereign to sovereign, because until we have a treaty or treaties, there can be no consent with actions that happen on country, and if traditional owners do not consent, then that is the end of the matter. And may I remind everyone in this chamber that we are all on stolen land and we benefit from the stolen resources. It's not the first people of this country that benefit. Thank you. Senator Thorpe, you had foreshadowed that you'd be moving amendments. Do you wish to move those now? Yes, I'd like to move the amendment. Okay, so they are committee of the whole amendments. In that case, we'll deal with them in the committee. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak on the Native Title Amendment Infrastructure and Public Facilities Bill 2020. Uh, this bill amends the Native Title Act 1993 to extend the operation of Subdivision 24JAA for another 10 years, extending a sunset clause that was last legislated in 2010. Now, for those uh, listening at home, Section 24JAA provides through legislation a process to assist the timely construction of public housing, uh, staff housing and limited classes of public facilities by or on behalf of the Crown or a local government body or by other statutory authorities of the Crown and uh, in any of its capacities. Uh, it's for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in communities on Indigenous held land. It's important to note at this point that the operation of this amendment only applies to land uh, because the operation of this law applies to construction of facilities and buildings. Uh, it is 
uh, incompatible with native title areas offshore for obvious reasons. Uh, acts relating solely to offshore places are covered by subsection N. Now, section 24JAA operates as an important mechanism between an Indigenous land use agreement and compulsory acquisition, enabling future acts to be done legally and validly and processing critical Indigenous housing and infrastructure construction in a timely and, importantly, effective manner. This is achieved while also safeguarding native title rights. Now, without the provision, the alternatives are to enact an Indigenous land use agreement that, for those that have been involved in this space will know, can take a very, very long time. In fact, it can take years to finalise, and that may not be able to uh, finalise it at all. Uh, or compulsory acquisition, that's the other option, but that will extinguish native title. So uh, this option is, these options really are not acceptable when Indigenous communities require housing or other uh, essential infrastructure services now. In accordance with the established non-extinguishment principle of the Native Title Act, the bill continues to ensure that native title is not extinguished by the production of public housing and infrastructure, and that the provision provides for the compensation. Now, extending the operation of subsection 24JAA for a further 10 years will support relevant authorities to continue to meet unmet public infrastructure needs, while also continuing to safeguard uh, the rights and interests of native title holders and claimants. Limiting the period of the extension to a further 10 years provides the opportunity to reassess the need for, a future, uh, for provision of this in the future, uh, and it will allow the government to make changes as appropriate at the time, as was done 10 years ago. Now, there are many types of facilities which uh, may be provided under subsection JA. Uh, this includes public housing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in or in the vicinity of uh, native title areas. Uh, it enables uh, public education and health facilities and police and emergency facilities that principally are there primarily for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in the areas. Uh, uh, th these places are, and facilities order. are also included. Senator O'Sullivan. Do you rise in a point of order? Uh, I, I am, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, look, um, just to bring maybe to the senator's attention, I think he's speaking on the an old bill from last year. Just um, the the um, the sections that the the senator refers to was uh, with respect to a bill that was debated last year. And I just sort of wanted to just maybe let you know that uh, he could be just reading them from the wrong notes. That's all. Senator O'Sullivan. Well, that may be the case, and I do apologise to the Senate. I'll I'll leave it there. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to support this bill. I have visited almost all Indigenous Aboriginal communities in North Queensland, and I know the complexities that they face, and it is hurting the people, our people. I have also been and am a member of the Northern Development Agenda Inquiry. And land tenure is something that is hurting our people, not only Aboriginal, but all other people in the North. These are my people. We are all one nation. That is why we support this easing of complexities that are costing many people on the ground dearly. I note, though, that this bill touches on compensation that may be payable under paragraph 5131 of the Constitution as that relates to the acquisition of property. So I want to put a question to the government. When are tens of thousands of farmers across our country going to get the same compensation under section 51, clause 31? The Howard Anderson Liberal National Government stole these farmers' property rights right across the country, using the states as the vehicle to get around Section 51, Clause 31. Yet Premiers Peter Beattie and Bob Carr in Queensland and New South Wales, respectively, 
say they did it, and Premier Beatty put it in writing, for the Howard government to enable the government to comply with the UN's Kyoto Protocol at the Prime Minister's request, the then Prime Minister's request. The Queensland Labor government in, the 19, in 1998 and 2004 received hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money to steal farmers' property rights. They were bribes to the Queensland government to enact this legislation. That was done through the states because the states have no commitment, no responsibility to provide compensation. So my question is, when will the federal government fulfil its responsibilities under our constitution and provide restoration of farmers' property rights or compensate them for stolen property rights? Restoration or compensation? Let me end with this. Prime Minister Morrison says it won't cost Australia to comply with the UN's Kyoto and Paris climate dictates. That's because he's still relying upon the credits from Kyoto. And that depends upon the theft of property rights from farmers right across our country. When will we see restoration of those rights? When will we see compensation? Restoration or compensation? Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I table a replacement revised explanatory memorandum relating to this bill. Thank you. Um, I notice Senator Waters has just entered the chamber. Having tabled that, uh, do you wish to keep your concluding remarks until she's made her contribution? Yes, thank you. Senator Waters. Thanks very much and uh, thank you for your um, indulgence all in the chamber. Uh, my colleague, Senator Thorpe, has just spoken very powerfully on the concerns that the Greens have with this bill. And uh, the fact that the Minerals Council thinks it's a great idea, frankly, should be cause enough for concern uh, of the risks that the bill presents to First Nations justice. Um, I'd like to speak briefly in support of the Greens amendment and to offer um, some examples from the First Nations in communities in Queensland that I've spoken with about the injustices that the native title system has emphasised. Last week I spoke with representatives of the sovereign native tribes of the Kabi First Nation, whose cultural site Jackie Kundu is currently being threatened by the planned expansion of a highway near Gympie. They said that their experience of the native title system is that it, quote, divides nations and pits us against each other, end quote, allowing governments and developers to select who they think speaks for country. And our concern is that this bill would further entrench that. Um, in Schedule 1, the amendments would allow native title bodies to move away from consensus decision-making and to allow votes to be taken by majority. This position is strongly opposed by many First Nations groups. It's inconsistent with international law. It's inconsistent with the recognised principles of the right to self-determination and the free pursuit of social, economic and cultural development, which is, of course, Article 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Many First Nations groups are concerned that allowing decision-making by hard majority rather than uh, unanimously will allow registered native title body corporates to manoeuvre around and abuse the powers that are conferred on those representative bodies. In my home state of Queensland, the Wangan and Jagalingu people have fought long and hard against the Adani Carmichael coal mine. I think they now call themselves a different name, but folks still know it by that name. The mining company insisted that it had the consent of native title holders, but traditional owner Adrian Baragaba, who speaks for that land, has been bankrupted, has been bullied and has faced trespass charges for his efforts to protect his country. Further weakening of the consent requirements would see more and not less conflict among First Nation groups over contested resources projects. And I've spoken at length in the past about Mr Baragaba's um, struggles and um, the injustice um, that has been uh, perpetrated upon the W&J people, so I won't go into that now with my eye on the clock. Um, but I recently also met with another uh, group of sovereigns near Hopevale in uh, far north Queensland. The Thetawara and other common law clan groups are strongly opposed to diatreme resources Galala Silica Mine. The proposal threatens water sources and cultural grounds, as well as threatens species and significant geological features at Cape, Cape Bedford. 
Um, the Thito Wara have accused their registered native title body of bullying, misrepresentation, accepting favours, hiding critical information, denying access to native title land and failing to undertake appropriate consultation to secure support for the Indigenous land use agreement. Now, again, um, formalising governance structures that remove consensus will remove an avenue for First Nations owners to challenge decisions that purport to be made in their name but which they strongly disagree with. Those examples have uh, quite a lot of similarities to the challenges faced by the Noongar claimants that led to the court decision, McGlade, that provoked this very bill. Legislating to default to majority decision-making is not the right response. Indeed, it goes against the full, frank and comprehensive consultation with all affected native title holders. What is needed is greater support to allow such consultation to occur. And any perceived administrative benefits in streamlining the process is far outweighed by potential discrimination and manipulation by a few against the balance of all native title holders. Um, now, Briefly, Schedule 7 provides for additional dispute resolution assistance from the National Native Title Tribunal, although it's not entirely clear precisely what form that assistance would take. And it's critical that the cost of accessing such assistance is not pushed unfairly onto native title groups and denied to those groups who are unable to pay. Um, the RNTBC has a statutory role to consult and resolve disputes and should bear the costs of the resolution unless another arrangement is agreed between the parties. Um, Schedule 8 proposes a number of amendments um, to the Corporations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act regarding the governance of those registered native title body corporates. Um, but whilst there are many changes needed to strengthen governance, it is entirely premature to amend the CATSI Act while the comprehensive review of that Act by the National Indigenous Australians Agency is still ongoing. I would have thought that was a fairly basic principle. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Kabi Nation is currently in dispute with the Queensland government over plans for a highway that would destroy the sacred site Jackie Kundu. And the former representative body, the Younger Buan Aboriginal Corporation, recognised the Kabi Council of Elders and First Nations governance structures that would have allowed the Kabi elders to speak against this destruction. But that body was dissolved without notice to the Kabi elders. And they allege that the new registered corporation ignores the voices of the Council of Elders. It's that body that the Queensland government has consulted to get consent, despite the long-standing vocal opposition of the Kabi elders. Members of the Theta Wara group have expressed to me their support for strengthening the CATSI Act to enforce rules regarding transparency and to allow native, native title holders to deal with improper behaviour and misuse of cancellation provisions by a registered native title body corporate. However, they are strongly opposed to provisions that would uh, require proceedings to be brought in the federal court, where applicants are already experiencing uh, severe delays. Uh, as, uh, finally, on Schedule 9, as Senator Thorpe has set out, the decision in McGlade very explicitly and intentionally reversed the previous position on the retrospective validation of Indigenous land use agreements, or ILUAs, seeking now to get around that conclusion, even where an ILUA is compromised by fraud or misconduct, misconduct is unjustified. ILUAs are a critical document in the expression of and in many cases in the relinquishing of rights to country, they must only be formalised with the informed consent of all affected native title holders. The Greens want to see a fair, accessible and effective system that delivers outcomes for First Nations peoples, consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and consistent with international human rights law. In asking whether this bill improves the recognition and rights of native title holders, we conclude that it does not. Minister. I thank all those who have made contributions to this debate on the Native Title Legislation Amendment Bill. The bill will amend the Native Title Act and the Corporations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act to make practical and pragmatic improvements to ensure the ongoing effectiveness of the native title system. In doing so, the bill will implement recommendations from a range of reviews of the native title system, including the Australian Law Reform Commission's report called Connection to Country, Review of the Native Title Act 1993. 
Passage of this bill will improve the native title system for all parties by supporting the capacity of native title holders through greater flexibility around internal decision making, by streamlining claims resolution and agreement making processes, by allowing historical extinguishment to be disregarded over areas of national, state or territory parks with the agreement of the parties, and increasing the transparency and accountability of native title corporations to native title holders, and improving pathways for dispute resolution following a determination of native title. The bill will also confirm the validity of important mining and exploration related agreements made under Section 31 of the Native Title Act that are potentially affected by the full federal court's decision in McGlade and the Native Title Registrar and others. There have been some concerns raised in the course of debate by Labor and Greens senators, and I've listened to them carefully and I acknowledge them. The Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee undertook a comprehensive inquiry into the provisions of this bill and recommended that the Senate pass it. The committee's report included a minority report from Labor senators which, while supporting the objectives of the bill, made five recommendations. Recommendations 1, 3 and 4 of that minority report are directed to the government commissioning or undertaking further review and reform to the Native Title Act. The government has taken action to implement these recommendations by including a statutory evaluation <coughs> mechanism in the bill. So new section 209 capital A will require a formal evaluation of the amendments in the bill to be conducted within five years of the commencement of most of the bill. The government has also undertaken to request the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner to conduct a review of the operation of the Native Title Act. Further overhaul of the Native Title system, including so that Native Title holders can better leverage their land and sea assets, as recommended by Recommendation 3 of the Minority Report, would need to be considered in light of the results of those formal evaluations of the amendments made by the bill and the outcomes of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner's review process. Recommendation 2 of the Minority Report called on the government to provide a comprehensive response to the 30 recommendations for reform in the Australian Law Reform Commission's 2015 report titled Connection to Country Review of the Native Title Act. This bill represents the government's response to the ALRC report and it implements those recommendations which received broad stakeholder support. The committee's report into the bill also included a dissenting report from the Australian Green senators. The dissenting report recommended that the bill not proceed until a number of matters were addressed. The government has provided further explanatory material in the form of the addenda to the explanatory memorandum to the bill that responds to the issues that were raised in the Greens dissenting report. That further explanatory material clarifies the intended effect of the removal of an agreement from the Register of Indigenous Land Use Agreements, the role of the Commonwealth Minister as an intervener in native title proceedings, and the intended operation of the new ground of allowing the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations to place a registered native title body corporate under special administration whether it has either seriously or repeatedly failed to comply with its obligations under native title legislation. The amendments will not enable the retrospective application of certain provisions of the bill as in the manner that has been suggested by the dissenting report. The dissenting report also raised concerns in relation to the interaction of Schedule 3 of the bill with statutory land rights under the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Rights Act. Schedule 3 will enable parties to agree to disregard the historical extinguishment of native title over an area that has been set aside or vested to preserve the natural environment. The drafting of this measure includes a number of specific safeguards to ensure the recognition and protection of existing third party interests, including those of New South Wales Aboriginal land councils. Importantly, the measure will only operate where native title and government parties agree. Very important we have that on record, 
um, Mr. President, and will be subject to any conditions required by the government party. This measure has been designed to allow the relevant government and native title parties to work together to ensure the use of this provision complements existing rights and interests, including those of the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Councils. I'd like to turn to deal with some of the concerns that have been raised during Senators' contributions in the course of debate. The first was to suggest that, as was raised by Senator Dodson, there were difficulties in the way that this bill Order, deals— Order. Senator Stoker, you will be in continuation when debate Thank resumes. You. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, Mr. President, I table for the information of the Senate a revised ministry list, and I seek to leave to have a document incorporated into Hansard and to make a short statement. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on 22 December 2020. In particular, uh, I congratulate Senator Sajolja, Senator Hume, uh, on their promotion to the ministry, and on, to Senator Stoker on her appointment as an assistant minister. I thank the Senate. So we'll move to Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, I also seek leave to make a statement relating to shadow ministerial arrangements. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator I thank I thank the Senate. On the 28th of January 2021, Mr. Albanese announced changes to the allocation of portfolios held by shadow ministers and assistant ministers. So I seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Keneally. Mr. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why is the Prime Minister cutting JobKeeper, cutting JobSeeker and cutting wages when his government has spent almost a billion dollars in advertising? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, it's disappointing to start the, uh, the new parliamentary year with a uh, question Order. that is, of course, uh, so full of misleading elements, uh, uh, so much trying to be the Labor Party Order. running a consistent Let's... approach to being a scare campaign yet again. The Labor Party that even on the matters of advertising doesn't seem to think that it's important for Australians to understand the support that's been available to them through the COVID-19 pandemic for them to have the health advice they need through the COVID-19 pandemic, for them to have the information they deserve through the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Mr President, uh, there are a range of very sound, good reasons as to why the Australian public need and deserve information through this pandemic. Mr President, further, Order. the policy measures that our government Order. has put in place always set out always set out against the principles of being proportionate, targeted and temporary, and temporary have served Australia in a position to achieve, to achieve economic outcomes that are the envy of much of the rest of the world. In our country, in our country we've seen 800,000 jobs come back during the course of the pandemic from the initial collapse. In Australia, we should be proud of the fact that we have seen the effective unemployment rate, which peaked around 15 per cent, now Sorry. come back to a position where it is on par with the overall unemployment rate around 6.6 per cent. These, of course, are the achievements of having put in place policy responses that were effective, but also policy responses that are true to the principles we set out, that they would be temporary and targeted to the circumstances and that we will continue to adapt and adjust to those circumstances, as we have successfully done at every stage of this global crisis. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The latest figures show that there are more than eight people on unemployment payments for every job vacancy. Why won't the Prime Minister rule out cutting job seeker back to $40 a day? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, uh, the support through JobKeeper and the Job Seeker Supplement have been important elements of our response today. But they're not the only elements of support to be able to continue to create more jobs and get more Australians back into work. We do see record levels of participation in the Australian employment market now. Remarkable situation, having faced a recession and a global pandemic, to have a circumstance now where the participation rate is at a record level. 
demonstrating the high levels of confidence that have been established across the Australian economy in both consumers and in businesses. Now, there is still a job to be done. We don't deny that there is still very clearly a job to be done to continue to grow employment. That is why we continue support, be it our programs like Job Trainer, be it programs like Home Builder, be it subsidies for apprenticeships and traineeships. These are all important Order, initiatives. Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final Thank you, Mr. President. Question. How many of the 2.3 million small and family businesses in Australia and the 4.7 million jobs that they support are acceptable casualties of this government's decision to cut JobKeeper in March? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, here we see the scare tactics from those opposite. Those opposite who I, who I note, Mr. President, I note the Leader of the Opposition uh, was out there the other day uh, saying that uh, Mr. Albanese, I believe today, Senator Abetz, uh, Mr. Albanese today, the Leader of the Opposition was out there uh, somehow suggesting uh, that spending was too much. And yet we have others who come in here suggesting there should be more spending. The inconsistency from those opposite, of course, knows few boundaries. Now, these are incredibly trying times for many Australian businesses, as they are for businesses right around the world. In Australia, in Australia, we saw last year a decline in terms of business insolvencies relative to previous years. That was a function of the extraordinary levels of support and changes government had put in place. We've always acknowledged not every job and not every business could survive through a global pandemic. But the success of this country in Order, helping them Senator survive Birmingham, stands out from the rest the of the world. Has expired. Senators, I draw to your attention the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Switzerland to Australia, His Excellency Mr Pedro Zvarin. On behalf of all Senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the Parliament and in particular to the Senate. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is working in 2021 to rebuild our economy, create jobs and secure Australia's future in the wake of the global pandemic? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question. And I know his very strong advocacy uh, on behalf of so many businesses in South Australia, so many people across South Australia, as uh, my coalition colleagues do universally across Australia, in terms of support for jobs growth and economic success across the country. Relative to the rest of the world, Australia starts 2021 in a very strong economic position. There is much we can be thankful for as a nation, and our economic strength relative to other countries, particularly advanced economies, uh, is something to be incredibly thankful for. More than 90 per cent of the 1.3 million Australians who either lost their jobs or had their work hours reduced to zero during the peak of the pandemic are now back at work. Almost 800,000 jobs have been created in the past seven months, and pleasingly, Mr President, women have taken up the majority of these new jobs that have been created. As I referenced before, the participation rate of the, in the Australian workforce has reached a record 66.2 per cent, as my colleague Senator Cash has highlighted uh, this strength in the employment market, such a strong show of confidence. Quarterly growth has had its biggest increase since 1976, and consumer and business confidence are back to pre-pandemic levels. In the face of the biggest global economic shock of our lifetimes, Australia's economic comeback is strong. Our economic recovery plan is working. It has been supported by $251 billion in direct economic support to date, and Treasury analysis has demonstrated that this support is expected to result in economic activity being 5 per cent higher in 2020-21 than would have otherwise been the case, and 4.5 per cent higher in 2021-22 showing the ongoing effect, and that ongoing effect comes indeed through our tax reform changes as well, the ongoing support of the JobMaker hiring credit. These give continued support right across the Australian economy to the recovery. Order. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate the Morrison government's priorities for the year ahead? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the number one priority remains to suppress the virus and to successfully deliver the vaccine across Australia. Our government has outlined a $1.9 billion vaccine rollout strategy, which is on top of the $4.4 billion we have spent 
on vaccine purchases, medical research and, of course, support for our neighbouring countries. We are working closely with the states and territories, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, the Australian Medical Associations, large logistical companies, general practices and community pharmacies to make sure we have a highly effective and safe vaccine rollout. Vaccinations of Australians will commence in late February, pending approval from the Therapeutic Goods Administration the, to ensure an orderly rollout across priority groups first and foremost, and then working through the rest of the country. That, this is central to our ongoing support of the economic recovery, uh, to the delivery of essential services for Australians, and to continuing to make sure we protect Order. Australia's Senator interests Birmingham. here Senator and around Lockwood, the world. Final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how Australia's economic recovery compares to our international counterparts? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, the Australian economy is forecast to outperform all major advanced economies in 2020. Real GDP in 2020 is expected to fall by 2.5 per cent before growing by 4.5 per cent in 2021. This compares in 2020 to a fall of 7.5 per cent across the euro, euro area. 5.25% in Japan and 3.25% in the United States. In the June quarter last year, our GDP fell by 7%, but this compared to falls of around 12% in New Zealand, 14% in France and 20% in the United Kingdom. These stark figures are a reminder of the enormous challenges many other countries are facing as they deal with the health and economic crises that have been caused by the COVID-19 global pandemic, but in Australia, our AAA credit rating has been reaffirmed. We are seeing people getting back to work. We are seeing a recovery that bodes well for Australia's continued strength into the future. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Tourism operators in Cairns have warned the Morrison government that thousands of jobs will be lost if JobKeeper isn't extended. In January, Liberal MP Warren Ench told the Cairns Post, and I quote, I have got no doubt support will continue for as long as it needs to happen. And extending JobKeeper was, and I quote, a no-brainer. Is he right? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I uh, thank the Senator for her, uh, for her question. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, as the senator has uh, alluded to and as any of us who live in and visit uh, tourism-reliant uh, areas of Australia uh, know, that is when we can go from state to state, of course, Mr President, uh, that tourism has taken a very significant impact from COVID-19. And former minister, Minister Birmingham particularly, has worked very hard with the industry uh, in terms of uh, response and support from government. And we have seen a boost to domestic tourism over summer, especially in those regions uh, within uh, driving or travel distance of, of major population centres. And those parts of the sector, though, Mr President, that rely on international travel and tourism in particular, do continue to face very difficult circumstances. And so from Minister Birmingham to Minister Tian, uh, the government has been engaging very closely with the tourism sector to understand how we are able to continue to assist uh, while we do wait for international tourism to return. And I actively encourage Australians to engage in domestic tourism. Uh, we hope that there will be some opportunity, for example, out of travel bubbles, uh, ultimately to, uh, to assist in that uh, international tourism to return. So it is a very challenging time, Mr President. There is no question about that. So through COVID-19, the government has provided record, record levels of economic support through programs such as JobKeeper, through small business cash payments of up to $100,000. And they have sustained hundreds of thousands of tourism businesses and jobs across Australia. As part of our plan to support tourism recovery, we're also providing further targeted assistance to help the tourism sector to rebound and to help save as many jobs as possible. That's in addition to our record funding for Tourism Australia of over $231 Order. million dollars Payne, in 2021. The answer has expired. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Treasury data shows that 3,600 businesses in Cairns are relying on JobKeeper more than any other postcode in Queensland. 
How many jobs will be lost in Cairns when JobKeeper ends in March? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll take the details of, uh, of the numbers uh, on notice uh, in terms of the senator's question. I was saying, though, that we have provided record funding support for Tourism Australia that is being used to directly support the tourism industry, including ramping up that domestic marketing campaigns with phase two of the Holiday Here This Year campaign, which is now underway, and of course positioning to commence international marketing campaigns when the time is right. We've outlined a clear plan for Australia to create jobs, to rebuild our economy, including helping to secure the future of, international to, of Australia's tourism industry. That includes the provision of a $50 million recovery for regional tourism fund to boost tourism in nine regions heavily reliant on international tourism. That's about delivering tailored assistance measures to help tourism businesses pivot to the domestic market. Those applications are now open, with eligible applicants able to submit requests for funding until the end of September this year. We've also earmarked $100 million of funding from the Building Better Regions Order. Fund for Senator Tourism Payne, Infrastructure the under a new— expired. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Is the Morrison government working on any support plan for tourism businesses in Cairns, and how many more jobs and livelihoods will be lost in the region while people wait for Mr Morrison to finally take action? Senator Payne. Well, Mr. President, I thank Senator Green for uh, her further supplementary question. Uh, I had already identified the Recovery for Regional Tourism Fund. I had just referred to the Building Better Regions Fund focused on tourism infrastructure, about helping the regions boost the supply of new quality tourism infrastructure to drive visitation in those regions. Also $100 million in the Regional Recovery Partnerships Program, coordinating that investment with other levels of government, state and territory and local government, to support growth and uh, recovery, including in tourism, in 10 priority regions. Also a $50 million business events program, a grants program, also open for applications, helping to instil confidence in the business events industry. That is also particularly important. And, Mr President, the uh, $128 million COVID-19 consumer travel support program that is providing, and this is important particularly for regions which have a high, level of, high number of travel agents, one-off grants to eligible travel agents, to tour arrangements, service Order. providers. Payne, All of those are focuses the of the government's plan. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. US President Joe Biden has made climate action a priority. He's taken dramatic action against coal, oil, and gas companies, supported clean energy, and is preparing for a climate summit on the 22nd of April. He's spoken to many heads of state, both close allies and rivals, but he hasn't yet spoken to the Australian Prime Minister. Why hasn't this call happened? Is Mr Morrison way down the call list because he's a climate laggard? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, uh, I am certain of, uh, of one thing, and that is that, uh, that Pres President Biden won't be making his calls or scheduling his call list on the advice of Senator Hanson Young or the Australian Greens. Uh, what I do know is that the new U.S. administration, uh, who we congratulate upon their election and, uh, and, uh, and welcome the opportunity to work with them, uh, have already engaged deeply uh, with uh, building relationships across the Australian government. Uh, that, uh, that the uh, Secretary of State, and National Security Adviser, has uh, have each spoken with uh, with our Foreign Minister, Mr. Payne and that the Secretary of Defence has spoken with Senator Reynolds as our Defence Minister, and that indeed uh, uh, Mr. Kerry. Mr Kerry, uh, John Kerry, the uh, President Biden's climate envoy, uh, has spoken with Minister Taylor, uh, our Minister for Emissions Reduction. Uh, so indeed engagement has occurred there, and I have no doubt that discussions between President Biden and the Prime Minister will occur uh, in, uh, in short order, I am certain. But those discussions are occurring between our government and the new US administration, as you would expect, right across each of the portfolio levels. And I also reject categorically uh, the description of, uh, of laggard or whatever term it was that Senator Hanson used. Uh, the statistics show very clearly that you know, Australia's record in relation to emissions reduction stands well compared with the rest of the world. But between 2005 and 2020, Australia's emissions fell by nearly 17 per cent, by 16.6 per cent to be precise. 
This compares with an OECD Order. average of emissions reduction of 9 per cent, or a New Zealand emissions reduction of around 1 per cent, or Canada's emissions reduction of less than 1 per cent. These are the comparisons that show Australia's track record is strong, just as our intention to continue to drive the technological change that would deliver further Order. emissions Senator reduction Birmingham, is resolute. The answer has expired. Senator Hanson, Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I think we'd all be interested to know what uh, Climate Envoy John Kerry actually said to Minister Taylor, because he's made his views about gas being a transition fuel very clear. Last week, he said the problem with gas and I'm quoting, is if we build out a huge infrastructure for gas now and continue to use it as a bridge fuel when we haven't really exhausted other possibilities, we're going to be stuck with stranded assets in 10, 20, 30 years. Will the Morrison government be trumpeting Order. their gas fire recovery Young, in front the of the US Senator again? Senator Young, resume your seat. The ability to complete a question can be directly related to the length of the preamble. And if I call senators to order, I ask them to heed the chair. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. President. Uh, well, our government will stand by all of our energy policies that are about achieving secure, affordable, reliable order. energy for Australia, for Australian industry, for Australian manufacturers, while also meeting our commitments to emissions reduction targets. We also stand by the investments we're making in our stretch targets that are about the technologies necessary to achieve emissions reduction in the future. Our targets investing in getting clean hydrogen to under $2 per kilo, in getting electricity from storage for firming to under $100 per megawatt hour, from getting low emission steel production under $900 per tonne and low emissions aluminium under $2,700 per tonne from getting carbon capture and storage under $20 per tonne of CO2, getting soil carbon measurement under $3 per hectare per year book. These are all about how you actually achieve emissions reduction rather than just grandstand on it, Senator Hanson-Young, and that's where we're focusing Order, the investment and the energy. Senator Hanson-Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Will the Morrison government be taking a more ambitious plan to this summit in April? In fact, will you even be invited? Will you be invited and will you continue to isolate Australia on the world stage in the eyes of everybody else who wants real action on climate change and now the US are making us look like we are laggards left for dead and what are you going to do about it? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, we're starting the year with, uh, with lies and misleading statements in Labor questions, and of course, uh, and of course, lots of uh, hysteria from uh, from the Australian Greens. The facts of the matter. The facts of the matter, Mr. President. The facts of the matter are uh, that our government looks forward to working with the Biden administration. We've already had outreach on a number of levels, including between the Minister for Emissions Reduction and the climate change envoy. We particularly look forward to the fact that President Biden, during his campaign, emphasised the importance of investment in transformative technologies. Because as we have identified, you don't achieve emissions reduction outcomes without those transformative technologies. It's transformative technologies that have driven the remarkable take-up of renewable energy in Australia, and it's transformative technologies that will achieve change elsewhere, including in other countries around the world, who we need to see achieve emissions reductions as well if the world is to Order, successfully Senator tackle Birmingham. this issue together. Senator Dean Smith. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on developments in Myanmar. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for his question and for his long interest uh, in matters concerning uh, Myanmar. The Australian government is, I have, as I have uh, stated in uh, a statement yesterday, deeply concerned that the Myanmar military, the Tatmadaw, has uh, seized control of Myanmar. Early on the 1st of February, the Tatmadaw detained democratically elected leaders, including State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the President uh, and others. The Tatmadaw has announced a state of emergency and the establishment of a caretaker government, with the military-appointed Vice President uh, currently appointed caretaker president. Uh, he has handed authority to the Commander-in-Chief uh, for one year. 
Mr. President, the situation does remain fluid. Uh, communications, including both phones and internet, in the capital Naypyidaw in the city of Yangon are severely disrupted. Uh, the Tatmadaw are demanding a uh, revision of the November 2020 election results and have announced they intend to hold new elections. Note for the record that Australia was part of uh, international observer participation through our uh, post in Yangon uh, to those elections. Uh, in the statement I released yesterday, we did call on the military to respect the rule of law to resolve disputes according to lawful mechanisms and to release immediately all civilian leaders who had been detained unlawfully. The Australian government has called for the peaceful reconvening of the National Assembly of Myanmar consistent with the results of that November 2020 general election. Our embassy in Yangon is making inquiries regarding the safety and position of Australians to the extent that disrupted communications uh, allow. These, are, these events are particularly concerning because the political stability of ASEAN member states is essential to achieving a secure, peaceful region, prosperous and open Indo-Pacific. ASEAN, of course, is at the centre of our vision for the Indo-Pacific region. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise on Australia's engagement with other nations that share our concerns about these developments? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Smith. Uh, we are in close contact with uh, other countries, including through our embassy in Yangon, uh, to discuss these developments and our respective responses. Uh, Like-minded democracies around the world have expressed uh, that they share uh, our deep concern. We welcome statements by regional partners and other governments, uh, including ASEAN Chair Brunei. I spoke with Dato Erwan, my counterpart uh, in Brunei today, just before question time. Uh, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from Indonesia, the United States, the UK, Japan, Canada and others. I have also spoken today, as the uh, government leader in the Senate alluded to, with United States National Security Adviser Jake Sullivan and uh, raised uh, these issues in that discussion, and I will uh, continue to raise them with other colleagues. Last week, on 29 January, we signed a joint statement affirming our support for Myanmar's democratic transition, urging the military to adhere to democratic norms with a number of like-minded uh, countries represented in Yangon. We will continue to work through our overseas network to engage Order, with other governments, Senator particularly Payne. in our region. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister ad uh, advise the Senate on Australia's strong commitment to supporting democracy in Myanmar? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And Australia has been a long-standing partner for Myanmar through both good times and more difficult periods. We have consistently supported the move to democracy, that transition period, and the social and economic reform agenda. I visited Myanmar shortly after my appointment as Foreign Minister in December of 2018. I know Senator Smith has visited uh, on previous occasions as well. Our development program there includes a focus on promoting peace and stability. Uh, on democratic institutions, on supporting elections, uh, on the peace process and women's empowerment and gender equality. Our commitment to Myanmar's development and Myanmar's people continues at that, this difficult time and includes support for vaccine access, for delivering humanitarian assistance and supporting inclusive social and economic development. We sincerely hope to see Myanmar succeed for the benefit of all of its people and for our region as a whole. And I do want to assure the people of Myanmar, the many members in the diaspora here in Australia, Order. that Senator we will Payne, stand with them in this difficult the time. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. On the 7th of September, Mr Morrison promised, and I quote, Australians will be among the first in the world to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. With 60 countries having commenced vaccinations and more than 100 million doses of the vaccine already given, how can the Morrison government claim it has delivered on this promise? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. Mr President, what this government do, is doing is what we said we'd do, which is manage an orderly rollout of vaccine, Mr. President, and, and managing the vaccine rollout, Mr. President, uh, with a fully with Order. a fully approved vaccine starting very soon with the arrival of the Pfizer product after the TGA approved the 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 vaccine for uh, from Pfizer, uh, and we will continue to manage that orderly rollout, Mr President. I have to say it's really disappointing. It's really disappointing, Mr President, that the Labor Party continues with their reckless 
completely reckless commentary with respect to vaccine, Mr. President. We have, we have at all times, Mr. President, managed an orderly process through accessing appropriate an appropriate Order. number of vaccine candidates, going through an appropriate and full vaccine, uh, approval process to ensure that Australians can have confidence in the vaccine that we are vaccines that we are looking to provide to uh, Australians. The, the confidence that Australians have in this vaccine, in the vaccines that we have available, is going to be absolutely crucial to take up of vaccines across the country and to the protection of Australians, particularly those, Mr. President, who are most vulnerable. So, Mr. President, we will continue our orderly and structured process for the provision, approval, and application of vaccines. Uh, that we, we have started and we have continued to be honest with the Australian people with respect to the rollout, the availability of vaccines, and we have brought them on responsibly, not like the Labor Party, who have continued with this reckless, reckless commentary which will only Order, undermine Senator confidence Colbeck. in the Senator, vaccination Order, process. Senator Colbeck, time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have a supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. On the 5th of November, Mr Morrison declared that Australians would be, and I quote, at the front of the queue. Can the minister confirm approximately 60 countries are in front of Australia? So which queue was Mr Morrison referring to? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, I will repeat what I've just said with respect to rollout of the vaccine. Mr President, we will continue to roll out the vaccine in a responsible manner uh, with a fully approved process. The TGA has, has undergone a comprehensive order. Senator, approval Senator process Colbeck. for the vaccine to Wong. ensure— order. Senator Colbeck. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. Uh, the minister was asked a question, a very short question, uh, which included the Prime Minister's assertion to the country that Australians were at the front of the queue. Uh, we would invite the minister to respond to the question, which is which queue was the Prime Minister referring to? I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. I, I can't instruct the minister either on the part of the question or the terms in which he may answer. However, it was a relatively narrow question. I'm going to consider the minister to be directly relevant if he strictly confines his comments to the distribution or rollout, for lack of a better term, um, of the vaccine. But I'm listening carefully to his answer. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, we will continue to roll this, the vaccine out in accordance with approval by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is the responsible thing for us to do, properly certified and approved by the TGA, which is exactly what we're doing. We are one of the first countries in the world to be able to provide a fully approved Order. vaccination process for Australians. And we will continue to do that because one of the most important things, Mr. President, one of the most important things is that Australians have confidence in the vaccine that we are offering to them. Order. And the take Senator up Colbeck, of the vaccine. Time for the, answer, time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In the UK, US, Canada, and the EU, the time between approval and the first doses being administered was between three and six days. The TGA approved the Pfizer vaccine eight days ago. How many more days will Australians have to wait? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine is being provided to Australia in accordance with the contractual arrangements that we signed with Pfizer for the take up of the vaccine. And under those arrangements, shipment of the vaccine was conditional on our approval of the vaccine. So we are receiving the vaccine in accordance with the contractual arrangements that were made with the manufacturers of the virus. When the virus arrives in this country, it will be batch tested to ensure that it uh, meets the requirements that it's specified to have, and then it will be made available to Australians, Mr. President. I am not going to to descend into the irresponsible 
irresponsible and reckless, Order. reckless commentary that the Labor Party are trying to engage in because confidence in this order. vaccine Colbeck, is absolutely vital. I have Senator vital. Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order direct relevance. He's worried about confidence in the vaccine. I assume he's going to reject order. Mr Kelly's Senator arguments Wong. Uh, order. publicly. Senator Wong, that's not a point of order. My point of order is direct relevance. Delay between approval and administration. Thank you, Senator Wong. On the point of order, I have ruled before that when there are strictly drafted questions, and I do consider this one to be one without pejorative phrases, um, political observations on the opposition are not directly relevant. Um, now, Senator Colbeck, you only have two seconds remaining. I'll ask you to continue. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as I said, the vaccine is being provided strictly in order, terms Senator of the Colbeck, contractual time for the answer has Expired. Senator Chandler. Order. Order. Senator Ch Order on my left. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. And it is an honour to ask this question to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the Minister inform the Senate why the Morrison government is modernising Order. and improving? Order. Order on my left. Order. Senator Ayres, you're not being helpful. It is only our first day back. Order. Just for something different. Senator. Start again. Senator, I'm not sure. I think we heard the question, didn't we? No, Senator. We, all right. Senator Chandler, if we waste time, we are costing the opposition time. Senator Chandler. Order on my left. Order. <coughs> Senator Chandler. I, we, we are going to continue to waste time that is traditionally considered to be of value to non-government parties if I don't have silence for a colleague to, answer, to ask a question. It is our first day back. Can we try a little harder? Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate why the Morrison government is modernising and Order. improving— Order. The... Senator Chandler. We... I'm, going to... I'm happy to do this till three o'clock. I'm happy to. It's not particularly, you know, it's not particularly of concern to me how I spend the next 23 minutes. Senator Birmingham. Mr. 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 President, since you called for order, Senator Wong hasn't ceased speaking. Order. Now the opposition have had their bit of fun. If perhaps. All interjections are disorderly, as you've rightly pointed out. You grant a degree of tolerance, Mr. President, but I think the tolerance is being stretched now. Um, I, I, don't want, I, I don't particularly want to commence the first day back by actually asking, threatening to name anyone, but this is a Senate question time, not a session of Gregorian chanting. So I would ask that Senator Chandler, after the opposition has made its point and will have time to do so at three o'clock when we take note of answers, we hear Senator Chandler and her question in silence. Please. Third Senator time Chandler. lucky. Can the minister inform the Senate why the Morrison government is modernising and improving Australia's superannuation system? Yes. Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question Order. and her ongoing commitment to a more efficient and more cost-effective superannuation system in Australia. Mr President, the Australian superannuation system manages around $3 trillion in retirement savings on behalf of around 16 million Australians. And while the system has grown significantly, it does need to adapt to better meet the needs Order. of Australians. The Your Future, Your Super package announced in the 2020-21 budget is the Morrison government's next step in modernising and improving the Australian superannuation system to ensure that it is working harder for all Australians. This is part of the government's plan to make the Australian super system more competitive, more transparent, more efficient and better governed and ensure that Australians can reap the full benefits of compulsory superannuation. 
Mr. President, the Treasury forecasts that your future, your super package will save Australians around $17.9 billion over the next decade in reduced fees and better performance of the super system. Young Australians entering the workforce could be up to $98,000 better off at retirement because of these reforms. At present, uh, at present, Australian households pay around $30 billion a year in superannuation fees, and that excludes insurance premiums. That's more than the $27 billion that households spend on energy bills and the $12 billion they pay on water bills. This government's measures to date have gone a long way to combating the inefficiencies and, and anomalies, but more must still be done. And, Mr President, the question must be asked, will Labor again oppose the legislation that will make Australia's system more competitive, transparent and efficient. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate— Order. I, I really don't want to feel like I'm in a classroom. I know there are people in here with a lot more experience than I am in that, in that um, as teachers I was referring to. I, we don't need chanting, quite frankly. The point has been made. It's not particularly amplifying, Senator Keneally, because I can't hear Senator Chandler clearly, and I would like to. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how Australians will benefit from an improved superannuation system? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Mr. President, Mr. President, announced, uh, the, uh, the reforms announced in the 2021 budget, the Your Future, Your Super package, will create efficiencies, reduce costs and reduce duplication through four measures. First, through ensuring that superannuation follows you when you change jobs. This will stop the creation of unwanted multiple accounts that reduce retirement savings through duplicate fees and insurance premiums. Second, by introducing a new and interactive online Your Super comparison tool. And this will empower our members to make better decisions about who manages their retirement savings. The Your Super tool will help members compare and select My Super products that best meet their needs. Third, through holding funds to account for underperformance by introducing an objective performance test, and funds that fail that test will be required to inform their members, and if they fail in two consecutive years, they will be stopped from taking new members. And finally, by increasing transparency and accountability, ensuring trustees act in the best financial interest of members to maximise their retirement time savings. The answer has expired. I'm going to ask senators on my left to restrain themselves. On the first day back, special, special effort. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the importance of a superannuation system that holds funds to account for underperformance? Senator Hume. Mr President, this government has steadily raised the bar on superannuation performance expectations and governance structures since we came to power. Our focus has squarely been on ensuring superannuation delivers for members, for consumers, for everyday Australians. The Your Future, Your Super package will protect members from poor outcomes and encourage funds to lower their costs. The Morrison, go the Morrison government wants and indeed it expects superannuation will deliver more for Australians. The Your Future, Your Super reforms will do just that. It's not, uh, it wasn't until we, on this side of the chamber, came to government that super, the superannuation system had a light shone on underperformance and inefficiencies. We know this because our changes to the super system uh, to make it more competitive, transparent and efficient have had great effect. 800,000 Australians who were locked Order into a fund by their employers now have the, your, the, the choice Order. to choose their own fund. $760 million was paid to 700,000 employees through our amnesty measures, and $3.7 billion Order. in unintended Senator accounts Hume. have Time been for consolidated. The answer has expired, Senator Hume. Order. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Finance, Minister Birmingham. Minister, uh, Mr Kelliston used, used to be responsible for policing our donations laws when he was Commissioner of the Australian Electoral Commission. He told the ABC yesterday that our political donation laws are some of the worst in the world. He said the rules do very little to make sure voters know who is funding political parties and how much donors are giving of any out there. You'd think he would, he would know how bad things are. Is he wrong? Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, uh, for her question. Um, uh, I don't agree with the assessments that, uh, that have been made. Yesterday, we saw 
and the disclosure of donations across the Australian political landscape, and they provide uh, a high level of transparency around uh, major donations that are made directly to uh, political parties, uh, and, uh, and in doing so uh, serve to give and should give the Australian people and public confidence uh, around that donation system. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Minister, it was only yesterday that Australians found out about money that could have gone into the Coalition's bank accounts over 19 months ago. Do you believe that voters think that delay passes the pub test? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, I know that, uh, that many things exercise the minds of, uh, of many voters, and we've canvassed some of those during question time today. I think, first and foremost, at this time, uh, health and employment considerations exercise. Uh, the minds of voters, uh, but, uh, but in relation to uh, political donations, uh, we have a system uh, where they are reported both by uh, the donor under, uh, under certain requirements and by the recipient under certain requirements. Uh, it's an important check and balance, uh, and yesterday was an example of how it works. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When money changes hands between political parties and political donors in Queensland, Queenslanders hear about it in seven days. Voters find out about political donations in 21 days during an election in New South Wales in Victoria, but federal political parties can drag their heels for more than a year before they have to tell voters about where their money has come from. Why are the, ex why are the expectations for political parties so much lower in federal parliament than they are in every other state except for Tasmania? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Uh, the, uh, the arrangements that are in place and they've been uh, reformed occasionally over the years in different ways, but they are arrangements that do provide uh, for uh, the publication of details. So you can see across uh, today's media that, uh, that there is uh, scrutiny given to that. Uh, all members of, uh, of political parties uh, are aware uh, that such donations will be published. Uh, the donors who make those donations are aware that they will be published, uh, and in doing so, as I say, that gives uh, transparency across the system uh, and, uh, and ensures that our democracy, which does, uh, is a free democracy in which people are free uh, to engage, including to give money uh, as part of that, uh, part of that process. And, uh, and if there are any areas where there might be argu arguably a lack of transparency, it's probably in relation to some of those non-political party entities, those like GetUp or others. Uh, who, uh, who, uh, whose funding Order. sources Senator are Birmingham, more opaque. Time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The Liberal member for Hughes, Mr. Craig Kelly, has made a range of statements, including, and I quote, "You don't need no vaccine." Does the minister agree this statement? is irresponsible and dangerous and endangers Australian lives. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, gather, uh, I understand Mr Kelly has, uh, has equally indicated that, uh, uh, that he supports the distribution of the vaccine, intends to have a vaccine himself. Uh, now, my message to all Australians and the message of our government to all Australians is whether you are a member of the public or a member of parliament, you ought to take your health advice uh, from the health experts yeah, yeah. when it comes to uh, the development of our vaccine strategy. Our government works alongside uh, Professor Paul Kelly, uh, the chief medical officer in the development order. of our vaccination Senator strategy. Birmingham, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. The point of order is not whether or not the Prime Minister is listening to the advice of the medical officers. Uh, the point of order is direct relevance. The question is not about whether the Prime Minister is listening to the advice of medical officers. We are asking this minister, who is representing the Prime Minister, that whether or not the statement by Mr Kelly that you don't need no vaccine end quote, is irresponsible and dangerous. Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, the minister earlier in his answer did reference statements by the member of the other place, uh, and he is specifically talking about uh, communications and information about a vaccine. I've allowed you to restate the question. I can't instruct him how to answer it, but as long as he stays on those bounds, I think he is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thank, thanks, Mr President. Let me be, be very clear. Let me be very clear. All Australians are encouraged and should be encouraged to receive a vaccine. 
the vaccine, the vaccine order is voluntary, order. and the rollout of the vaccination process will be voluntary. Order. However, order. all members across the parliament, all people across leadership positions, ought to encourage the safe receipt of the vaccines. Because, order. because Mr. President, we are doing this based upon the health advice, the best order. available health advice for the nation. As Senator Colbeck outlined in the chamber before, Australia is one of the few Senator countries Wong in the world. On a, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The question is about a statement made by Mr Kelly. Will this minister say to the Senate and through it the Australian people that Mr Kelly's statement is irresponsible and dangerous? Uh, again, Senator that Wong. is the question that he has been asked. He is refusing to even respond to Mr Kelly's Senator, statement. Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate the question. I have ruled previously, and I believe the minister is narrowly constructing his remarks. You are asking me to instruct the minister the terms in which he should answer, which is outside my authority. There's a chance to debate answers after question time. I believe the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Thanks Mr President. Again, as I have said very clearly, everyone should be encouraged to have the vaccine, and everyone should encourage receipt Order. of the vaccine. And in this Order place and in the there. other place, Everyone Order. should encourage their constituents and others to receive a vaccine, a vaccine that in this country has Senator gone Gallagher. through more scrutiny, safer processes and will be part of a coordinated vaccination strategy for which all Australians should Senator have confidence Keneally. in its safety and its efficacy. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday at the National Press Club, like you did just now, Senator Birmingham, again refused to reject Mr Kelly's irresponsible and damaging comments. Why? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, I don't think I could have been any clearer in relation to the government's position Order. or my position about the receipt of vaccines. We encourage everyone to receive a vaccine. It is voluntary across Australia and will be voluntary. But we want to make sure there are high levels of confidence in the vaccine program. We have gone through a process that is thorough and rigorous to ensure those high levels of confidence. Australia, unlike other countries that have had to rush emergency approvals, has been able to go through the comprehensive processes of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Australia, unlike other countries that have had to rush distribution processes, has been able to develop distribution arrangements that should give people confidence in the efficacy and efficiency of the rollout. Australia is taking a role leading not only in our country but in Order. others in our Senator region to promote Senator the receipt on a, Senator, of the Senator vaccines. Birmingham, Senator Birmingham, sorry, Senator O'Neill. Uh, on a point of order. Uh, the point of order again is relevance. The question was very clear. Why do you continue to refuse to reject Mr Kelly's irresponsible uh, comments? Uh, Senator O'Neill, uh, again, I, I can't instruct the minister of terms in which to answer. I believe the minister is constructing his comments and is direct, to be directly relevant um, and has addressed part of that question in his answer. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I'm not going to give airtime to debates about the merits of the vaccines. I'm going to stick to the merits of the vaccines and the merits of our vaccination strategy to get to Order, all Australians. Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Order. I, can't, I won't be able to hear Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill. Will the minister today make a clear public statement that Mr Kelly's advice to the Australian people is irresponsible and dangerous and should not be relied upon? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I don't think I could have been any clearer in the previous answers about the advice to the Australian Order. people. Rely upon the advice of Professor Kelly. Rely upon the advice of Dr Murphy. Rely upon the advice of your medical practitioners. Rely upon the advice Order. that we promote of the health officials across this country. Rely upon the advice of the medical officers across the states and territories. Rely upon the advice of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Because you know whose advice our government is relying upon? All of those experts who have kept Australia safe as we have worked hand in glove with them throughout this pandemic. Order. We're not being distracted. 
by other comments. We're not seeking to provoke or promote debates about the order, merits of the vaccine. We are focused Senator on Wong its efficacy and its delivery. Order, Senator Wong. Order on my left, Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. And I would again invite the minister to do the right thing and make a clear public statement that Mr Kelly's advice is irresponsible and dangerous and ought not be relied upon. On the, on the point of order, oh, Senator Abetz, do you wish to rise on the point of order? I do, Mr President. I've been listening very closely to the assertions being made by the opposition. And if I understand the assertion correctly, you don't need no vaccine is in fact a double negative, and therefore, and therefore, Mr. Kelly is in fact promoting vaccine. And, uh, I don't know why the opposition has got any difficulty with the matter. You had a very good grammar teacher, Senator Abetz. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, can I? Uh, I'm willing to, Senator O'Neill. I've taken Senator Wong on the point of order. Um, Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate the question. I believe you're asking me to instruct the minister the terms in which to answer. I believe he's being directly relevant, including just then when um, he was he was outlining he was outlining a series of authorities that I believe um, are directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, unlike those opposite, I'm not going to promote debates from anybody who might undermine the vaccine strategy or its Order. distribution we are going to promote Order. we are going to promote receipt of Order. the vaccine we are Order. going to promote senator the efficacy wong. and safety Order. of the vaccine and that's Time going to be the, the focus of this expired. senator wong interjections are always disorderly order order I'll call the next question when I have the opportunity to hear it. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. I am delighted to ask the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja, his first question as a minister of our government. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the Morrison government Order. is supporting— Order on my left. It's really disrespectful when you— Order. No, first question. Order. First question. It is not only dis very Order. disrespectful. All right, Senator Henderson, this is not your a reflection on you, but please, I'll ask you to start the question again Thank when you. there's silence. On my left, it's not only disrespectful, which it is, it's also completely contrary to the standing orders, and we're only an hour into our first question time. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting our Pacific family in the face of the current global pandemic? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question. Firstly, I want to recognise the honour I've been given and to reiterate that there's never been a more important time for Australia to stand shoulder to shoulder with our partners across the Pacific. Now, the impact of the global pandemic on the economies of our Pacific neighbours has been profound uh, and the risk to their health systems is acute. The pivot of Australia's development program in response to COVID-19 has been unprecedented. The government's Partnerships for Recovery strategy provides the whole of government framework for our response. It is tightly focused on health security, stability and economic recovery in the Pacific, Timor-Leste and Southeast Asia. Now, Australia's 2021 ODA budget is fully aligned with the strategy, with an estimated $1.44 billion for the Pacific, a record high. The government is also providing $304.7 million for a Pacific COVID-19 economic response package. Now, this targeted temporary funding for two years is in addition to Australia's $4 billion ODA program and delivers critical financing to mitigate fiscal crises, maintain essential health services, sustain aviation connectivity and protect the most vulnerable. We have restarted Pacific worker employment programs to boost economic activity and incomes for Pacific families and Aussie farmers. These programs not only provide work for our, for our neighbours but support Aussie businesses who face their own losses if we do not act. The Pacific Step Up means working with our Pacific partners to build a region that is secure strategically, stable economically and sovereign politically. Together, 
These programs show Australia's support for the Pacific as the leading contributor of aid in the region, but also as a neighbour, a partner and a friend in these difficult times. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister provide an update on the progress of Australia's provision of vaccines to the Pacific and Southeast Asia? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is no higher priority for countries in our region than access to COVID-19 vaccines. Now, Senator Payne and I have already reached out to our counterparts in the Pacific and Southeast Asia to underline our commitment and advance the next steps on vaccine rollouts, uh, including $523.2 million over three years for a COVID-19 vaccine access and health security initiative for the Pacific and Southeast Asia. $80 million previously committed to the multilateral COVAX facilities advanced market commitment to support vaccination for the populations at greatest risk in 92 developing countries. Now, this initiative offers full vaccine coverage for the Pacific and Timor-Leste and will enable the procurement of vaccines and provide technical support to pre prepare for vaccine introduction. We're working closely with New Zealand, France and the United States to ensure our Pacific family have vaccines that are safe, effective and can be accessed to support the Order, economic Senator recovery Selger. of the region. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister also provide an update on the support provided by Australia to our Pacific neighbours after Cyclone Yasa? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And first, I acknowledge uh, the dreadful loss of life and devastating property damage in Fiji, the conditions they now face again, uh, unfortunately, with Cyclone Anna. Uh, but we have stepped up uh, with $4.5 million in humanitarian relief. At Fiji's request, uh, a, a RAF aircraft conducted aerial damage assessments to aid relief planning. HMAS Adelaide was deployed to support relief efforts, including construction and engineering to repair over 30 schools. In total, we delivered over 165 tonnes of supplies and almost 1 million litres of water. Now, I had the opportunity to speak to Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama, who thanked his Australian Vivale and noted again Australia's willingness to help Fiji in their hour of need. I reminded the Prime Minister that 12 months earlier it was Fiji who helped us with our bushfire recovery. It's a great example of how people and nations across the Pacific can help each other, and we will continue to support our Fijian Vivale in their recovery. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Mm -hmm. Senator Rice. Hi, I ask the Minister representing the Prime Minister for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to question on notice no, number 1905 relating to community sport infrastructure grants. Okay. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Senator uh, Birmingham. Th 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 thanks, Mr. President. I understand a response uh, has, uh, has recently been tabled, Senator Rice, but uh, I am happy to, uh, to also lay a, lay a copy on the table uh, for the Senate chamber, and I'll walk one over to you in a second. Uh, that, yeah, so. No, the, now once it's been tabled, that brings a close to that matter, so it can't be followed up in the chamber. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator O'Neill. Now there are room, there is room for many different voices on different issues in a mature democracy. And we can find room to disagree about policy priorities and we can find room to, uh, to disagree about facts and about values. But there are some lines, some lines that should not be crossed. And one of those lines is endangering lives. Over the past year, the member for Hughes has crossed that line again and again and again. He has made demonstrably fa false claims that endanger ordinary people's health. His comments are now notorious, arguing against all available scientific evidence that particular drugs can cure COVID when they cannot, and claiming 
as he did just this month, that mask wearing is dangerous and forcing children to wear them is child abuse. Peddling false medical information at any time is dangerous. Doing so during a global pandemic that has claimed 2.2 million lives worldwide is inexcusable. And yet excuses is exactly what is being offered from the top down, from the Prime Minister, from the Deputy Prime Minister and today in this chamber by the Leader of the Government. These excuses don't hold up. They don't stand ordinary scrutiny. Asked if Mr Kelly's remarks would cause panic and fear in the community, Mr McCormack lamely said he did not think so. Offering this excuse, I don't know how many followers Craig Kelly has on his Facebook or a social media platform, but it's probably poor compared to perhaps what the mainstream media has. Well, Mr Kelly proudly boasts that his posts reached over 1.8 million people in January and, I uh, quote, ensured that more people are exposed to the facts and have been educated about Invermectin and OCQ and zinc. Now, the Prime Minister has refused to condemn Mr Kelly's comments, saying glibly that Mr Kelly is not my doctor. Well, an actual doctor, the vice president of the AMA, said that misinformation like the, that, was, that was being shared by Mr Kelly was torching the foundation of community health and science. But the Prime Minister said he thought Mr Kelly was doing a good job as the member for Hughes. Well, what does that look like? What is this good job that the Prime Minister is talking about? Mr Kelly's Facebook page is a relentless cavalcade of misleading information. Since January 30, he has published 23 posts. Twelve of them promote COVID misinformation, nine provoke climate misinformation, and one relates to a community event. Just one. And he topped off that performance by doing a 90-minute podcast with Mr Pete Evans, a man who last year was fined by the Therapeutic Goods Association for make Authority for making false claims about supposed COVID fighting devices and went on to tweet a meme containing neo-Nazi imagery. It should be easy. It should be easy for the Prime Minister for Mr McCormack and for Senator Birmingham to condemn a man who has peddled dangerous conspiracies. And it should be even easier to condemn the use of taxpayer-funded platforms to spread them. Mr Kelly is afforded a privileged position. He is a pre-selected member of the Liberal Party. He is a member of the Australian Parliament. And I don't think it should be beyond Mr Morrison to say very clearly what is clear to everybody else in this community that what Mr Kelly is saying is wrong and it is dangerous and that people should not listen to him in particular. A real leader, a real leader with a spine would find it within himself to have an opinion, to express an opinion about the wrong and dangerous ideas espoused by Mr Kelly. And the failure to do so is even more extraordinary when we consider the relationship between Mr Morrison and Mr Kelly, because it has been widely reported that Mr Kelly owes his job, owes his pre-selection to Mr Morrison. Mr Morrison intervenes to save Maverick MP Craig Kelly from pre-selection defeat. The Herald in 2018. Scott Morrison's fixer offered Craig Kelly's challenger a $350,000 party job to drop out. Well, Mr Kelly has his seat in this parliament, thanks to Mr Morrison. And the least Mr Morrison can do is show some courage, show some courage and hold him to account. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Carr. Scar, sorry. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I too believe, as the Prime Minister believes, that Senator, uh, Craig Kelly does a wonderful job for the people of Hughes. And I want to say, I want to, say to Senator McAllister, and all those opposite who are seeking to attack Mr Craig Kelly or anyone else or anyone else in this country as we go through this process of encouraging encouraging Australians to receive uh, medical advice from their trusted source and to make their own decision to vaccinate on the basis of that expert medical advice i say to those opposite that the way to approach this debate is not to demonize is not to antagonise, is not to insult. It is to have a respectful discussion and seek to persuade people's minds. 
that is the way to deal with the issue, Senator O'Neill. I've actually read quite widely some of the literature that has been published over many years with respect to the way, the best way, the most effective way to deal with those people in our community, including those overseas, who are resistant to vaccinations. And the lessons I took from reading that scientific literature in many cases is that the worst thing you can do, the worst thing you can do is exactly what the opposition sought to do here today, and that is to attack and vilify people as opposed to engaging in a mutual, mutually respectful discussion and encourage people, encourage people, encourage you're not at ALP pre-selection for the Senate ticket today, Senator O'Neill, so please don't interject on me. It is Order. not the way, it is Order. not the way to boost the maximum participation in relation to this vaccination rollout. It is simply not the way. And I'm quite happy to circulate some of the articles I've read that which consider research over many years in relation to the best way to encourage people to vaccinate. I will be taking the best medical advice that I can find, and that includes my own local GP, Dr Ben Gordon. And I give you a shout out, Ben. You've been a loyal servant to my medical health over many years. And I'll be sitting down with my GP and having the conversation which thousands of Australians will be having or should be having with their medical professional. And I am entirely confident that just as the case with respect to the high vaccination rates that our children have, with respect to many vaccines that have been lifesavers, absolute lifesavers for millions and millions of people around the world, I'm confident that after those conversations take place between individual Australians and families with their medical professionals, their medical advisers, that the majority of Australians will decide, will make their own free voluntary decision to be vaccinated. It does not help. It does not help Senator O'Neill to seek to vilify and tip a bucket on people who have a different view to you. The, the result of it is, the result of it is, Order. and there is scientific literature to this extent, the result of it is people simply seek to confirm their own prejudices and bunker down. That's the result of it. That's not my, that's not my theory. That's the theory that has been written in scientific literature again and again. You must have a mutual, respectful debate and emphasise the positive aspects, the positive aspects of people obtaining a vaccination, not just for them, but also for their family and for the broader Australian community. So I do say, Madam Deputy President, that those opposites should reflect, should reflect on the carping negative approach to this topic which they brought into this chamber today, because I don't think it's constructive, and I think you will achieve exactly the opposite of what you're seeking to achieve. And you know what? You know what? One of the big issues is so many Australians have a lack of confidence in so many government institutions across the board, across the board. And the best way, the best way we can encourage those Australians to be vaccinated is to encourage them to have discussions with their own medical professionals, with their doctors, with nurses, with pharmacists, obtain the best advice that's available to them and make the decision that's in the best interests of themselves and of their family. And I think once they have those discussions, once they receive that comfort, then I'm very confident that Australia will have an extremely successful vaccination rollout program, as we've had with respect to a number of vaccines over decades and decades. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, um, Madam Deputy President. I, I cannot believe that we're actually this year still talking about Conspiracy Craig, the um, member for Hughes, Mr Kelly, who's a fringe crank who isn't fit to sit in the other place. He's a danger to public discourse, he's a danger to public health, and he's a danger to public institutions. This is an MP who is so hated by his own Liberal branches uh, and that in the last two elections the leader of the Liberal Party has intervened to save his pre-selection from them. Now, just think about that. Scott Morrison could not be moved to stop the, pre the deselection of the father of the House and former Defence Minister Kevin Andrews, but the Prime Minister saw fit to intervene to stop Kelly's rightful removal by his own branches. By his action, 
his selective action, Mr Morrison, deems cons conspiracy Craig worth, worth more worthy of saving than a 30-year veteran in this place. Mr Hughes and those who excuse him, those who support him, those who lack the integrity to call out his dangerous deceptions and are a constant embarrassment to this parliament. And sadly, Prime Minister Morrison is one of those who continues to excuse Mr Kelly's behaviour. And we saw the same acceptance of Mr Kelly's comments by Senator Birmingham, the leader of the Senate. Let's look at some of the statements from Mr Kelly that uh, he's put out. Uh, he went on a, a state-sponsored trip to Azerbaijan and declared that Australia had a lot to learn from their electoral system, despite the corrupt Azerbaijanian government releasing the election results two hours before the polls closed. That's how much of a sense of democracy Mr Kelly has. Business Insider reported that when Craig Kelly emailed the Therapeutic Goods Authority at the height of the pandemic last year about the efficacy and safety of experimental COVID-19 cures, um, and when told that they didn't work, he instead perpetuated the lie that they did. He cannot accept the fact from health professionals. He cannot accept the truth. He cannot accept the public health advice of his own prime minister. Yet the prime minister gives him enough rope to go out and do whatever he's doing out there. Mr Kelly said that the Australian medical officials, who everyone seems to be hiding behind, had committed crimes against humanity. That is the man that you are supporting in your contributions today. Conspiracy crackpot Craig, the member for Hughes, who ignores all evidence, all credible, widely critiqued and supported evidence. He constantly de de denies the scientific consensus around climate change. He openly spreads lies and mistruths about the attacks on the US Capitol. And he promoted baseless allegations about voter fraud in the wake of the 2020 US presidential election. He's unfit to serve in this place. But he has the Prime Minister's confidence. He has the Prime Minister's cover. He has the Prime Minister's complicity in this conspiracy against Australian people. And he has the, the Prime Minister allowing taxpayers' funds to enable him to broadcast misinformation of the kind that he was reported as saying, you don't need no vaccine. I now hear that in addition to these egregious examples of a failure of leadership by a man who sits in the Australian parliament, he went on a podcast of Pete Evans for 90 minutes. Well, and, and you know what a, what a great conspiracy theorist leader he is. Kicked off Facebook for repeatedly spreading dangerous COVID-19 misinformation. He lost several commercial deals because people in business will do what this government won't do. They're actually calling fakers out. They're calling liars out. They're calling deceivers out. This government is incapable of acknowledging the deception that lies within their own party. Mr Evans is a gleeful proponent of ludicrous conspiracy theories about QAnon, Pizzagate, both of whom which have inspired violent insurrections and armed attacks. That is the danger of following the, the path of this government. Across the globe, we're facing a global pandemic that's claimed over two million lives. Every day that Mr. Mor Mr. Morrison allows Mr. Uh, the member for Hughes to tweet out, to put his messages out on Facebook, impacts 1.8 million Australians. We cannot afford this. Every single member of the parliament, especially the Prime Minister, needs to speak with a uni united voice on the medical evidence to ensure Australians get appropriate treatment. Truth matters. The truth matters, and lies promoted at the highest levels by popular influences, which I'm ashamed to say, Mr. Kelly Thank is, you, have real and material impact on our health. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Australia has been through uh, an incredible 12 months uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we know that lives, sadly, have been lost far too soon, uh, and we know that many jobs have suffered. We're certainly on the road to recovery and recent, uh, recent announcements about the, the surge in, in new jobs, particularly in full-time jobs, is, uh, is really, really good news. Uh, in my home state of Western Australia right now, uh, we're experiencing it. Uh, 
and it's, a, it's an occurrence that uh, in Western Australia we're actually not that familiar with because we've had uh, 10 months of uh, no community transmission and just having spent some time in the regions uh, on holidays with my family. Uh, it's, been a, it's been an experience that uh, we have cherished and we're all West Australians have cherished. But right now, uh, West Australians uh, are doing the right thing. Uh, they're staying home as they've been asked to do. Uh, they're getting tested. Uh, the Premier, as uh, I stand here right now, is, is giving a, an update on uh, where things are at. And thankfully, now, uh, after the second uh, day after the announcement, uh, we still have zero cases uh, of community transmission. And West Australians are going and get tested, which is also very good. But this sort of uh, scenario uh, is with us and continue and uh, may continue to be with us where there will be the, the occasional outbreak because we are of course seeing as many uh, Australians return home as we possibly can uh, so that they can get back with their loved ones so that they can maybe attend funerals and or, or, or deal with uh, family members that are sick that are trying to return or they've, they were unable to leave early in the pandemic and but they've now uh, freed themselves up to be able to come home and we're you know, we're going to continue to see many, many new arrivals. Uh, so we, we continue to run the risk like what we're seeing in Western Australia right now. And the, really the only way that we'll get to a point where we don't have the risk and we don't have the massive interruption uh, to businesses, to livelihoods, uh, is, is to of course see the vaccine rolled out. Now our Therapeutic Goods Administration is arguably one of the best in the world. And Australians can have tremendous amount of confidence in the Therapeutic Goods Administration and knowing that they are, have gone through a very rigorous process, a very careful process to ensure that the vaccines that uh, Australia has uh, acquired and, and now approved is, is going to be rolled out in a safe way. Uh, they have approached this uh, with real determination, but they haven't been hasty either. They've been methodical and they have applied themselves to ensure, through an independent process that's independent of government, to ensure that this vaccine and the, and the various uh, uh, items that we will be uh, dealing with across the country uh, are safe and are able to have the impact that we need. Because like uh, many people across uh, about 80 per cent of our population in Western Australia, we don't want to have to go through lockdowns. I think of the small businesses that are being impacted right now. I think of those cafes that are having to throw out uh, huge amounts of uh, produce, fresh produce that they've purchased in advance believing they were going to be trading over the next few days and they're having to throw that stuff out. I think of the workers that right now are having to stay at home and aren't able to earn a living for their families. Now, the Australian government is there for those people, providing all sorts of support for those people. But clearly the vaccine, the vaccine is going to be the way for us to deal with this. Now, Labor on the other side say that they support this. But by raising such ridiculous notions, ridiculous questions, and highlighting, you know, fringe little issues, is not doing anything, not doing anything, to support uh, Australians and building confidence in the vaccine program, so that it can actually help us deal with it. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. I'm waiting, Senator. Uh, I believe there's still one opposition, but unless you've done some swap. Is it you, Senator Sheldon? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, we're living in an age of misinformation. In the middle of the global health pandemic, when listening to expert health advice has been never so important. We have crowds of people online spewing rumours, conspiracy theories, undermining experts and telling people to ignore health experts. <laughs> and it's no wonder that the government 
has its work cut out. For when it comes to fighting this virus and getting the country back to where it was, it takes a team effort, everybody's effort, and an obligation of that team. It's even more ridiculous that members of their own party are out there spreading misinformation, online undermining their own efforts to fight the virus. Of course, what does the member of Hugh Hughes had to say? They're talking about the Therapeutic Goods Administration, you know, the regulatory agency for the Australian government, as part of the Department of Health. He says, the day of reckoning is coming for the TGA. They've, he said, committed crimes against humanity. They're asleep at the wheel. This is what an elected member of parliament has said about the independent expert led body, the TGA, the body that advises and provides expert advice. How much harder is it getting out of this pandemic going to be when members of the parliament are undermining the TGA and members of this government? The Prime Minister has had no problem in the past intervening on caucus members, but he certainly has a problem with Craig Kelly intervening. No problem cutting off Minister Rustin when she was speaking at a press conference, but when it comes to cutting off the member for Hughes, what does he say? He's not my doctor. Well, you're right, Prime Minister, but he is a member of your government. This is the same sort of lame, blame, shifting response we have come to expect from the Prime Minister. When half the country was on fire and he was nowhere to be seen, he told us he didn't hold a hose. When a member of his government is undermining the vaccine or telling people not to wear masks, he reminds us that the member for Hughes isn't his doctor. You can't just imagine it now. In a few months, when we're in the middle of a vaccine rollout, undermining every step of the way by the crazies of the Liberal Party backbench, the Prime Minister's team falling apart, what will the Prime Minister's response be? I don't give the shots. Apparently, the only time the Prime Minister is responsible for anything is when there's a chance for him to do a press conference or a photo shoot, shoot, uh, shot or do a marketing pitch. What else did the Prime Minister have to say about the member for Hughes? You get it from the official government websites, and that's what I encourage anybody to do. And that's what we're doing, and that's what we're, in we're investing in. Don't go to Facebook to find out about the vaccine. Just go to official government websites. Well, Prime Minister, there are 25 million Australian Facebook users. Craig Kelly says he's reached to over a million people on Facebook. It's increasingly the source of becoming the source of news, including how to deal with the vaccine and the COVID-19 pandemic. Australians should be encouraged to listen to experts, and the job of spreading the advice of experts, both in traditional media and social media, is harder when members of this part, very parliament are spreading misinformation online. Leadership is all about choices, often tough choices. Expect in this case, leadership is about the easy choice, the obvious choice. It would cost the Prime Minister nothing to tell Craig Kelly to deactivate his account. It would do the country a world of good for the foundation this for the, to take on this misinformation and to shut it off completely. It would make the government's life easier. When it comes to fighting the virus or rolling out the vaccine to stop the member for Hughes' Facebook page from spreading conspiracy theories. Instead, the Prime Minister is failing the test of leadership by not making the tough decision, the right decision, the right choice in favour of national health and our communities. The choice to stand beside and even endorse the member for Hughes is endorsing candidates you agree with. That's what the Prime Minister has sent a mixed message to the entire public. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired, and I do remind you to refer to members by their correct title. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister be to take note, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And I believe Senator Lambie's and Senator Waters are splitting time.
Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Madam President. The start of the 2020 financial year was 19 months ago in July. To just, Senator Lambie, sorry. I just remind you to in indicate who you're taking note of. Who? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just take note of my. Take note of uh, Senator Birmingham's uh, answers. To your question? To my question, thank, thank you. you. The start of the 2020 financial year was 19 months ago in July 2019. Our country has changed a lot since then. We had a once in a century health crisis. We've struggled through brutal economic shock waves. We've seen the government shovel incredible amounts of money out the door just to try and keep businesses afloat and industries alive. Sometimes the government has made choices that benefited some businesses more than others, and that's natural. Sometimes in a crisis you've got to make difficult choices to make sure you can get through it. What worries me, though, is through all that time the coalition has been taking donations from businesses that might have benefited from those choices they've made. But we don't hear anything about that money until after the decisions are over. Yesterday we found out that the coalition got $69 million in donations and other receipts since July 2019. Businesses owned by Mr Anthony Pratt gave them more than $1.5 million. Some mystery organisation called the Greenfields Foundation gave at least $450,000. Now, I'll tell you what, that's not a foundation. It is just a political... Is it, just a, it is a political donation that is usually just given in a brown paper bag, and that's all that is. And the ANZ has donated over 100,000. This is the thing. Donors do not give money out, to, out of the goodness of their hearts. They're giving it because they want a chance to bend a minister's ear about what they need to get through the tough times and that what we've had since COVID has hit our shores. They're looking for a chance to make their case, and they're getting levels of access that most small businesses can only dream of. It's no wonder that a person who used to be in charge of policing our political donation laws has come out and said they're one of the worst in the world. It's about time the major parties did the right thing and tidied this thing up for the good of the country. Well, the question is the most is, is it the same the same Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I rise to continue to take note of the answer given to Senator Lambie's questions on, on donations. Uh, yesterday was the one day of the year when we find out who's paying who, and what it tells us is democracy is still for sale. And in fact, the amount of donations that were given in the 2016 election compared to the 2019 election, there's three times as much money that's getting paid to political parties. Uh, the problem is getting worse, not better, and this government is still doing absolutely nothing to fix it. Um, donors aren't just donating for the sake of it because you know, they're altruistic. They're donating to get favours. They're donating to buy outcomes. That is what the Australian public think. That's why perceptions of integrity of government are at all-time lows. Um, we had to wait 19 months to find out about those donations. It should be real-time disclosure. Um, we don't find out about all of them because the disclosure threshold is so high. It's $14,000, and it goes up by a little bit each year. Well, there's one-third of the amounts of money that are being donated to the big political parties that we'll never know where the source comes from, precisely because that threshold for disclosure is so high. We think the threshold for disclosure should be much, much lower, at $1,000, so people know who's paying who, so they can see what outcomes are being bought and, ideally, stop the rot. Um, what we saw this morning was some, finally um, some hope for the broader reforms that the Greens have been pushing for for years. We think big money should not influence politics. We think it should not be buying outcomes. And we like to see uh, bans on donations from certain industries that have a track record of trying to buy outcomes, like the mining industry, the banking sector, uh, the gambling sector. Um, but ideally, we think that donations, no matter where they're coming from, should be tiny. And we want to set a cap on donations of $1,000 per year. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a big corporate, a union, a grouping, an individual. No one should be able to buy influence. Democracy shouldn't be for sale. Um, and we were pleased to see uh, some members of the opposition express some support for the notion of a cap on donations. We know that um, other folk on the crossbench have also pushed for that. And in fact, there's a number of private members' bills before this uh, parliament that would cap uh, donations and would lower that disclosure threshold. I am hopeful that we might see some action. I'll be speaking with uh, other members in this chamber to try to deliver donations reform because the members of the Australian uh, country want their democracy back. They want to know that the folk in here are representing their best interests, not the best interests of whoever just took them out for a lobster lunch. 
or whoever just paid a massive amount of money to buy a government contract. That's the other thing that needs fixing. If you're applying for an environmental approval or a government tender, you should not be allowed to bribe your way into that outcome. You should not be allowed to donate while your application is on foot or six months on either side of it. There are so many ways we could clean up our system. There are so many opportunities for reform to restore confidence in democracy and this political system, and the Greens look forward to continuing that work and finally um, delivering Order. democracy Senator back Waters, to the, the people. The question is the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I uh, uh, wish to withdraw general business notice of motion number 957 in the names of Senator Stirl and Chacone. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. There being no others. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 18th of December 2020 of Major General the Honourable Philip Michael Jeffrey, AC, AO, CVO, MC, Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia from 2003 to 2008. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Governor General Michael Jeff. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I move that the Senate expresses its deep regret at the death on 18 December 2020 of Major General the Honourable Philip Michael Jeffrey, AC, AO, CVO, MC, former Governor General of Australia and Governor of Western Australia, places on record its gratitude and appreciation of his long and distinguished public service and tenders its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Major General the Honourable Michael Jeffrey was a brave soldier, an intellect, a gentleman and, above all else, a great Australian who served his country with honour and distinction. He leaves behind an impressive legacy, a life of selfless service to our nation. Following a distinguished 38-year career in the Australian Defence Force, Major General Jeffrey was appointed the 27th Governor of Western Australia. He then went on to become the 24th Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia. Major General Jeffrey, Philip Michael Jeffrey, was born in Wooloona, Western Australia, in 1937 to Edna and Phil Jeffrey, and was educated at Cannington and East Victoria Park State Schools and Kent Street High School. At age 16, he left Perth to attend the Royal Military College at Dontroon. Serving the Australian Defence Force in many capacities, he rose to the rank of Major General, retiring in 1993. Throughout his long and distinguished military service, Major General Jeffrey undertook operations in Malaya, Borneo, Vietnam and Papua New Guinea, the latter being a country he would continue to hold a special connection with throughout his life. During a tour of Vietnam as an infantry company commander with the 8th Battalion Royal Australian Regiment, he was awarded the Military Cross for Courageous Action and the South Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. In 1976, he assumed command of the SAS Regiment in Perth and was subsequently promoted to Colonel as the first director of the Army's Special Action Forces. From 1981 to 1983, Major General Jeffrey headed Australia's National Counter-Terrorist Coordination Authority. After being selected to attend the Royal College of Defence Studies in London, he was promoted to Major General, progressing to command the Army's 1st Division and later serving as Deputy Chief of the General Staff, undertaking the responsibility for the day-to-day -day running of a 65,000-person army. Upon Major General, General Jeffrey's retirement from the military, he became the Governor of Western Australia in 1993, particularly lending his efforts to youth programs, for which he would later be awarded a Companion of the Order of Australia for services to the Crown and to the community. Reflecting on his own time in the Army Cadets, Major General Jeffrey was a strong believer in youth groups and making sure that young Australians had the best chance to succeed. With education driving his admiration for the teaching profession, he said, and I quote, what I have found universally is that it is the educational experience that most influences the quality of lives, offers choice, fosters independence and promotes potential. Teachers share the privilege of being able to influence and to inspire. I want teaching to be seen and respected as the noble profession, 
and there are ways in which we can all work together to make that happen. He committed himself as governor to promoting those ideals. Following his retirement as governor of Western Australia in 2000, he established in Perth a not-for-profit research institute, Future Directions International, whose object is to conduct comprehensive research of important medium to long-term issues facing Australia. It was an embodiment of his lifelong commitment to the betterment of our nation. On 11 August 2003, Major General Geoffrey was sworn in as the 24th Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia. In doing so, he became the first Australian-born Governor-General to have had a full-time military career. Known during his time as Governor of Western Australia to have visited even the tiniest of outback settlements, former Prime Minister John Howard said in the appointment of Major General Geoffrey that he, and I quote, will bring to the post not only a wealth of experience but also a great ease of manner in dealing with Australians from every part of the community. Then opposition leader Simon Crean, on the appointment of Major General Geoffrey, described him as a man who has served his country in peace and war with distinction and has been recognised with one of his, this country's highest decorations for bravery in battle. Major General Geoffrey saw his time as Governor General as having three distinct functions, constitutional, ceremonial and community, each wielding importance which he fulfilled with distinction. Rather than actively seeking the limelight during his time as our Governor-General, Major General Geoffrey focused on communities and was true to his word upon his appointment that, I want to give my total commitment to the Australian people, that I will endeavour to be a Governor-General of the people and for the people. As Governor-General, he gave an estimated 850 speeches, attended some 1,100 events throughout Australia, hosted over 750 official functions, was patron to around 180 not-for-profit organisations, often visiting them at least once a year, and held Christmas parties for nearly 4,000 special needs children and their carers. Major General Geoffrey believed in nurturing Australia's relationships, developing personal dialogues and friendships across the globe, from visiting King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia to hosting then US President George W. Bush. In 2005, upon attending the 30th anniversary of Papua New Guinea's independence, he was awarded the Honorary Grand Champions of the Order of Lagohu for fostering close relations between Papua New Guinea and Australia. Thousands lined the streets of Wewak to, to greet Major General Geoffrey, where he had served as a battalion commander. He impressed locals by conversing in pidgin, and many of those old soldiers in PNG walked days from their villages to say hello again. In an apt end to his time as Governor-General, Papuan Sergeant Major Michael Pisa, who served under Major General Geoffrey more than 40 years earlier, piped his farewell from office. In retirement, Major General Geoffrey was appointed the first national advocate for soil health by the Gillard government in 2012. In this role, he strove to provide leadership and national strategic direction to the good work being done by soil scientists and landscape managers across Australia. He worked tirelessly from Parliament House to the paddocks of the outback to raise public awareness of the critical role soil plays in underpinning sustainable productivity and helping to meet global challenges, including food, water security and climate change. Highly influential in the role, his impact brought change to attitudes regarding sustainable practices to improve soil health, with farmers more willing to talk about regenerative agriculture and ministers more mindful of implementing policies that support healthy landscapes. I personally remember the thoughtful, considered and diligent way in which Major General Geoffrey approached his role as National Advocate for Soil Health, including in one-on-one -on -one meetings with me and, no doubt, with many other members, senators and ministers. His work ethic was unwavering. Indeed, Major General Geoffrey remained in this role until shortly before his passing. Throughout his extraordinary life, Major General Geoffrey was supported by his wife of 35 years, Marlena. Extraordinary in her own right, Marlena was appointed as Dame of Grace in the Order of St John and awarded the accolade Citizen of Western Australia for her work with so many charities. Admired for her compassion, Marlena was also patron to more than 50 charities during Major General Geoffrey's time as Governor-General. 
Major General Jeffrey often expressed his deep appreciation and affection for Marlena, declaring that he would never have been able to make the types of contributions he did without her support and contribution. A great man with a distinguished career, he remained humble, stating during his time as Governor General, if people can look back at our tomb in office and say, the Jeffreys did a good job, then that will be good enough for me. By every measure, Major General the Honourable Michael Jeffrey was truly one of Australia's finest. To Major General Jeffrey's wife, Marlena, their three sons, daughter and grandchildren, on behalf of the Australian Government and the Australian Senate, I offer our sincerest condolences. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And I rise on behalf of the opposition to express our condolences following the passing of follower, former Governor General, Major General, the Hon. Michael Jeffrey, ACCVOMC, at the age of 83. And I begin by conveying the Labor Party's sincere condolences to his wife Marlena, to all of his family and his friends. Michael Jeffrey gave a lifetime of service to Australia. Beginning in the Army as a teenager, he went off on to serve amongst its highest ranks and became a celebrated and respected leader. And the manner in which he carried out this service saw him retained for even higher office, first as the Governor of Western Australia and then, of course, as Governor General of Australia. And he would also use his profile to advance conservation and improve soil health later in life. Michael Jeffrey started life in December 1937 in Willoona, a small town in the Midwest region of Western Australia, situated in the middle of the state, on the, it, it is on the edge of the Western Desert at the gateway to the Canning Stock Route. From these beginnings, these very Australian beginnings, came one of the mo nation's most significant military leaders and public servants. After growing up in the suburbs of Perth during his, the period of his school education, he left school at the age of 16 to attend the Royal Military College, Dun Duntroon and he had an extensive military career from 1958 to 1993 and included in that many notable overseas service and command postings. These included operational, uh, serving operationally in the theatres of Malaya, Borneo, Papua New Guinea and Vietnam. And in Vietnam, his service earned him the military cross. In Papua New Guinea, as my colleague, Senator Birmingham has indicated, uh, Major General Jeffries commanded the 1st Battalion, the Pacific Island Regiment, and in 2005, the 30th anniversary of independence, he was recognised with Papua New Guinea's highest honour, being made an inaugural recipient of the honour of Grand Camp Companion of the Order of Lagohu, in which, into which he was invested in 2007. He, he was also pivotal in the sustainment of the Special Air Service Regiment. Major General uh, Jeffrey has re received uh, many honours, the first uh, in 1981 when he became a member of the Order of Australia for service to the Army, 1988 uh, he was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia, he was appointed a companion in, 2000, uh, in 1996 uh, for services as Governor and to the community and in 2000 he was appointed a commander of the Royal Victorian Order which recognises distinguished personal service to the monarch. Michael Jeffrey's mil military career came to an end in 1993 and shortly thereafter he was appointed to the office of Governor of Western Australia. He saw as a central component of this role connecting with people across the state. As Governor, with Mrs Jeffrey, he, he was patron of 170 organisations and they relished the opportunity to be engaged with the community through these roles. Uh, to the extent they reflected Michael Jeffrey's own interests, many of them had an emphasis on developing youth. Major General Jeffrey was grateful for the way in which this vice regal role enabled him to travel all over the states, observing what he called the totality of life from sheep stations to mines to oil rigs to schools and to remote Aboriginal communities. After retiring as Governor in 2000, Michael Jeffrey returned to make his home in Canberra, making the trip from the west to the east coast on the Indian Pacific. But not too long after this, he found himself moving to another and more significant address in the national capital, and in August 2003 he was sworn in as the 24th Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia. He did take office at a time where the then Howard government and in fact the nation needed the role to be filled with someone or by someone who 
could restore its integrity. It was a challenging time to take on the viceregal position. And he acknowledged this, stating that amidst the difficult circumstances in which the appointment took place, he would give his total commitment to the Australian people that he would seek to carry out the role with dignity and dedication. And he did so. Certainly, he did come to the office with a sound reputation for ethical conduct, a reputation which continued undiminished. In office, Michael Jeffries sought to engage directly with Australians, directly with those undertaking worthwhile activities in their communities, continuing very much in the manner with which he had approached the role in Western Australia, as Senator Birmingham said, of the people and for the people. He once said, and I quote, the big thing you can do, and there's not enough of it, is looking people in the eye and say thanks. Saying thanks for making a contribution through being a Meals on Wheels person or a volunteer ambulance driver or a violinist in a youth orchestra. Mindful that it would not be appropriate to stray too closely uh, to into policy matters that were more appropriately the domain of the government of the day, he never th nonetheless sought to use some of his many speeches a year to lend profile to important national and community issues. These range from mental health, the environment, volunteering, the importance of mentoring, to urban planning, local sport and community involvement. This accompanied his acquittal of more formal constitutional duties and responsibilities, such as presiding over member, mem, uh, meetings of the EXCO Federal Executive Council. He had a reputation for interrogating the business thoroughly, and by the end of 2007, the Federal Executive Council had considered some 2,540 agenda items on his watch. With Mrs Jeffrey, he also represented Australia overseas on multiple occasions. My first personal interaction uh, came with uh, Michael Jeffrey came on the 3rd of December 2007, which is a day I shall never forget, because that was the day in which the Governor-General of Australia swore in the first Rudd Labor Ministry, and I became the Minister for Climate Change and Water. And the signed certificate hangs in my office in Adelaide, and the signed book plate is in the Bible I keep in my office here in Parliament House. In an interview on his retirement, Michael Jeffrey told a story about that day, when the swearing in of the ministry coincided with a tour of the grounds of Government House by a large group of school children. And he recalled that whilst he was inside discussing major issues of state, or certainly engaging in major issues of state, the kids were all waving from outside. So naturally, led by the new Prime Minister and the Governor-General, we all got up and waved back. And he thought of this as being a profoundly Australian thing to do. Originally expected to serve three to four years, Michael Jeffrey completed his term after a two-year extension in August 2008. After leaving Viceregal Office, Michael Jeffrey continued a role to which he had originally been appointed by the Gillard government in 2012 as Australia's first national advocate for soil health. This was an apt role for the boy who grew up in the red earth of the Western Australian outback. And he consulted in that role with thousands of farmers, indigenous land managers, policy makers, students and interest groups across Australia to bring together the Restore the Soil, Prosper the Nation report in 2018. He advocated for our soil, water and vegetation to be declared strategic national assets. And he saw that improving soil health had the potential to have a significant positive impact on our carbon emissions. His passion for restoring Australia's soil, for regenerative farming, farming and exporting Australian knowledge about managing soils in difficult climate lasted until his final months when he relinquished the role. The legacy of his work remains. Retirement from high public office also gave Michael Jeffrey the opportunity to share more time with his children and grandchildren and engage in his hobbies and recreational pursuits, including golf. Michael Jeffrey passed away in December 2020. The first full-time career Australian soldier appointed to the office of Governor-General, he set a standard for diligence and integrity by which those who follow are measured. He was, of course, succeeded in office first by Quentin Bryce, then by Peter Gross, Cosgrove and David Hurley. Reflecting on his predecessor, General Hurley said, As a nation, we give thanks for Michael's extraordinary lifetime of service. He was, by every measure, a great Australian. And so, too, do we in the Senate today pay tribute and give thanks for Michael Jeffrey's service to Australia, to his nation. We express our condolences following his passing, and the opposition again expresses our sympathy 
to his family and friends. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I offer my condolences to the family and friends of Major General Michael Jeffrey. As others have noted, Major General Jeffrey has had a distinguished career in defence uh, before serving as Governor of Western Australia and then Governor General of Australia. These are important roles, and we thank him for the care and the dignity that he brought to them. But I want to speak very briefly of his long standing passion for environmental stewardship. He was a committed advocate for land care, for regenerative agriculture and for sustainable vegetation management. He spoke about the value of soil carbon long before it became a government buzzword. He had long discussed the need for agricultural practices to build resilience and adapt to a changing climate. I acknowledge his tenacity and the work that he did as national soil advocate to secure the national soils strategy. I hope that the government will respect his legacy. Major General uh, Jeffrey was also someone who understood the importance of time with family in nature and away from the cut and thrust of political life. I was pleased to discover that when asked about his favourite holiday destination, he nominated Stradbroke Island uh, or Manjirabar. That is something that we share. He said of the time spent with his wife and children on Stradie, escaping the sometimes punish punishing schedule of events at Government House, and I quote, just the sight of the white sand and the sparkling blue water lifts the spirits. It is nice, therefore, to have some time to ourselves, and that is one of the major attractions to holidaying at Stradbroke. Days just meander by and we feel part of the local community. We might end the day watching a beautiful sunset, followed by a game of Scrabble. For us, that is bliss, and we have kept coming back uh, over many years. I would encourage as many people as they can to come and uh, also enjoy Minjerabar or Stradbroke Island in my home state of Queensland. I'm sure that the memories of those times together are a comfort to Major General Jeffrey's family. Our thanks to Major General Jeffrey for his years of dedication to governance, environmental protection and sustaining the planet for future generations. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And as a Senator for Western Australia and also as a Minister for Defence, I rise today to pay tribute to the life of an extraordinary Australian, an extraordinary Western Australian who served our nation with such great distinction and honour in all aspects of his life. Former Governor-General, Major General the Honourable Michael Jeffrey, AO, AC, CVO, MC. General Jeffrey was born to humble beginnings in a small outback town of Wooloona in my own home state in Western Australia. And he described his upbringing as never luxurious but happy. Later, he would go on to say that the earliest years are the most important in framing a person's life. This is no truer than of Michael Jeffrey himself. His mother, Edna, was a nurse, and his father, Phil, was a stockman and a miner who served during World War II. Their shared commitment to their family, their community and their nation shaped everything young Michael would go on to do in his lifetime. At 16, he entered the Royal Military College Duntroon, marking the start of a long and a very distinguished career of military and civilian service. Early on, General Jeffrey served in a number of units, including in the Special Air Services Regiment. In 1962, he posted to Malaya, serving with the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the Royal Australian Regiment, followed by a secondment in Borneo with the British SAS. From 1966 to 1969, General Jeffrey served in Papua New Guinea with 1st Battalion, the Pacific Island Regiment. And while there, he married his wife, Marlena, who he often and very fondly referred to as his teammate. After PNG, General Jeffrey deployed to Vietnam with the 8th Battalion. During this tour, he was awarded the Military Cross and the South Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. In 1976, he returned home to Perth to assume command of the SASR. He was then promoted to Colonel and became the first Director of Army Special Action Forces. And for his service in this role, he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia. He also headed Australia's National Counter-Terrorism Coordination Authority, after which he commanded the 1st Mechanised and Airborne Brigade in Holdsworthy in Sydney. In 1986, he was promoted to Major General, 
and commanded the 1st Division. And on having a look at his service records, I'm sure back then if we'd had a corps or army group, he would certainly have gone on to command those two. In 1988, he was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia for his services to the Army. And in 1989, he served as the Assistant Chief of the General Staff Logistics. And as a logistician myself, I know that all wise Army commanders understand the importance of logistics. In January 1990, General Jeffrey became Deputy Chief of the General Staff, and only a year later, he was appointed Assistant Chief of the General Staff for Materiel, and he was responsible for managing 600 Army acquisition and construction projects worth then over $3 billion. And it was not long after this final Army appointment, Major General Michael Jeffrey retired from full-time service, and he commenced the next chapter of his life of leadership and service to our nation. In 1993, he became the 28th Governor of Western Australia. In his seven years in the role, his humility, his energy, his passion for causes and his dedication to his home state shone through. And so it was no surprise when, in 2003, Prime Minister John Howard asked him to serve his nation yet again, this time as Australia's 24th Governor-General. During his Governor-Generalship, Michael Jeffrey continued his own, uh, with his own stamp of leadership. He did that with integrity, with discipline, with compassion and with strength of character to his core. General Jeffrey was a devoted father, husband and grandfather, and he cherished the support of his family throughout his life of service. I extend my deepest sympathies to Marlena and his family for their great loss to our nation. Their loss is certainly all of our loss. Thank you. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I thank senators. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. The clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one in the name of Senator Griff from today to 16 February. General business notice, notice of motion number 868 standing in the name of Senator Waters from 3 February to 15 March. General Business Notice of Motion number 956, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, from today to 3 February. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, are there any other notifications or postponements? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for personal reasons to Senator Pratt and McCarthy for Tuesday the 2nd of February till Thursday the 4th of February and for Senator Bellick for Tuesday the 2nd of February till Thursday the 25th of February. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary no. The ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Bragg and Canavan for today for personal reasons. Is, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. There are not any other matters. I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business. I shall. And I'll just go through them because there are only a handful today in the order in which they're on the paper. And I'll commence with Senator Billick, number 926. Senator Urquhart, are you moving the 926 on behalf of Senator Billick? Um, I ask the general business notice of motion number 926 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. On the 14th of December last year, 2020, the government announced that we uh, were delivering the most important and far-reaching reform of this sector for decades, 
cutting unnecessary red tape through harmonising laws across all states and territories. The government values the contribution of charities and has delivered unprecedented support to the sector during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we were proud to work with uh, this sector productively, with states and territories also, on the harmonisation of fundraising regulation. Question is the motion num that motion number 926 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Noes have it. Um, I'll put it again. I'm going on my notes, but I'm happy to take advice from the chamber. Um, the question is motion number 926 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Yeah. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts, number 944. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 944 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Coalition Government is a strong advocate for Australia's abundant natural resources and critical mineral sectors and the regional communities and jobs that it supports. That's why we established the Underwriting New Generation Investments Program to increase firms' generation capacity with new coal, gas and hydro projects and funded a feasibility study into high-efficiency, low-emissions coal-fired power station in Collinsville. Our policy is to support a new gas-fired generator in the Hunter Valley because it will provide the flexible generation we need now to secure our electricity grid. A new gas generator can be approved by the state government and operational more quickly, creating jobs and putting downward pressure on prices as soon as possible. We agree with the ACCC recommendation that the federal government underwrite new energy generation projects that will help deliver affordable, reliable power for Australian consumers. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr President. The Hunter Valley needs a new coal-fired station like a hole in the head. I have spent a lot of time in the Hunter Valley, and the people there know that coal has no future. They know how damaging coal is for the climate. They know how harmful coal dust is for them, their families, and their children. They know that there is no future in coal, that it is a collapsing industry. The irrational exuberance of Pauline Hansen's One Nation and the coalition to keep pushing coal is criminal. People in the Hunter actually want a plan to build a clean, healthy, sustainable, jobs-rich future for their communities. They know that dirty coal and gas is not going to give it that future. We have an opportunity to remake society where no one is left behind and transition away from coal. The Hunter needs to be free of giant fossil fuel corporations and their interests, and they don't have to be and they shouldn't be burdened by another Order. coal power Senator station. Faruqi, time has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Roberts teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. Technology works. The result of the division is ayes 2, noes 45. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I ask everyone to remain in the chamber. We only have several divisions left, and I'll be ringing the bells for one minute only. Well, I'll do, the next one I'll do for four, but after that I'll do for one. Sorry, I appreciate it. But I'll, um, the question now is matter 953 in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson Young. House at General Business Notice of Motion number 953 uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Qu Senator Dunningham. Agreed to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a matter for the South Australian Government, and the Senate should not attempt to influence decisions regarding a state matter. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. 
Labor opposes this motion because it's not helpful for the Senate to set itself up as the arbiter of individual projects motion by motion under the national environmental law. Why, we need a strong national policy framework to protect koalas, and that's why Labor moved a motion in the House which called for the Morrison government to one, prevent further habitat loss through yet to commence development in areas in which the koala is listed as vulnerable, pending the completion of the formal assessment yeah. listing. The making of a threatened species Order, recovering Henson plan Young. and the making of a new national koala conservation strategy. The Morrison government has failed to deliver any meaningful protections for our national icons like the koala, and it's an absolute disgrace. I did call on 953, um, so we're dealing with matter 953. The question is now that matter 9. Sorry, Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation will not support the motion. Senator Hanson Young's motion proposes to kill off jobs in South Australia. South Australia is a low opportunity economy because the Greens have stopped billions of dollars of investment in ecotourism, agriculture and mining. The Greens' support for wind farms has endangered species of large birds drawn into the turbine blades and their land management policies directly contributed to the catastrophic loss of millions of native animals in the Kangaroo Island fire. Millions. The Greens are no friend to Australian animals, no friend to the poor who need jobs and no friend to mum and dad farmer who produce food for us to eat. It will be a matter for the Government of South Australia to assess the quarry expansion proposal. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. I will ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 953 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 38. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, please remain in the chamber for the final two matters. Senator Rice, number 959. I'll give you a moment to return to your seat. Senator Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 959 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. I move the motion. Senator Roberts. Can I seek leave to split the motion, please, into A and B separately? Yep. Vote you separately? don't need leave, and I will do that, Senator Roberts, if you are voting differently on those two sections. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. The Australian government has a proud track record of investing in community sport projects across Australia, including providing over $100 million for the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program, from which 684 projects have been funded. 2050 applications were submitted, requesting funds of $396 million, reflecting the high demand for this program. Sports Australia and the government agreed with the four recommendations from the ANAO's review of the, award, uh, of the awarding of the program funding. Sports Australia has implemented the three recommendations directly relating to them, and the Department of Finance is implementing the, uh, one recommendation further. As Senator Rice is the deputy chair of this inquiry into this matter, it's unacceptable to be moving this motion before the inquiry has even finished, and it demonstrates that this motion is all about politics. Question is that mo part A, clause A of motion number 959, clause A of motion number 959 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is clause A of motion 959 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes and Senator Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 29. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that clause 2 or clause B of motion 959 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that clause B, motion number 959, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes, and Senator Smith, tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, there is one matter remaining. Senator Seward, your mo motion number 960. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 960 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. Uh, seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The government has extended uh, payment of the coronavirus supplement for a further three months from the 1st of January 2021 at a cost of $3.2 billion to provide additional temporary support to Australians impacted by the pandemic. The extension of the coronavirus supplement and a range of enhanced eligibility criteria within the social services system complements the $251 billion in direct economic support already committed by the government. Uh, the government's priority is to get Australians back to work. Senator Roberts. To split the motion uh, into one part A, B, C, D yep. and the second part E. Okay. I will do so. The question is that motion that paragraphs A, B, C and D of motion 960 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. The ayes have it. But division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
We get a truck that comes up the drive. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We need science-based targets to be guiding our climate policies in this nation. Delay is the new denial. Now, the Climate Targets Panel uh, report that I referred to that was released last week says that to have a chance of staying within two degrees of warming, the government's 2030 targets need to be doubled. We need to halve the pollution that we aspired uh, to uh, have by 2030 if we are to have a chance at keeping within two degrees. That report also clarifies that if we want to have a chance at keeping within one and a half degrees, which might actually save what's left of global coral reefs, um, it might lessen the burden um, on our farmers and our agricultural sectors, um, it might lessen the severity of the natural disasters that we've all been facing. It's in fact what we should be aspiring to as a nation. But if we want to stay within one and a half degrees, then in fact we need to reduce our pollution by 75 per cent by 2030. So this report saying the government needs to double its targets to even have a chance at two degrees, but actually we need far more uh, strong action on the climate crisis if we want to have a chance of saving the planet as we know it. So the discussion about 2050 is over. The question is, what's the government going to do about their 2030 targets, and when on earth are we going to see a 2030 target from this flaccid opposition? They continue to bat away the question, it is not good enough. We need science-based targets, and we need all parties to be guided by them. It should not be a question of politics. This should simply be us taking the advice from the experts. We have a small window. Now, the Biden uh, president's climate summit is coming up in April. Now, we might not even get invited. Um, we didn't get much of a Guernsey last time, did we? And this Prime Minister has absolutely no credibility on the global stage on climate, so we might not even be invited to President Biden's April climate summit. But if we are, what's the Prime Minister going to do? Is he actually going uh, to comply with what the science says? Is he going to increase that 2030 target? It is untenable for the government to continue to insist that these weak, pathetic targets that we're not even on track to meet are adequate. Um, and it's untenable for the opposition to continue to ignore the need for 2030 targets and to promise to tell us all at some point who knows when. Um, that independent climate targets panel did that work last week. The Climate Change Authority should be doing that week. But they've updated those targets based on um, our global carbon budget. Net zero by 2050 isn't even what the science says anymore. So that's a bit of a problem for the Prime Minister and for the Labor Party. The latest data says that, in fact, we need to have net zero by 2045, not 2050. Um, and in fact, for one and a half degrees, we need to be net zero by 2035. The other very troubling finding from that report was that since this mob took government in 2013, that we've used 40 per cent of our two-degree budget and 55 per cent of our one-and-a-half-degree budget. We cannot muck around any longer. We may or may not get an invite to that Biden climate summit, but the world is watching what we do. The Prime Minister sees risks, the Greens see opportunities, and we see consequences for continuing to ignore this problem. The Liberals and Nationals will send Australian farmers bankrupt as the new climate dries lands out along the coast and floods it in unbearable heat in the north. The only way we can avoid that future is with strong, science-based 2030 targets. We invite the Labor Party to say something about that and the government to double their ambition in that regard. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, here we go again. The Greens fixated on lots of talk and no action when it comes to the provision of clean energy and the lowering of emissions. The topic of alternative energy through new technology is one that is close to my heart, having dedicated much of my time to the wonderful Hunter region, where traditional mining takes place alongside an area booming with developing new energy sources. On one recent visit, I was able to break ground at the site of a new lithium-ion battery factory, where the technology team of Energy Renaissance is supported by the CSIRO. The Commonwealth Government's first Low Emissions Technology Statement has identified energy storage as a priority technology for Australia to support emission reductions and jobs growth. 
Affordable and reliable batteries are already becoming a critical element of renewable electricity supply, clean transport and for use in a range of defence applications. Australia is a world leader in the implementation of batteries on the grid, but we're using foreign companies to supply our batteries, making this a future energy security issue. An Australian supply reduces the risk in shipping, transportation and delivery and provides the Australian government and its key agencies, such as Defence, with a domestic option. China accounts for 62 per cent of the global lithium-ion battery industry. Quite simply, if we want more electric cars and buses and to reduce our emission levels, we're going to need more batteries. Australia is ideally placed to be at the forefront of development and manufacture of these in-demand products. The early establishment of a domestic battery manufacturing industry will value add to critical minerals processed in Australia. According to the future batteries industry, there is currently no commercial production of battery grade materials and chemicals in Australia. However, the wonderful new energy renaissance site at Tomago will be the first in Australia with plans to export much of its batteries to Asian markets. On the same day as I broke ground at the energy renaissance site, I visited the Bloomfield coal mine in East Maitland, where 600 Australian workers are employed, producing, much, uh, producing some of the highest quality coal in the world. And we won't turn our back on any industry that supports the energy of Australians. And kudos to the Australian hunter-based company Quarry Mining that's converting its big mining trucks to electric power. There are other local Hunter Valley and Newcastle businesses who are getting on with the innovation and commercialisation that will drive our economic growth and provide renewable sources of power. And these are the sorts of businesses that the Morrison government is backing. The Hunter region is a hotbed of energy innovation. MGA Thermal is a local company using renewable power to heat aluminium bricks during the day and generate steam from them overnight. And the Morrison government has promised to build a gas plant powered specifically to ensure that Hunter businesses and consumers don't suffer the devastating consequences of energy shortages or blackouts. We remain committed to any technology that promises energy reliability and affordable comfort for all Australians. I'm supporting the Hunter in its bid to win the tender to be the first hydrogen hub funded by the Commonwealth. I'm working with local industries, renewable providers and other key institutions to put forward a case to make the Hunter a home for hydrogen development. With hydrogen, we can capitalise on the growing international market for green steel and green aluminium, using the abundance of intermittent renewable energy to generate hydrogen to power these industries. There is no better place than the new hotbed of innovation for such a venture. The fact that it would create more jobs and bring investment to the region is another bonus for Australia. Our government is investing $570 million in hydrogen. Hydrogen can be stored and transported, and it can be 100 per cent cleaner. It's a wonderful source of energy for manufacturing and has the potential to further lower our energy emissions. We will continue to support this sector, which also has the potential to see Australia export hydrogen to other countries. New energy technologies will expand production and increase productivity. Madam Acting Deputy President, we're not resting on our laurels when it comes to alternative energy sources, and we will not rest until Australians and my great friends in the Hunter Valley have guaranteed cheap and secure sources of energy. And it will be done with consideration for Australian businesses and consumers. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has promised that we won't tax our way to zero emissions. We won't put that burden on any Australian especially our regional Australians. Getting to net zero is all about technology, and our emissions fell by 3 per cent in the year to June 2020, the lowest level since 1998. That's 17 per cent below 2005 levels, and that's pretty impressive when you consider it. Our Energy Minister, Angus Taylor, has committed to investing $1.9 billion for the development of clean energy. 
And when it comes to lowering emissions, we have an enviable record that's proving successful and is focused on technology, not taxes. We have a clear plan. We're on track to meet our 2030 target. Labor doesn't even have a 2030 target. And our 2030 target is more ambitious than Norway, Canada, Germany, France and New Zealand. And we want to get to zero emissions as soon as is possible. And we're focused on the how and the breakthroughs in technology that will be needed to reach net zero emissions. Over the past two years, our position against our 2030 target has improved by 639 million tonnes. That's the equivalent of taking all of Australia's 14.7 million cars off the road, just wait for it, for 15 years. In 2020, a record seven gigawatts of new renewable capacity was installed in Australia. That's more renewables in one year under the Morrison government than under the whole previous Labor government term. Australia now has the highest amount of solar PV capacity installed per person in the world. And we have the most wind and solar per person of any country outside of Europe. We're adopting renewables in Australia at 10 times the global average, four times higher than China, Japan, the US and Europe. And we're doing it without sacrificing jobs and industries in regional Australia for no emissions benefit. Instead, the Morrison government is focused on the how and on the breakthroughs in technology that will be needed to make net zero emissions possible. Investing and supporting renewable technologies will support 130,000 130, new jobs by 2030 and maintain Australia's position as a world-leading exporter of food, fibre, minerals and energy. In contrast, Labor won't talk about how they would lower emissions because they have no plan to achieve net zero, no plans, not a single policy. They continue to be divided and confused on energy matters which impact everyday Australians. Our government is committed to ensuring a reliable energy supply. And as our Prime Minister announced yesterday, agreements are in place to accelerate major transmission projects in New South Wales and Tasmania, with Victoria and South Australia to follow this year. And we're building Snowy Hydro too. We're rolling out a $200 million program to build new diesel storage facilities. Minister Karen Andrews is investing $1.5 billion in a manufacturing strategy prioritising critical minerals processing, recycling and clean energy. This is a government committed to technology-driven sources of energy. We need practical and appropriate measures to reduce emissions in a way that supports economic growth. Labor and their Green partners have never committed so much money or support to groundbreaking technology that will enhance our energy development and secure our energy supply. But we are getting on with the job of lowering emissions and creating viable new renewable energy industries that will support every Australian. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Lyons. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise in support of this motion today, and right now, as I speak, an out-of-control bushfire is threatening the outer suburbs of the Perth metropolitan area, and horrifically it's been reported that 30 homes have been destroyed. Thankfully, uh, no loss of life has been reported, but the bushfire is raging out of control. We know at Tilden Park in Gijiganup, 80 per cent of homes have been lost. And of course, my absolute uh, sympathy goes to those homeowners uh, and their family and friends who've been affected so far. But we know the bushfire right now is far from out. And indeed, um, just earlier speaking to colleagues, we know it has jumped the Great Eastern Highway. We know in the Perth metropolitan area, you only have to look at the bomb site. Um, there is a smoke haze right across the Perth metropolitan area. We've seen um, reports of um, leaves on fire being reported at Wanneroo. That is a long way, for those that don't know Western Australia and the Perth metro area, from the centre of the fire. 
As far as uh, Fremantle and Rottnest, we're having smoke haze reported. This is a devastating event happening right now in Perth um, and shows no sign of slowing down. What's also happened across Western Australia, and particularly Perth, over the last couple of weeks, we've had extraordinarily high temperatures. In Perth now, when it's 35, we think it's a pretty cool day. We've become so accustomed to much higher temperatures. In addition to that, throughout the summer, we've experienced very strong easterly winds, much stronger than we would normally experience. So all of these issues are telling us that our climate is changing. The easterly winds are a direct contributor right now to those out of control suburbs, out of control fires in the Perth metropolitan area. Uh, and Perth is a very sprawling city, and suburbs of Ellenbrook, Dayton, areas uh, in the federal seat of Pearce have been evacuated. This is not something that's happening out on the border. This is something that is happening in the Perth metropolitan region right now. Uh, and no doubt when this fire uh, has been put out, people will start talking once again about its connection to climate change. Right now, 12 months ago, we had the devastating fires in the eastern states uh, and in South Australia, where tragically Many people lost their lives, homes and businesses were destroyed, uh, livestock and people are still recovering. We still have people living in tents. And leading up to that, we had uh, Greg Mullins and 22 other former fire chiefs who were begging, begging the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, to meet with them. They hadn't just suddenly started to talk about the risk of uh, lack of inaction on climate change linking it to bushfires, they'd been trying to meet with him, and they were mocked by the Prime Minister, uh, they were mocked by uh, government members. And what have we heard today? Oh, this is all about Liberal and Labor. It's not people. It's about climate change. It's real. But we know still those backbench, climate-denying uh, members of the Morrison government who they will not hold to account are still the people controlling the Morrison government. Because you'd have to ask yourself, um, after seven years and 22 energy policy attempts, the Morrison government has no national energy policy, and they continue an anti-renewables agenda, and they're refusing to capitalise on the huge benefits that clean energy can bring to Australian households and businesses. And we've heard about, oh, we don't want to lose jobs. Never once have we heard them talk about the job creation that would happen from investing in uh, renewables, investing in a proper clean energy policy. And yesterday we heard some weasel words from the Prime Minister at the National Press Club, because the election of um, Joe Biden in the US, suddenly his right-wing uh, cloth of um, being able to hide behind with Trump has gone. So now that stark reality is that we have someone in the US uh, who is who's going to lead on uh, climate change, and that I think is the only reason we saw a little bit of a shift from Mr. Morrison. But no plans, not one single idea about uh, job creation, about clean energy. Just his throwaway line that. Um, he hoped to uh, get there with a reduction um, by 2050, um, hoped to get there earlier. Hope. Well, it needs more than hope, Mr Morrison. It actually needs a government that is committed to the science of climate change, that holds its backbenchers to account when they put up ridiculous notions, who accepts that climate change is real, who accepts that what's happening right now in Perth metropolitan area is real and there's a link to, to climate change. How many more reports do we have to have on the, the globe is heating up? Australia experienced its fourth hottest year on record last year. 
Perth is experiencing right now, today, yesterday, tomorrow, unprecedented um, high temperatures and really strong easterly winds. This is affecting people and their jobs. If the Morrison government is serious about protecting jobs, start action on climate change. I don't know how many jobs losing 30 homes in WA represents. If you look at the flow-on effect of that, of men and women and children, uh, people, young people lost their jobs. Get real. Climate change is real. Stop denying the facts. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I need to say clearly that the climate change agenda seeks to mislead well-meaning Australians with pseudoscience to introduce and hide an economic and social agenda that Australians would otherwise reject. Senator Rice's motion does mischief. Australia does not have a carbon budget. The Senate has not voted for a carbon budget. The coalition's supposed climate action plan, CAP, that underpins government policy, does not include a carbon budget. Our international agreements do not include a carbon budget. The only place one can find a climate budget is in the Greens' own little parallel universe, where the aspiring elites in the Greens are in control of an economy that is not only green but rancid. The devastation that will be caused to our economy by the measures the Greens propose to limit carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will destroy our economy, destroy jobs and steal opportunity from our children. The insult to real scientists is that Senator Rice calls climate change a science-based agenda. No, it's not. Definitely not. The argument in favour of a looming climate disaster is based on unvalidated compu computer models, nothing else. The same models that have failed repeatedly and miserably to predict temperature movement. The largest single driver of climate is the sun, which has moved into a solar minimum that is tracking the Dalton minimum when the, when the Thames froze over and crops around the world failed. In fact, crops are failing now. Northern China is experiencing widespread hunger as exceptional cold destroyed the winter cereal crop. Australia, on the other hand, has moved from a dry cycle to a wet cycle. This is not climate change. It's a natural cycle. I have challenged the Greens on many occasions to prove their position with empirical scientific evidence, data, and they have been unable to, repeatedly unable. Indeed, today is day number 502 of my challenge in the Senate to the Greens to simply provide the scientific evidence for their claims and for their alarm and to debate me on the science. Look at them all, looking at their phones, they won't look at me. I challenged the current Greens Senate leader ten and, three ten and a quarter years ago. Nothing. Ten and a quarter years, more than a decade. Nothing. I noticed that, that world-renowned scientist Tony Heller, who relies on solid data, has today challenged the Greens to a debate on social media. That's not going to happen either. And now we see the Nats. Well, that's another joke. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Greens have no carbon budget and they have no idea. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, once again, it's clear that the Greens and the Labor Party are not interested in the facts facing Australia and our planet. And as we've just heard from Senator Lyons' contribution, who did not mention one policy measure we have in place to combat uh, climate change, uh, it's uh, clear that Labor is operating in an alternate reality. And we only have to look at the chaos and the confusion in the Labor Party as one spokesman is dumped and the deck chairs are rearranged on the faltering ship. Of course, we know that Mr Albanese backflipped on his support for uh, the shadow spokesperson, Mr Butler, in a desperate attempt to save his stumbling leadership. But moving Mr Butler out and putting Mr Bowen in doesn't change the fact that Labor does not have a single policy which will reduce emissions or lower energy prices. And Mr Bowen bragged about being a key architect of Labor's 
failed climate policies that it took to the last election and to which they are still clinging. And we know that independent economic modelling showed that Labor's 45 per cent emissions reduction target by 2030 and its 50 per cent renewable energy target would hurt our economy badly and cost tens of thousands of jobs. And the member for Hunter has called them out on this. And of course, we still see Labor hopelessly divided. As Mr Fitzgibbon pointed out in the nine newspapers in November, after 14 years of trying, he said, the Labor Party has made not one contribution to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. And so while we see Labor fighting amongst themselves, and while we see the member for Cryo, Mr Miles, one minute he's up in a coal mine, the next minute he's saying that the end of thermal coal would be a good thing. Uh, he's flip-flopping all over the place. While Labor is all at sea, the Morrison government is getting on with doing the heavy lifting required. The Morrison government has a clear and a successful emissions reduction policy, which has allowed us to meet and beat our 2020 target and will ensure we meet and beat our 2030 target. Wholesale electricity prices have fallen for 16 months in a row, and quarterly prices are at their lowest level in six years. We have also seen a record eight consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year CPI reductions in retail electricity prices, putting more money in the hip pockets of Australian families and businesses. As Prime Minister Morrison told the National Press Club yesterday, Australia's economic recovery plan is underpinned by delivering affordable and reliable energy. And this positions Australia to be effective in the lower and ultimately net zero emissions global economy that is a part of our future. The Prime Minister was quite clear yesterday. Our goal is to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. Critical to this outcome are the advances made in science and technology. And these are needed to commercially transform advanced economies and countries along with the developing world. Here in Australia, we will invest and partner in technology breakthroughs. These are needed to reduce and offset emissions so that our heavy industry in particular and industry more broadly can continue to grow and protect our jobs and living standards while at the same time keeping energy costs down. As the Prime Minister has made very clear, we will not tax our way to net zero emissions which would put the cost on Australians in the cities and in our regions. He's very, very clear. Getting to net zero should be about technology, not taxes and higher electricity prices. And we are getting on with the job. Just look at our record. Emissions fell by 3 per cent in the year to June 2020, to their lowest level since 1998, meaning we are now nearly 17 per cent below 2005 levels. This compares to reductions of approximately 9 per cent on average across the OECD, 1 per cent in New Zealand and less than 1 per cent in Canada. Labor and the Greens don't like to hear the truth, but these are the facts. Under the leadership of Minister Taylor, our $18 billion technology investment roadmap gets underway this year. There is a $1.9 billion commitment to develop clean energy technologies such as hydrogen, green steel and carbon capture and storage. We're pursuing global partnerships with countries including Japan, the United States, the UK, Korea and Singapore. Our multi-billion dollar energy and emissions reduction agreement with New South Wales is being implemented and we hope other states will follow. Agreements are in place to accelerate major transmission projects in New South Wales and Tasmania, with Victoria and South Australia to follow this year. The government is building Snowy 2.0, and we're rolling out our $200 million program to build new diesel storage facilities. And of course, one of the great recipients of our fuel production payment 
and our, our fuel security package is the Geelong refinery and its 700 workers. And I was absolutely delighted to join with Minister Taylor in making an announcement about the bring forward of the fuel production payment in Geelong in December last year. The clean energy regulator estimates that a record seven gigawatts of new renewable capacity was installed last year. These are the facts. This is 11 per cent higher than the previous record set in 2019 at 6.3 gigawatts. This represents more than the entire renewable capacity installed under the previous Labor government, which was 5.6 gigawatts from December 2007 to September 2013. These are the facts. A solar installation boom drove this new record despite COVID-19 restrictions which impacted rooftop solar installation rates for part of the year. We have a great story to tell here in Australia. One in four Australian homes have solar, which is the highest uptake of household solar in the world. And this all helps to reduce household energy bills and reduce emissions. Over the last quarter of 2020, the share of renewables in the national electricity market exceeded 30 per cent. 30 per cent. In 2020, a record 53.6 terawatt hours of electricity was generated from re renewables, including rooftop solar, in the national electricity market. This is a whopping 16 per cent higher than the previous record set in 2019. So the bottom line is, Mr Acting Deputy President, we are on track to meet and beat our targets, the Coyote Eero targets by 459 million tonnes, along with the 2030 Paris target, which has improved over the last two years by 639 million tonnes. This is the equivalent of removing 14.7 million cars off the road, not for one year, but for 15 years. The Morrison government is delivering on emissions reduction while Labor dithers as to how to do it. Labor's fighting internally, and Australians have worked out that they have completely lost the plot when it comes to tackling climate action and climate change. Labor doesn't know what its 2030 target looks like. They don't know how much it will cost or how it will be achieved. Only the Morrison government will achieve the outcomes that we need and this country needs to reduce our emissions and at the same time protect our industries and protect our jobs. We are taking real and practical action and I've talked about in this contribution some of the very important results that we are delivering to protect our economy, to protect jobs, to drive record renewable investment, to see one in four Australian homes take up solar, but to do so in a way which takes Australia forward. And I am incredibly proud of the work of this government I'm incredibly proud of the leadership of our Prime Minister to drive down emissions, to take strong action on climate change whilst protecting our jobs and our industries. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this government's climate policies are an absolute mess. They are an international embarrassment. They are irresponsible, and as a result, all of us are missing out on the opportunity to create good, clean energy jobs, jobs that Australians desperately need right now. But Australia is being left behind. The rest of the world is moving forward while Prime Minister Scott Morrison drags his feet. There is a real global consensus on climate change. And I'm not just talking about the Biden administration in the US that will take climate change action and emissions reductions uh, seriously. It's also the US, it's Canada, 
it's Germany, it's France, it's New Zealand. It's all of our major allies and all of our major partners around the world. Uh, and right here at home, it's the Business Council, the Australian Industry Group, the Property Council, it's our largest airline, it's our biggest mining company, it's our biggest bank, our biggest telecommunications provider. It's a long list of leading businesses, organisations and not-for-profits who have made commitments to taking action on climate. Uh, and today, the only people missing are the Morrison government. Scott Morrison is absolutely isolated on this issue. Labor, on the other hand, we are confident and positive about our future. We know that we can reach a better future together, and really, everyone else agrees. So we need the Morrison government to make a plan for climate action now. In the past eight years, this Liberal national government has had 22 energy policies, 22 energy policies in just eight years. And what has this led to? It's led to absolute chaos, and it's led to higher electricity prices and higher emissions. And this isn't even the worst of their inaction. According to an independent report from Deloitte Access Economics, the Prime Minister's refusal to take action could crush trade, it could tr crush tourism, mining and service industries. That report suggests that the government's inaction and refusal to adopt zero emissions by 2050 will actually devastate our economy. That action, inaction could cost up to 880,000 jobs and could slash 3.4 trillion from GDP by 2070. But if the government actually took action and delivered net zero emissions by 2050, the report predicts it would actually create 250,000 jobs. We have just experienced our deepest recession in almost 100 years, and we know that over 2 million Australians are still out of work or they can't get enough hours, uh, and they're screaming out for a jobs plan from this government. And action on climate change, it delivers jobs. It delivers lower power bills. It grows the economy. It delivers higher wages. And so now, right now, is the time to take that action. Scott Morrison can no longer pretend that he is taking action on climate change. And Australians need real climate action, or we will all be left paying the price. We have to hit net zero carbon pollution by 2050. The world is decarbonising. And we need to make sure that Australia doesn't get left behind. We need to make sure that we take full advantage of the opportunities that this presents to a country like ours. Um, because with the right plan and with the right vision, Australia can be a clean energy superpower with a new generation of jobs and cheaper power bills. We have some of the best wind and wave resources in the world. We have the highest average solar radiation per square metre of any continent. And we have some of the best engineers and scientists in the world to take advantage of this. Working towards a low carbon future means opportunities for our manufacturing sectors. It means opportunities for energy exports. It means opportunities for rare earth minerals mining. And it means opportunities for good, secure, clean energy jobs. So take, for example, our plan to rewire the nation. The current energy network takes no account of the rise of renewables. It was designed for another time. And this is why a Labor government would take action to rebuild and modernise the national energy grid. Rebuilding the grid will itself create thousands of jobs, particularly in regional Australia, uh, and it will deliver up to $40 billion in benefits. This just makes sense. And Labor governments get things done. 
The Victorian government, for example, last year announced that the Southern Hemisphere's biggest battery is to be built just outside of Geelong. This project will create good jobs. It will drive down electricity prices. It will boost reliability. It will help support Victoria's transition to renewable energy, and it will be good for the economy as well. Independent analysis shows that every dollar invested in this 300 megawatt battery will deliver more than $2 in benefits to Victorian households and businesses. And in addition to the big projects, the Victorian government is also helping local businesses and communities access clean energy. Just recently, they delivered grants across the states to fund projects like community solar farms, batteries and solar electricity systems for sports clubs. Victoria is on track to hit its renewable energies targets and it's embracing new technologies and, and investing in renewables. Uh, and it's not just Victoria. Every state and territory is on board, so the Morrison government needs to take action Thank now. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Rice. President, I want to take you back to the first day of parliament last year, when all of us members of parliament when we arrived in Canberra, it was shrouded in smoke. The bushfires were raging from last summer's black summer. Of course, we know when the, finally the fires were out that we had 33 people that died in those fires. And an estimate is that 445 people died from smoke inhalation from those fires. We had thousands of lives, of people's livelihoods of their homes affected, and homes which are still being rebuilt. They were the worst fires ever in Australia's history. 20 per cent of our mainland forests burnt. Over three billion animals were killed. Those of us that had been seeing our hotter, drier climate resulting in the weather conditions that we experienced last summer thought, what devastation. But maybe finally, seeing these fires occurred, maybe finally that as a country, we would listen to the science. We would recognise that, yep, this is a climate crisis, that we need to take action, that we need to act on our reducing our carbon pollution in accordance with what the science says. The science is very clear, and it was reiterated last week by the Climate um, Targets Panel, where it says that if we are going to meet our, tariffs, our Paris target globally, of keeping global heating to below two degrees, that we need to have at least a 50 per cent cut in carbon pollution by 2030. And if we want to keep global heating below one and a half degrees, we need a greater than 75 per cent cut in our carbon pollution by 2030. But sadly, no. We went through those fires. The science is so clear. But we have a government and we have a Labor Party that are still in absolute denial. Because delay in acting on our climate crisis is denial. If you are serious about acting on our climate crisis, we need that urgent action now to get those cuts of at least half of our carbon pollution, if not three quarters, in the next decade. And that means getting out of coal and gas and oil. That means transitioning completely to a clean energy economy. I've heard the contributions from both sides talking up renewables, and renewables are great, and we need them. And all of this technology is terrific, but it is not going to amount to a hill of beans unless we are also getting out of coal and gas and oil, both domestically and, ex and in our export markets. We need to get the coal and gas and oil industries, those big industry barons who are currently determining what's in the climate and energy policies of both the government and the Labor Party, out of that role. We need to be listening to the science, listening to the people, taking action which is consistent with the science in order to keep people safe. Just like people were concerned about keeping people safe in last summer's fires, we need zero carbon. We need Order. action Order, urgently Senator to Rice. keep people Thank safe. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I listened to the debate carefully and read the resolution, and what a choice. Um, 
will either support uh, the Greens Party's resolution or uh, hang out with the troglodytes in the government on these questions. It's not a happy choice. Um, we are entitled, I think, uh, in the Labor Party to approach Greens' resolutions on climate change with a little bit of scepticism. This year will be the 11th or 12th, I've lost count, anniversary of the Greens political party voting with the Liberals uh, on the CPRS. And imagine, imagine, what a world, oh, imagine what a world we would be living in today Order. in Australia. We would have lower emissions in the country. We would have had much less, much less carbon emitted into the atmosphere. We would have had lower power prices, consistently lower, stable power prices, because there would have been an energy investment framework that would have allowed the private sector and government to work together to deliver a cleaner energy mix. There would have been more jobs, better jobs, in the Australian economy, particularly in the regions. And we would have continued to export coal uh, to global markets at the same time as Australia wouldn't have been internationally isolated, going economically backwards uh, and, uh, and bleeding jobs, particularly in our regional towns. But I don't want to spend too much on time on the Greens' political party today. I want to spend a little bit more time on the government. And I listened to Senator Henderson's contribution very, very carefully. Uh, and it reminded me that where the government's front is at the moment, what they say uh, on climate change is a little bit like what St Augustine had to say about chastity. Uh, that is, we're, we're all for it, just not yet. Uh, now, there's three kinds of politicians in the Liberal and National Party on these questions. There's the front, what we saw from Senator Henderson, the modern liberals, the sort of mealy-mouthed apologists, the craven capitulation to the government's backbench. We saw the leader of the government in the Senate in question time, Senator Birmingham, a revolting display, really, of a sort of quivering craven capitulation to the backbench on one hand, but wanting to present to the Australian community as if there was some real action on climate change and energy policy. The second group is the hard right in the Liberal and National Party. They try and keep their views uh, in the shadows as much as possible, apart from when the now Prime Minister bursts out on the floor of the parliament with a big lump of coal and waves it around. I mean, it was carefully varnished so none of the coal dust would dirty his beautiful white shirt, something that most of the workers who Senator Canavan you know, cosplay dresses as when he puts his high vis on. They don't have that luxury. Uh, so you've got the hard right, Senator Canavan, who'll say that he supports coal workers in regional Queensland on one hand, but apparently wants to decouple the Australian economy uh, from the Chinese economy on the other. So he's for jobs on one hand and not for jobs on the other. He's all for mining workers in the iron ore industry, but he wants to introduce an export levy uh, onto Australian iron ore exports. He says he's for manufacturing, but released and led the maddest manufacturing plan that any political party has released that would have pushed up, if ever adopted by the government, would push up power prices and drive tens of thousands of Australian jobs offshore. And then you've got the third loop, the, the, the third group, the sort of fruit loops, the climate science deniers. There's a common thread with this group. They're not big on climate science. They're not particularly big on coronavirus and public epidemiology science either. You know, you've got the, Mr. Kelly hanging out with Pete Evans and all of the other Fruit Loops in the, in the social media world who want to tell Australians that they should not take the vaccine, sending a dangerous message, hanging out with all of the QAnon conspiracy theorists. And that group is such a big group on the coalition backbench. That's the reason why the government's had more than 20 energy policies over the course of the eight unhappy years 
that this government has been in office. Now, there is a strong alternative. The Labor Party represents a strong alternative on these issues. Chris Bowen said late last week, climate policy is jobs policy, energy policy is jobs policy, and we would have in government very simple objectives, driving down the price of electricity and energy, delivering more good jobs in our suburbs and our regions, a cleaner environment, lower emissions, uh, and continuing to try and drive a position where we've got good jobs and a future in our regions and our country towns, and Australia once again rejoins the international community on these questions and delivers real positive change on the question of climate. Senator Faruqi. Deputy President, this morning the People's Climate Rally came to the lawns of Parliament House. They came to the People's House today to make sure that politicians are confronted with the reality of the climate crisis at the start of the parliamentary year, because they know that two centuries of colonization have undone the millennia of management and care of country by First Nations people. For us, it's the love of this planet and its people that drives our action on climate. But our rage has to match our love, rage at the harm being done by the climate crisis to communities across the global south and right here, rage at the big corporations and politicians who put profit ahead of people, and rage at the liberals and labor who have taken millions of dollars in donations from coal and gas corporations. And while the world is taking action to address the climate emergency, Scott Morrison and Rupert Murdoch have parked Australia in a historical cul-de-sac. They have made Australia a pariah of the world. Last summer, we saw fires savage and ravage large parts of our country. We saw drought along the Murray-Darling and weeks of smoke and ash choking our cities. This summer, we saw more of the same, from major flooding and rain battering New South Wales coasts to heat waves and fires in Perth. Burning coal, oil and gas is making extreme weather events more intense and more frequent. The world's current greenhouse gas reduction promises are not enough to limit global warming to below 2 degrees C, and we must cut pollution rapidly. The window to do this is open till 2030, not 2050. And that's why the Greens want to make sure that global warming is limited to 1.5 degrees and our targets are of 75 percent emissions reductions by 2030. We say no to a gaslit recovery because that's no recovery at all. We demand climate justice. We know that there is no justice in a transition to a post-carbon economy that leaves control of green industries in the hands of big corporations. The rampant planet-abusing consumption and extraction of resources by giant corporations and governments who are captured by these polluting interests have brought us to the place we are at today in a climate emergency. Frankly, we know that there is no hope for true climate justice in a capitalist, profit-driven society like ours. We cannot address the climate crisis and achieve justice without changing the economic system that demands constant extraction. And we will show that people matter. Together, our power, the power of the people, is much greater than conservative politicians that sit here, than the media barons that are out there, and then rabid corporations who just are full of greed. Senator Steele, John. Thank you. Uh, just before I uh, rolled in here, I got off the phone with a mate of mine uh, in the eastern suburbs of Perth. And he said to me, Jordan, there's ash fallen over the house. We can't, none of us here can imagine what it is like to be in that situation. None of us can imagine it. 
You know, we're in this place, air conditioned, we're all safe, it's fine. Meanwhile, right now, people are losing their homes. We don't know, could be fighting for their lives. We know that at least 30 homes have been lost, probably more. We know that families will be bunking with each other, having packed everything in the car and got out of there as quickly as they can. And they will now be confronting the beginnings of a truth, a truth that their lives have changed forever, that it will never quite be the same again. And as they begin that understanding, that reconciliation with the truth, that realisation, the major parties in this place should be confronting truths of their own. The truth that climate change is making these events worse. The truth that the burning of coal, oil and gas is the largest contributor to global heating. And the truth that the policies of Australian governments, Liberal and Labour alike, have done nothing but make the situation worse, have done nothing but burn more of these chemicals, have done nothing but block global action. They may well look to this place for that truth, but they will not find it. They will not find it among the Labour and Liberal parties here today. Why? Because both sides of Parliament take money from the polluters, from the Chevrons and the Woodsides, from the Clive Palmers and the Gina Reinharts. This place on the question of climate is bought and paid for by the big end of town that's making money off a climate crisis. And so it is only the Greens at moments like these that are willing to state the truth that climate change is putting lives at risk, that coal, oil and gas are driving it, and that it is possible to stop it with government action, rapid action, which we must take now. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, if you haven't got a 2030 emissions reduction target in line with the climate science, you might as well line up with the climate change deniers. And I'll point out that neither of the major parties, neither the coalition nor the ALP in this place, have got a 2030 target in line with the climate science. In fact, Labor doesn't even have a 2030 target at all. And why is that? Why do both the major parties fail to put in place policies in line with what the science is telling us? Because they are corrupted by the dirty donations they take from the fossil fuel industries. And we know, because the donations data came out yesterday, a combined over a million dollars flowed into the pockets, dirty money, into the pockets of the major parties in this place from the fossil fuel corporations. And what do they get for it? They get to write things like a gas-led recovery, supported by both the major parties in this place, where they're not only backing in new gas developments, new fossil fuel developments. They want to throw public subsidies at them. It is a corruption of our democracy and it is exposing the Australian people to massive risk and, to some of them, massive risk to their lives. Look reality in the eye. The feedback loops are kicking in. The tipping points are upon us. We've got to stop logging, stop land clearing, plant more trees, no new fossil fuels, rapid transition out of the fossil fuel industry and invest in our communities, invest in renewables, invest in reforestation, invest in electrifying our transport networks, create the jobs and the prosperity and give our people Your safer time lives. Has expired. The question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
So it is real, Perrin. Lock the doors. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and those to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone to tell of the ayes. Senator Davey tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 33. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Thanks, Senators. I'll give the chamber a moment to clear for those who aren't planning to participate in the consideration of documents. But we will now move to the consideration of documents. And uh, documents as listed on pages three to six of today's order of business. We'll go through these sequentially. So we're looking at those documents as on page three. Does anyone? Uh, I'd ask those who are having discussions in the chamber to please leave. Senator Seawitt, we're on page three. We're in documents. So we've got four documents listed on page three. I cannot see anyone standing. I'm going to move on. Does anyone wish to take note of any of the documents on page four? Auditor General's reports for 2021. Documents in response. Sorry, Senator Seward. Um, can I? Can we do all of page four? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, can I seek leave to take note? Oh, take note of item 18, the Australian Electoral Commission, um, the Federal Election 2019 Funding Disclosure Report, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. We're still on page four. Are there any other documents on page four that anyone wish to consider? No. Okay. We'll move on to page five. Any documents on page five? Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to uh, make comment and uh, take note of item 28 on page five. That is the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act review by Professor Graham Samuel. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adam. Thank you, Mr. Acting. Uh, Deputy President, I seek leave uh, to uh, take comment of this report because this is a very, very important review. It is something that is required under the EPBC legislation that every 10 years our environment laws are reviewed, that they're looked at in great detail, that experts consider whether they are fit for purpose, and it is advice to both the government and the parliament about the effect of our laws and whether they are doing what they need to do. Now we know that the government had this report for some 90 days before releasing it. And of course they happened, just let's put that on the record, they happened to release it right in the middle of Mr Albanese's reef, uh, front bench reshuffle last week. Um, you'd think uh, that perhaps this government uh, would have been a bit more um, courteous to release an important document like this uh, publicly, uh, not in the middle of when other things were going on, unless, of course, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, this government wanted to cover up and distract from the recommendations in this report. Let's go to them, because they are absolutely fundamental. What Professor Samuel says in this review is that our environment laws are in dire straits that our environment is suffering, that if we don't act now, we will lose our native animals, species for good, gone. The biggest threat, of course, to our wildlife and to our environment is climate change and habitat destruction. This report calls on the parliament and the government to take swift action to put in place stronger laws and protections for our environment. We, no, we need to take heed of this advice. We need stronger protections, stronger standards. We shouldn't be allowing new developments and new mines and new destructions to occur without considering the very real long-term impact that these projects are having on our environment. We need laws to protect what we have because we don't have much left. 
We need laws that protect our wildlife before they're gone for good. This report shows that native species like the koala will be extinct before 2050 unless we stop destroying koala habitat. It shows that our rivers and our streams and our native water, natural waterways will be polluted unless we stop polluting them with the developments that are just going on and on and on. It says we have to stop allowing the corporate greed in this country override the environment, override the needs of the community to protect what we have. Australians love our natural places. They love our special spots. They love our native animals, and they want us to protect them. One of the things I've noticed more than ever out of COVID is that people are reconnecting with their natural surrounds. They want to be outside enjoying the Australian bush, our beautiful beaches, our coastline. They don't want to see Australia's environment trashed anymore. They want to see our animals protected, and they want a government that will do what it needs to do to stop extinction in its tracks. We need strong laws. We need better protection. But we also need, Mr Acting Deputy President, an independent watchdog to ensure that these laws are actually upheld, to ensure that when corporations get a green light, that they're held to account for what they do and what they don't do. It's quite clear in this review that the cosy relationship between corporations in this country and the governments of the day, state and federal, has made our environment suffer. It's put it in a worse state, and we can't trust that governments will simply do the right thing, and certainly not when they've got their hands out for election donations. Politics needs to be taken out of this. Dirty politics needs to be taken out of this. The environment needs to be put front and centre, and we need strong laws and a watchdog to make sure our environment is protected for good. This isn't just for today or tomorrow. This is for generations to come, and it's time we heeded this advice today. Senator Hanson Young, are you seeking leave to continue? Leave to continue my remarks. Senator Rice. I also wish to take note of document 28. Um, Graham Samuels, in his review, which highly critical of our existing environment laws, of course went to the, the situation of our logging laws, the Regional Forests Agreement, which we've had many debates in this chamber about the adequacy or complete inadequacy of the regional forest agreements to be protecting our forests and protecting the wildlife that depend on our forests, that wildlife that so sadly in so many cases is becoming endangered and critically endangered and hurtling towards extinction. Graham Samuels had some pretty strong words to say about how he saw the regional forest agreements were operating. He said, the review considers that the provisions for regional forest agreements are the most unacceptable and require immediate reform, and that the review considers that the environmental considerations under the RFA Act are weaker than those imposed elsewhere for matters of national environmental significance and do not align with the assessment of significant impacts on matters of in national environmental significance required by the EPBC Act. Submissions from stakeholders indicate concern about the effectiveness of the RFAs to protect threatened species that rely on the forest areas covered by RFAs. There is also great concern that the controls on logging within forests have not adequately adapted to pressures on the ecosystem, such as climate change or bushfire impacts. And then goes on to say there is insufficient Commonwealth oversight of the regional forest agreements and the assurance and reporting mechanisms are weak. That essentially that the RFAs are not protecting our forests. And he called for immediate action to make sure that logging operations were covered under the same environmental standards as other actions, and that they were going to be subject to the same national environmental standards that he proposes in his review. I mean, this is damning. 
This and his report just completely reinforces and underlines what people who are concerned about the future of our forests have been talking, out, talking about for decades. If you go into our forests, if you see the state of, of the destruction of our forests, you can see what's going on. And Graham Samuels, in his review, has just said, yes, this is what's occurring. Our forests are not being protected by our logging laws, that species are being left to be hurtling towards extinction, and that immediate action is needed. Yet what action have we seen from this government? They have been sitting on this report for the last three months. We have had another summer of logging operations, another summer of logging habitat of swift parrots critically endangered, another summer of logging habitat of Leadbeater's possums critically endangered, another summer of logging habitat of greater gliders, which are rapidly reducing in numbers, and another summer of logging habitat of koalas. This is what's currently going on now for us. And this review has said once and for all that this is going on and that immediate action is needed. What the Greens say the only responsible thing that this government should be doing, and it should have done it years ago, if not three months ago when it got this report from Professor Samuels, is to put an immediate moratorium on logging in our native forests. We know that the native forest logging industry is the rump of the timber industry in Australia, that almost 90 per cent of the wood that comes out of Australia comes from plantations. And the Greens believe, and anyone concerned about the future of our forests believes, that we should be increasing that to 100 per cent of the wood coming out of Australia comes from our forests. There is no role for logging of our native forests, our precious native forests in Australia. There should be an immediate moratorium on the logging of all of our native forests. We should be scrapping the regional forest agreements, which have not been protecting our forests. They have not been protecting jobs. They have been destroyed destroying our critical heritage, our cultural heritage, First Nations cultural heritage, our environmental heritage. They've been destroying habitat for animals. They've been destroying our water supplies. They have been impacting upon the potential of these forests to be wonderful resources for tourism and recreation. This report lays it out clearly that our forests are not being protected and urgent action is needed to, needed to make sure that they are. Um, Senator Rice, oh, are you speaking on the same um, matter? Um, yes, please. Sorry. And we're just uh, wanting to keep this on the notice paper, so if you would just, when you finish. I think, uh, I think Senator Hanson Young has already yeah, asked to continue her remarks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to uh, take note of this uh, document as well. It is a very, very important document. It is a statutory review after 10 years' operation of the EPBC Act, and it is worth reading, in, in effect, in summary, what uh, uh, Mr Samuels has uh, said in the review. He says, the overwhelming message received by the review is that, the, that Australians care deeply about our, our iconic places and unique environment. Protecting and conserving them for the benefit of current and future generations is important for the nation. The evidence received by the review is compelling. Australia's natural environment and iconic places are in an overall state of decline and are in, under increasing threat, increasing threat. The pressures on the environment are significant, including land use change, habitat loss and degradation, and feral animals and invasive plant species. Um, it goes on to talk about uh, a number of things, and then says that the, the current environmental trajectory is unsustainable. Uh, that's, that's extremely important. He's uh, basically come to the conclusion that uh, there are significant problems with uh, our environmental uh, laws. And, uh, of course, like any good reviewer, has come up with a range of very sensible suggestions. And we know that this has been through a process of not just uh, landing on the, the desk of the minister and being tabled in the parliament. There was an interim report as well. Um, a whole range of different uh, remedies have been uh, laid out in the report. Uh, just mentioning some of the big ticket items, the requirement for strong national standards, uh, the reducing of red tape around those standards by devolving responsibilities uh, to the states, uh, 
an assurance commissioner to make sure that uh, the, the environment is protected. Uh, uh, he mentions transparency, and transparency, of course, is always a good uh, resolution to any particular uh, problem when it involves government, uh, and uh, uses that as a key for, uh, for uh, regaining trust, which is something the report uh, says needs to be done. It also talks about reducing complexity. So there's a whole bunch of uh, complexity of the legislation. There's a whole bunch of remedies in here, and uh, the government has a lot of work to do, and I'm actually quite surprised that we, haven't, that we don't see a response to this report from the government, uh, noting that it has been with the minister for some time now. Uh, and uh, what is essential, and, and Mr. Samuel spells this out, is there needs to be a holistic plan to deal with this issue. Uh, there needs to be something uh, that the government lays out saying. Uh, this is how we intend to approach this problem. Here is our timetable of uh, implementation uh, in terms of legislation and then what may, may flow from that, so that the Australian public has the complete picture. Uh, I'll just indicate to the government that I don't intend to support uh, any measures that are ad hoc and just cherry picks of the, of the legislation. There has to be a plan that has been laid out. Uh, and I don't want to find myself in a situation where I'm being asked to uh, support uh, perhaps weaker standards or where I'm being asked to support uh, the devolution of decision making to the states when the states may not have the proper expertise and capacity to conduct uh, decision making uh, in respect of the environment. I don't want to pass laws uh, that allow devolution without uh, the uh, assurance Commissioner being in that, you know, dealt with at the same time, so that there's balance as we change things. We have the assurance on the other side. Uh, you know, I, I'm mindful that the, the, the government has, for some time now, promised to uh, have a, an Inspector General for the Murray-Darling Basin, and uh, yet we've not seen that legislation in any form. Uh, so I won't be accepting a promise that there will be some future legislation that deals with, some, with someone like an assurance commissioner. The important thing is this is a really, really important issue. I'm uh, prepared to take it on pragmatically because you know, saying no to everything will mean we, we leave ourselves in the same parlous state that we are. So we have to approach this in a proper manner. I urge the government to come up with a plan that they can present to the parliament and uh, caution them not to try and bring little bits of legislation that might suit one uh, side of uh, change without uh, uh, imp uh, you know, the possibility of the implementation of the whole report. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any more um, interesting documents on page five? No? OK, so we'll move to documents 41 to 43 on the top of page six. Senator Seaworth. Um, can I uh, take note of a document 42 on page six, which is the Workplace Gender yep. Equality Agency, and seek leave to continue my remarks, and also of document 50. Um, take note of that and seek leave to continue my remarks. So is leave granted on a document at 42? For Senator Seward to continue and um, yeah, so we'll come back. I've noted you want to take note of 50. We were just dealing with those couple. So we we'll now move to uh, responses to Senate resolutions 44 to 46. Nope. And we'll now move to documents pursuant to continuing orders 47 to 49. Nope. Uh, we're now on reports and government responses, and Senator Seawitt has moved to take note of 50. Moved to take note. Is there any objection to that motion? No, nope, there being none. Thank you. And uh, we're now on page 7, 51 to 52. Oh, Senator Still. Madam Deputy President, Happy New Year. Thank you. Um, I wish to make a contribution to number 55. Uh, the Rural and Regional Affairs. All right, we're just not there yet. Page seven. Oh, I'm sorry. You're still on 51, 52. Yep. yep. 
51 to 52. There's no interest in those. So go for it, Senator Stirl. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, Madam Deputy President. I think my colleague wants to talk to one before my rural and regional affairs. No, for, no, no. I'm happy. To, I'm, I'm here for a while. Through Senator you, Madam Deputy President. Yep. I'm happy. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Stirl, um, and thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to make a contribution this evening on the tabling of the Corporations Financial Services Joint Statutory Committee Litigation Funding and the Regulation of Class Action Industry Report, dated December 2020, uh, which was received um, out of sitting on the 21st of December at the end of last year. Um, I will only make a short contribution, uh, and I just want to say at the outset that this matters because this really goes to the heart of uh, Australians' access to justice, uh, which has been increased by um, the emergence of uh, litigation funding entities that are making it possible for people like those in uh, Meryl Swanson's seat, the member for Paterson, the great Labor uh, advocate for that community. Uh, who was fighting for her community against this government for years and years and years to try and get redress to the uh, spill of PFAS, um, which Australians might be familiar with, is the spray that was used uh, when firefighting practice occurred, and it has a toxic impact on the environment. And that community um, that Merrill inherited was stranded. People's lives were completely on hold. They were unable to get any resolution to the fact that they were living on properties in what was a declared red zone, and the government was not willing to provide any compensation, any relief from the situation in which they found themselves and give them the opportunity to move on. That was the reality. Litigation funding enabled them to bring a very complex case uh, to court against the government, their own government that was ignoring them. And it's a perfect example of where there is a lot of money and a lot of power in some of the, for example, in big corporations, not just in governments, but in big corporations, where you know the ordinary citizen, the hardworking Australian who's been minding their business, minding their P's and Q's all their life, find themselves on the wrong side of a big, big legal battle. And there's no way that that can get to court unless there's litigation funding. So that's really what is at the heart of this matter. But the government really botched this. They really botched what they did. And in botching what they did, they revealed how subject they are to influence by outside entities, including the US Chamber of Commerce, who were significant lobbyists in gathering a storm of um, action against uh, what I consider would be a good outcome from this inquiry. And we've ended up instead with the mess that is reported in this report. So um, I rise to speak, obviously, against some of the recommendations contained in the report, and I want to re reiterate the uh, glaring failures in the government's action on litigation funders that our committee of inquiry uncovered. Uh, the report was particularly galling in that it unfortunately recommends actions that the government had already decided to take before they even um, implemented this, before they received this report. So the sequence was bizarre. It was the institution of this committee to make an inquiry. Eight days after that, uh, Minister Frydenberg stands up and makes declarations uh, which are actually, you know, incidentally, tied to the recommendations that didn't arrive in this place until the end of the year. Why set up a committee of inquiry when eight days later you're going to go out and make an announcement for changes? It goes to the heart of some of the chaotic decision-making and the uh, capture of this government by big lobbyists that make them do things that are not in the public interest. Um, despite referring this inquiry, as I said, to litigation, in, into the litigation industry last May, Treasurer Frydenberg introduced regulations anyway, preempting the report of his own government. Um, a mere eight days afterwards. And that's why I supported the disallowance of motion of the regulations in this chamber last year. It was in the last, the final week of the sittings. And I'm, I'm quite sad that um, Senator Hanson, who did pay some attention to this matter, and, um, and um, Mr Roberts as well, Senator Roberts, 
didn't support that disallowance motion because uh, the government now seem to have been let off the hook to continue on their merry way, and I expect that they will continue to suppress Australians' access to litigation funding, because that's the outcome of what they've done. Everything we've seen since uh, the disallowance was not carried in this place has shown us that the regulations introduced by Mr Frydenberg are not fit for purpose. Even the regulator ASIC, the government body that's charged with enforcing these regulations, was forced to spend tens of thousands of dollars in legal advice to figure out how to implement the recommendations, the regulations that were hastily brought in. It's a ridiculous proposition to require a litigation funder to operate as a managed investment scheme. Now, this has been recognised by a blindsided ASIC and by opposition members of the committee, by most parties of the Senate and by the majority of the industry. Everybody figured it out except for the government. Um, now, this is an example of Minister Frydenberg's omnishambles, a policy made on the run, dreamed up by foreign lobbyists, think tanks that have no application in reality. The reforms that this government are putting forward and seek to implement or have implemented in some cases with, uh, in line with the recommendations in the report are wrong, and they are certainly not fit for purpose. They ignore the recommendations of the Australian Law Reform Commission, um, which was a report that the government asked for two years prior to calling on the Senate to do the inquiry, and two years and eight days before Mr Frydenberg stood up and made up the rules just off the cuff. And it ignores the 24 recommendations that were made for 18 months before Mr Frydenberg began his current um, jeremiah against litigation funders. As we point out in the minority report, uh, new regulations are not merely difficult for the funders to comply with, they're impossible to comply with. So the Managed Investment Scheme rules require a registered scheme to be set up and, and a maintenance of a register of members, the convening of member meetings, which is just an absurd prospect in a class action where potentially tens of thousands of members are affected. So it's another barrier to, to justice. It's another, it's another paper wall established by this government to make it harder for people to get the services that they need and to get the professional assistance they need to bring legitimate and just causes to the courts for consideration and resolution. <clears throat> These regulations that the government have locked in, make no mistake, they're a sellout to foreign corporates and they will indeed, and history will no doubt prove, they will hinder access to justice for ordinary Australians. The evidence heard by the Committee from Litigation Funding participants, from law firms and from experts in the field all pointed out that there was no real crisis at all in class actions and that litigation funders were an important tool for many working class Australians in getting access to justice. Those working class Australians are now liable for, a, for lawsuits from Commonwealth agencies and other private parties should the funder breach those member register obligations. And we've seen this before in other um, underhanded, sneaky ways that the government have established process uh, impediments in, in the area of unions. Uh, what the government is proposing to do is wrong. It creates a giant stick over litigation funders and it's, it threatens those who would dare to take class action to court with terrible legal consequences unless their funder fulfils these arcane and unfit regulations of an MIS. I was very disappointed to see the disallowance motion voted down at the end of last year because it would have forced the government back to the drawing board, encouraged them to come up with a regulation that was fit for purpose and preserved access to justice for ordinary Australians. Now, I know that Senator Hanson has promised in return for her and Senator Roberts votes against the dis disallowance of these regulations that she will get a commitment um, she has a commitment from the government to support reforms to exempt funders from the MIS regulations if they commit to giving class members 70% of the damages well that's what she says she's got us the deal my concern is it has to be delivered to be real i note that this reform is yet to reach the notice paper and i strongly urge senator hanson to keep the government's feet to the fire because these guys run a mile from the commitments that they make they are disingenuous they lie to the public on a on a daily on a daily regularity, and this matter needs resolution. Australians deserve access to justice, and their government shouldn't get away with putting a wall between them 
and access to justice. There are some excellent recommendations in the report, and I urge the government to keep reforming in the industry, but in a manner that was outlined by the Australian Law Reform Commission, not made up as he stood up eight days after we called the inquiry by Minister Frydenberg. The government cannot let this issue up lie. It's got to fix the broken regulatory requirements for litigation funders to save taxpayers money on extra legal advice and to protect class action. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Stirl, third time thank, lucky. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Now, I rise to speak on the report that was presented out of sitting from the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee into policy regulatory taxation, administrative and funding priorities for Australian shipping. And I will say now, Madam Deputy President, that I will seek leave to continue my remarks. Mm -hmm. Um, so in case I forget at the end of my contribution. Now, I want to thank firstly the, uh, my fellow Labor senators. I want to thank the Greens and the crossbenchers for supporting firstly this reference that I'd put up in the 45th parliament. We were able to have a couple of hearings. I think we had two down in Melbourne. And then unfortunately the parliament uh, expired. We went to an early election. And then I also want to rethank the uh, crossbenchers, the Greens and my uh, ALP colleagues for uh, supporting me and putting it back through again for another go so we could actually finish the fine work that we set out to do. Madam Deputy President, as you know and every senator in this building knows that I have an absolute undying commitment to see an Australian successful, viable, profitable um, shipping industry. Uh, it comes as no surprise that I have been the biggest critic of the government, this government, the Turnbull government, the Abbott government and the Howard government before, on the way that the successive LNP governments have done everything they can to uh, uh, demolish, to absolutely obliterate the Australian seafaring industry, particularly, particularly on our coastal trading, as you well know. We know when the first fleet came in. I don't want to get into a conversation about the first fleet, especially after the Prime Minister's debacle the other day. So mine is of good heart. Where someone once said, well, I'll tell you, it was a good mate of mine said to me that we had more ships in the first fleet. Uh, we had more ships in the first fleet than what we have plying Australia's domestic trade now. And I laughed and then I said, Mick, that wasn't funny. It's absolutely damn criminal. This government, I don't know. I don't know what I have to do to try and set an alarm clock in, uh, in uh, Minister McCormack's office that goes ding, ding, ding. It's now time to get out of bed, wake up, do the job you are handsomely paid for and actually start talking to uh, the shipping industry in this nation because, Mr McCormack, your title is transport. This may come as a shock to Minister McCormack, but you know what? It's not just road, it's actually not just air, it's rail and it's sea. And in this nation we have this damn bad, bad attitude of when we talk transport, we want to talk about road, rail and air, but we don't want to talk about sea. Coming back to the inquiry, Madam Deputy President, I can go for hours and hours and hours on this stuff because I have lived and breathed it for many years. But I was fortunate enough to go through and have another two hearings that we conducted at three, I think they were three in Canberra. Uh, unfortunately, Zoom is just the pits, but we had to do them over Zoom, the last two meetings. We heard we had some 30 submissions. We heard from uh, uh, stakeholders, and that's a funny word, but anyway, stakeholders in the shipping industry, predominantly ship owners and those who use shipping and the maritime unions who were absolutely magnificent. But there's some 28 recommendations that came out of this inquiry. And when you sit there and you think, in this nation here in Australia, we can't wait to talk up how great it is that our mining industry can pull out all these uh, um, um, minerals and resources that are owned by the Australian people and distribute them all around the world as long as it's not done by Australian seafarers. Okay, we've known that. We've known that for many years. The Blue Fleet has been under, uh, under attack for many, many years, the Blue Water uh, Fleet. But the exploitation, and it's come to the fore many times, uh, it's just getting worse and worse and worse because we don't know who's coming on these ships. We, this, not we, not me, unfortunately, I'm part of the parliament, but I'm not part of the LNP government that has seen off Australian shipping. You know, it just really irks me, but I'll touch on a couple of, a couple of recommendations that I will come back to later. And I know my colleague and very dear friend, 
uh, Senator Brown will be making a contribution when she gets her turn. But some of the recommendations that I want to share with the Senate that need to be explored and need to be discussed, and for God's sake, set a second alarm clock in Minister McCormack's office so in case he dozes back to sleep, we might be able to wake him up the second time. Foreign flag vessels, as I've said, these people are being foreign seafarers are being exploited. This is not new to this nation. We've had many, many examples of that. We've had uh, flags of convenience inquiries. The House of Representatives have been doing inquiries. My committee and the RAC committee have done a number of inquiries. Uh, gun runners and people murdered and people missing, foreign seafarers missing, exploited, earning nowhere near what Aussies make. But guess what? Aren't we wonderful because we're rubbing our greedy hands together because we can put more profits into the pockets of those at the top end of the corporation? And I just got to say this, Madam Acting Deputy President, God help us. What would happen to the dozy bob over the other side if Australia's farmers were all put to sleep because we brought in foreign farmers so we could pay them a lot less? Oh, isn't that interesting? They can't even lift their heads. They wouldn't lift their heads. Anyway, maritime tax concessions, another interesting area where we have to start talking about, and we need action on it. Background checks for our maritime crew visas, as I said. The exploitation of the maritime crew visas, establishing an Australian strategic fleet. Hasn't that frightened the living daylights out of that mob over there? Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to actually why would we want to train Australian seafarers? Why would we want to have the skills available to have our captains and our masters and our deckhands and our and our seafarers? Why would we want to give Australian businesses, because they're in shipping, the opportunity to purchase their own ships and ply their trade among our coastal ports? Why would we do that? Jeez, uh, 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 develop uh, uh, an Australian maritime cluster. This is another one. Labor actually wanted to talk about this. Labor actually went to the last election and said we would do this. This is not new. We'd also said we'd have a strategic fleet. And I remember Mr. Shorten saying some 12 ships. And it was absolutely it was exciting to think that someone actually does care. And here's another thing I want to say this, Madam Deputy President. This is, should, this is uh, uh, not, not on their radar because they're all asleep. But, um, you know what? When our magnificent navy actually gets hold of a ship, you know what actually happens? You know who does the sea trials, Madam Deputy President? This mob wouldn't know. It ain't the navy. It's not the navy. It's our, it's our domestic fleet. That's what, that, they're, they're the ones that come in and do all the trials. They're the ones. They're the ones that do it. Get it all ready so they can hand it over to the navy. But this mob over there are happy to see those skills just disappearing. Well, they're actually not. They're happy to see those men and women put out of work, those skills gone, so they can go to their mates and say, "You can bring in more exploited foreign seafarers, and with a bit of luck, no one will last. They get about three dollars a day. They don't laugh at that. That's, that's well known. You only got to talk to the ITF what goes on there." Um, but also, Madam Deputy President, we need a grown-up conversation. As I said, this winds me up. But what winds me up is we can't even have the grown-up conversation. We have now got a report, a report that's been a, hard, a lot of hard work's gone into it, where this nation now needs to sit down. And you know what? Shipping is just as damn important to this nation. I could probably say even more important, but that'll put me trucky, mates, uh, offside, and I'll probably put me mates working at Qantas who have all just been thrown on the scrap heap by that. So and so, Joyce. Uh, I put them off, and I might put my mates in the rail industry off because they're pretty important too. But it is our whole national supply chain. Guess what? It all moves around this nation, but it's got to move on. So it's got to get into the nation. It ain't coming over on pigeons and bloody. Oh, sorry about that. I do get wound up, Madam Deputy President, on pigeons or or balloons. How do you think the freight gets here, you mob? Comes over on ships for crying out loud. But I tell you, I'm not on the last couple of minutes that I've got to go. I will have a lot more to say about this. Another thing that's come up. Now, my old mate Ian Bray from the uh, Maritime Union of Australia has been saying to me for 10 years, with the exploitation and, and longer, the exploitation of foreign seafarers, the exploitation of the temporary voyage permits that this government throw out like confetti at a wedding. We'll have a flow and knock-on effect to the rest of our supply chain, our transport supply chain, and now it has. And I'll tell you what's come to the fore too, Madam Deputy President, and I'll be making a fair bit of noise about this, okay, because we have Australia's rail industry getting absolutely driven through to the ground. And Senator, Senator uh, Rice, I'm going to have a good conversation with you about this too. Because the freight that used to be on the trains from Brisbane to Perth, from Sydney to Perth, from Melbourne to Perth, from Parks to Perth, from Adelaide to Perth, is disappearing. The freight's still there. You know where it's going? Surprise, surprise. It's going on to foreign flagged vessels. 
temporary uh, voyage permits, exploited foreign seafarers, greedy corporations at the end of the day rubbing their filthy hands together because they can't make enough profit as it is. And this is a conversation this nation needs to have. I won't hold my breath on thinking that the current Minister for Transport would even have a clue what I'm talking about. I don't think he'd know a freight mode if it ran over his foot or hit him in the head. But if some of the backbenchers have got some way of getting the alpha suit off him so he can actually start doing his job because transport's in his, uh, uh, in his, in his pay packet, that's what he gets paid for. Hallelujah, Madam Deputy President. I'm only just starting. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Still. And Senator Still, oh, you want to speak on the same matter? Thank you, Senator Wright. Thanks, Deputy President. I also wish to take note of Document 55, the report of the inquiry into Australian shipping. And I wish to thank Senator Stirl to begin with for his passion and commitment at making sure that the issue of shipping stays on the agenda of this Senate. In the six and a half years I've been here, and I've been the transport spokesperson for the Greens, shipping has continued to be an issue that has just been dealt with atrociously by this government. We have seen the decline of Australian shipping. We have seen ongoing issues of severe exploitation of overseas workers who are working on foreign-owned ships. We have seen properly, um, proper conditions proper wages, proper good jobs in Australian, shipping's just go, in Australian shipping just go down the gurgler. And it doesn't need to be this way. There are plenty of other countries in the world that have got similar environments to Australia where they've managed to maintain a profitable shipping industry that actually employs workers under decent conditions and manages to make the most of the benefits of shipping of being a really good way of shifting goods, both domestically and internationally. But this government have just had their head in the sand about the reforms that are necessary to make that happen. I mean, when the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government came to power in 2013, we just had a change to shipping arrangements, which pretty clearly you know, it was an attempt to change things, but there were some problems with those arrangements. They needed some change. But rather than actually seriously sitting down with the Maritime Union of Australia, with the shipping industry, with all of the various stakeholders and nutting out what needed to happen to reform Australian shipping so it was going to work and look after the workers and look after the businesses and make most of the, the, um, the benefits of shipping, no, they've just pursued a deregulation agenda completely. Basically, happy to, say, to see Australian-owned shipping go totally down the gurgler and to see all of our shipping just being in the hands of foreign-run ships with incredibly exploited labour. I mean, we've seen the absolutely awful situation of the, the maritime workers who have been stuck on the coal ship on the outside of, of China for you know, months and months and months and just being left there as the meat in the sandwich. But basically the conditions that they are employed under are just appalling. So no one really cares what happens to those workers. They are just seen as expendable. The fact that they have been there suffering is, oh well, that's just what happens. You know, we've got trade disputes between Australia and China and the workers don't really matter. That's the state of, the, of foreign owned shipping. That this government seems to say is acceptable, that this government wants to see more of. It's just unacceptable. When, and we can do it differently. And this Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport report outlines some recommendations as to how to do it differently. And with the submissions that it received and with the hearings of all of the players in the industry, it outlines some ways forward which are agreed upon by a whole range of stakeholders. So, look, I urge the government to actually seriously sit down, Minister McCormack, sit down and have a really good read of this report and really think about what needs to happen if we're going to be serious about having a shipping industry that looks after workers, that thrives, that is there in fair competition with our rail and road industries rather than the current situation, which is just bad for everyone, totally bad for everyone, and is really 
and it, it just upsets me because it's something that things could be done differently if there was a willingness to sit down and work with the various stakeholders and work and implement some recommendations and move forward in a in a sensible sustainable and ethical way thank you uh, thank you senator rice senator um, still sought leave to continue his remarks are you happy to move that way so the question is that senator rice is seeking leave to continue her remarks those that opinion say aye against agreed um, so we are dealing with committee reports on page seven, we've dealt with 53 and 55. Are there any other reports there that people wish to take note of? Uh, Senator Sheldon, are you seeking the call? Right. Thank you, Deputy uh, President. May I also take note of item 59 on page seven of the order of business? And as a deputy chair of the inquiry, I commend this report to the Senate. I will not seek leave to continue. Uh, thank you, Deputy, Chair, uh, Deputy President. The Senate inquiry in tobacco harm reduction heard repeatedly that the most effective way to reduce rates of smoking prevalence in Australia is a combination of preventing people taking up smoking whilst also, uh, also helping people to quit. It was in this spirit that this report calls for Australia's approach to e-cigarette regulation not to neglect one of these objectives in the pursuit of the other. As such, the inquiry's majority report provides a fair and accurate summary of the evidence presented to the committee. It was conducted to the highest standards of integrity and impartiality and has provided a number of common sense recommendations to the Australian Federal Government. These recommendations range from the need for renewed investment in evidence-based strategies to reduce tobacco use and take, take up, in particular a new anti-smoking campaign, for the Australian Government and Parliament to continue to listen to and accept the advice provided by the Independent Therapeutic Goods Administration, the implementation of an evidence-based regulatory framework for nicotine, e-liquids, flavourings and colourings for use in e-cigarette devices, and continued support for independent research into the health effects of e-cigarette use. I want to put on record that I deeply value and appreciate the personal testimony provided to the committee by smokers, ex-smokers, e-cigarette users and other individuals, whether it was submissions, contacting my office directly or those who appeared at our public hearings. Your views and opinions were heard by all senators on the committee and were taken in, into consideration in the finalisation of this report. It is clear that a large number of e-cigarette users are people seeking to make positive improvements in their lives and health. We applaud them for taking action to quit smoking. There is no doubt that quit, quitting smoking is difficult. In many cases, it can take years and many attempts. It severely affects the health and well-being of thousands of Australians, as well, well as the lives of families and friends. It remains a leading cause of preventable death and disability in Australia, killing more than 15,000 Australians every year. Those who use e-cigarettes as a method to quit should not be treated as criminals nor forced to break the law. That is why this report supports a sensible, evidence-based, precautionary approach that streamlines and clarifies the legal pathways and avenues for obtaining nicotine for e-cigarette use. Such a pathway should be informed by the evidence and expert testimony. That is why the majority report submitted to the Senate recommends that the Therapeutic Goods Administration continues to oversee the classification of nicotine and the assessment of any e-cigarette product as a therapeutic good and the Australian Government and Parliament accept the Therapeutic Goods Administration advice. It has become quite trendy amongst some politicians to reject the advice of experts in matters such as health. and We've heard a lot of that about that today. Some politicians think their role in this place or in the House is to peddle the latest popular internal craze or conspiracy theory, instead of listening to the people with the years of experience and knowledge to advise in these areas. When it comes to health spreading, misinformation is not only irresponsible, it is dangerous. Labor is committed to the important and independent role of the TGA in the informing and setting policy in this and across the health space. 
Subsequent to our report, the TGA has made its decision with regard to the classification of nicotine that allows for a streamlined prescription pathway for its use in e-cigarettes as a form of smoking cessation. This decision presents the federal government with the challenge of ensuring that such a pathway is one that juggles the needs and well-being of e-cigarette users while preventing a new generation of young people becoming addicted or dependent on nicotine or tobacco. A number of senators on this committee were also rightly concerned with ensuring the inquiry was held to the highest levels of transparency and integrity in accordance with the principles set out in Article 5.3 of the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. These principles call on lawmakers to be alert, to, I quote, to be alert to any efforts by the tobacco industry to undermine or subvert tobacco control efforts. To fulfil our responsibility as signatories to this convention, I took it upon myself to ask a number of witnesses who had made submissions to the inquiry or appeared at either of our two public hearings to make de declarations about any links or assistance they have had with companies involved in the sale of tobacco. The declarations were now a matter of public record. The extent to which e-cigarette represents a disruption to the profits of tobacco industry was a point of much debate during this inquiry. However, one need only look to the paid advertisements placed by Philip Morris on the website of the Australian newspaper in December advocating for a deregulated e-cigarette market under the guise of science. The failure of previous governments to prevent the widespread addiction and death associated with the commercialisation of traditional combustible cigarettes is perhaps the greatest public health policy failing in the previous century. That the same companies that have been profited from lifetimes of addiction, illness and death are advocating for the broad commercialisation of e-cigarettes should give policymakers pause when considering the easing regulations around e-cigarettes. Taken in conjunction with the relative uncertainty regarding the relative harms of e-cigarettes or other associated products such as their colours or flavourings that most sensible approach is clearly a precautionary one. One that seeks to balance the possible benefits of e-cigarettes and its usage alongside the emerging harms. It is this precautionary approach that the majority of senators on the committee chose to endorse. The committee heard in, on multiple occasions that visiting a medical professional greatly improved the chances of an individual quitting smoking. It stands to reason that by locating access to nicotine for e-cigarette use within a medical setting can only improve any smoking cessation effect. Some have criticised the approach because no other country has yet adopted it. These people forget that the Australian, Australia has been a world leader on tobacco control measures and on the regulation of e-cigarettes we are again. Moreover, there is no international consensus with respect to how best regulate e-cigarettes. There are substantial differences in the way that these products are regulated across the United Kingdom, Europe, New Zealand, within the United States or across South America with mixed results. Indeed, across the ditch in New Zealand, there's more liberal laws regarding e-cigarette and has been in e cigarettes um, <clears throat> uh, regarding e-cigarettes has been a spike in their use amongst young people, as well as an increase in the youth smoking rate. The relatively short period of time in which these products have been available has not yet provided the sufficient longitudinal evidence to say conclusively whether these products are less harmful than traditional cigarettes at all. This alone should be the greatest argument for the continuation of a precautionary approach. Can I also thank my colleagues for their deliberations, for their input, for their attention in this very important matter. We also want to thank theirs as well as my own staff for their work on this inquiry, responding to correspondence and from stakeholders right across the debate, as well as helping us all get across all the important detail of this issue. Finally, can I also thank the committee secretariat, in particular Patrick and Caitlin, for their patience and attention to detail. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. So that concludes uh, docs. Uh, I believe that. Uh, yes. So the question is that the Senate take note. Those that opinion say aye. Against. Uh, 
believe that's carried. Uh, I believe there is a ministerial statement. Minister. I table documents relating to the following orders for production of documents concerning the MV Al Kuwait and the Federal Court and Federal Circuit Court Amendment Fees Regulations of 2020. Thank you. And I believe there are committee memberships. <clears throat> The president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thank you. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those from that, if that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, there are some messages. The president has received messages from His Excellency the Governor General notifying assent to 43 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Um, that concludes that, those matters, so I'm now calling the clerk. Government business orders of the day <clears throat> number one. Native title legislation amendment bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. When we um, last adjourned debate on this matter, I was about to take on um, some of the matters that have been raised by those opposite in relation to their concerns about this bill. And I'll take those through one by one. First, let me deal with the amendment that's been moved by Senator Thorpe on behalf of the Australian Greens. Now, the proposed amendment seeks to do two things. The first is to expand the scope of proposed section 47 capital C in schedule three to the bill and to omit, effectively delete, the remaining eight schedules of it effectively gutting it of most of its volume. The Australian government recognises the importance of engaging in good faith consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in, in relation to the decisions that affect them. So consistent with the principles under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we have endeavoured to make sure that can be given effect. The bill has been developed through careful consultation, extensive consultation, including with native title representative bodies, registered native title bodies corporate and other Indigenous stakeholders. It represents a balanced package of focused reforms supported by a broad range of stakeholders in the native title sector. And the bill is about delivering practical solutions that will ensure the native title system continues to meet the evolving needs of all stakeholders and, in particular, always in particular, traditional owners. The bill seeks to improve outcomes for native title holders by supporting the capacity of native title holders to control their rights in land through greater flexibility in internal decision making so that Native title holders are able to make their own decisions about how they do that in a way that works for them and their cultural practices. It seeks to improve outcomes for native title holders by improving claims resolution and agreement making processes and also by improving pathways for resolving disputes following the determination of native title. So the government considers that the form of this bill operates effectively to provide practical improvements to the native title system for all people involved in it and shouldn't be amended or delayed from being passed. I thought I might say some things about um, Section 47, capital C. Now, Schedule 3 will amend the Native Title Act to enable parties to agree to disregard the historic, historical extinguishment of native title over an area that has been set aside or vested to preserve the natural environment, such as a national a state or a territory park. Now, many native title holders have traditional and cultural connections to areas that are covered by national, state and territory parks, and we recognise that. We recognise its importance. This is therefore a focused and positive measure that is specifically seeking to enable 
native title rights to be recognised in those areas. The proposed amendment on sheet 1185, however, seeks to expand the operation of this provision to include other Crown land beyond park areas. Now, you might say, what's wrong with that? But it operates in isolation from understanding the rest of the Act around it. For instance, the Native Title Act already contains provisions which allow prior extinguishment of native title to be disregarded in circumstance, certain circumstances, like Section 47 deals with it in relation to pastoral leases. Section 47 capital A deals with it in relation to beneficial Aboriginal reserves, and 47 capital B deals with it in relation to vacant Crown land. So in many ways, that is a change um, in search of a problem. The current drafting of proposed Section 47 capital C that's contained in Schedule 3 of the bill has been subject to extensive consultation with a wide range of stakeholders, and it is strongly supported by native title holders. It wouldn't be desirable to expand the operation of that provision in the way that this amendment suggests it should without further consulting with all of those relevant stakeholders, without giving them their say, because it's important that all relevant stakeholders in the native title system, including, um, of course, native title holders, but also state and territory governments, get their chance to contribute. And that's particularly important given state and territory governments will be the primary government party to agreements required under proposed Section 47 capital C. This bill is a package of reforms responding to different interests of different stakeholders in the native title system. It wouldn't be a good idea, it wouldn't be desirable in the interests of those who participate in the system to split it from the reform package. In the time remaining, I might deal with um, a concern raised by Senator Dodson about um, the potential for continuing validity of Iliwas affected by fraud. The bill makes it clear that the validity of a future act done in accordance with a registered Indigenous land use agreement is not affected by the subsequent removal of that Iliwa from the register of Iliwas. Now, that amendment doesn't affect the present position at all. It only clarifies it. And additional material has been included in the replacement revised explanatory memorandum to make sure it is indeed crystal clear. These measures would implement recommendations made by the 2015 COAG investigation into land administration and use to clarify that the removal of details of Iliwas from the Iliwa register does not affect the validity of future acts done under it. Now, while that measure wasn't supported by the expert Indigenous working group advising the COAG investigation, further consultation with states, territories and relevant stakeholders was recommended. And then that consultation occurred during the development of this bill. So in a sense, the position has moved on from the point of the 2015 report. The objective of the amendment is to ensure that there is certainty to all parties around the validity of any acts that are done pursuant to an Iliwa which has been removed from the register, including, for example, in circumstances where the Iliwa has come to an end. It would be quite perverse if an Iliwa that's come to an end faced the invalidity of the acts done under it from that point onwards. There have been to date very few applications to the federal court to remove an Iliwa from the register on the basis of fraud and duress, and none of those have been successful. And there are several reasons why it wouldn't be desirable to retrospectively invalidate future acts under an Iliwa that's been obtained as a result of fraud or duress. First, the implications of such retrospective invalidation may be very complex and would raise difficult questions, such as, for example, whether benefits already received by the native title groups under the Iliwa should be recouped. And surely that wouldn't be a good thing for native title holders. Secondly, there may be parties who entered the Iliwa in good faith, who've done nothing wrong, who would nevertheless suffer as a result of the retrospective invalidation of that future act. And third, it may not be appropriate for all future acts covered by an Iliwa removed from the register to be invalidated. It's worth saying these measures don't affect a court's power under section 199 capital C of the Native Title Act to remove the details of an agreement from the register. And these measures do not affect the court's ability to deal with the effect of any fraud, any undue influence or any duress. 
I hope that assists those opposite to um, see the government's position on this matter. And if there are any further concerns about it, I'm happy to take that during the, the period for questions. The time remaining, I might just conclude with this. The government considers that despite significant progress, there is scope for improving the native title system to improve the recognition and management of native title rights and traditional lands. This bill demonstrates our commitment to the native title system, and I thank all senators for their contributions to the debate and commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that um, the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Is that sorry? Um, you requesting a division? Uh, uh, ring the bells for four minutes. <clears throat>
Lock the doors. So the question is, the motion as moved by the minister that the bill now be read a second time be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 36 ayes and nine noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So there has been an amendment. Oh. There has been an amendment circulated. So we'll, uh, I'll just call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to native title and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, Senator Patrick, Senator Dodson. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I'm glad you haven't confused me with Senator Patrick. Um, I. Uh, rise to uh, make clear the Labor is, uh, does not support the amendments put by the Greens, uh, and I seek to make a few comments in relation to that. This bill was introduced on the 17th of October 2019, some 15 months ago. Since that time, Labor has been consulting with affected communities and other stakeholders, including through a detailed Senate inquiry. It is unhelpful for significant amendments to be moved now at the last minute on the very day the bill is debated here. While we uh, do have concerns about certain provisions in this bill as to how they might operate in practice, there is general agreement from Indigenous stakeholders that this bill improves many aspects of the native title system and should now become law. 
We in Labor respect the wishes of those Indigenous and other Australians who have made it clear to us in numerous consultations that they want this bill now to become law. However, recognising the concerns raised by some stakeholders about certain measures in the bill, and in order to address any potential unintended consequences of these measures, as well as to address broader concerns about the operation of native title systems, Labor has obtained the agreement from, of the government that, before the end of five years following commencement of the measures in Schedule 6 of this bill, that an evaluation of the amendments introduced by this bill be conducted by the government and a report of that evaluation provided to the parliament. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, uh, June Oscar AO, will undertake a review of the Native Title Act, and the government has advised us that that review is expected to commence within 12 months. I appeal to the government and the parliament to respond positively to the social justice report when her review is completed. The aim should be to, uh, that that review be a comprehensive uh, review of the operations of the Act and on the impact of the rights of the native title holders, and to achieve amendments to the Act in the future that protect the native title rights of First Nations and ensure that the balance struck between competing interests is transparent and fair. The improvements of, to our, of our native title system along these lines is an opportunity to bring justice and honour to our nation. It is an opportunity we urge the government to seize. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. I have some questions for the minister. Uh, Minister, could you please uh, explain how this bill affirms the right of First Nations people to free, prior and informed consent? Minister, sorry. That's okay. Senator Thorpe, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, extensive consultation has been undertaken on the development of this bill. With a focus on traditional owners, including native title representation bodies, registered native title bodies, and other Indigenous stakeholders. So, the principles of free, prior, and informed consent have been implemented in this bill by engaging in good faith consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in relation to the decisions that affect them, consistent with the principles in international law under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So, the Native Title Act contains safeguards and rights to ensure that native title claimants and holders are notified, consulted and, in certain circumstances, have the opportunity to negotiate or enter into agreements before activities can occur on native title land. The primary source of these processes is the Future Acts regime in the Act, and that sets out requirements that must be met before development and other activities on native title land can be validly done. So most in most instances, the activities will trigger notification rights, but more substantive procedural rights are available in circumstances such as mining and exploration, for instance, tenure upgrades and compulsory acquisition. So in the case of mining and exploration, which um, I'm, I'm going to assume for the moment is something you might be interested in, um, the relevant native title holders or claimants have the right to negotiate with the proponent including negotiating for compensation for the impairment of their native title rights. And agreements concluded in this way are, as you know, I referred to as Section 31 agreements. Alternatively, the Native Title Act allows traditional owners to enter into an ILIWA, uh, which, as you know, are flexible agreements that can provide native title groups with a range of economic, social and cultural benefits that they negotiate. So there's a range of measures that are seeking to improve outcomes for traditional owners to including improving the autonomy and the control that native title holders have to make decisions around the use of their land. Um, and an example I can give you of that, for instance, is the measures which allow claim groups to impose conditions on the authority of their authorised representative, um, the measures which enable parties to disregard historical extinguishment of native title claims over certain areas like national parks are another example. Um, the ability to impose a condition on the authority of an authorised representative is, of course, particularly important 
um, because it allows um, the native title group to um, make rules according to their own custom about whether or not unanimous or majority or some other kind of decision-making threshold must be reached before um, a matter can go forward. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, the Law Council has concerns that this may be contrary to the right of First Nations people to self-determination and to exercise uh, to, and to the exercise of free, prior and informed consent. Why is the government proceeding with this when you have the Law Council uh, in disagreement and also uh, as a native title holder myself for two uh, areas of country in Victoria, uh, I certainly um, can say that there was no free, prior and informed consent there. Uh, so I have another question in relation to that. Good faith consultations. Could you also explain what that means? Minister. Thank you. I note what Senator Thorpe has to say about the submissions of the Law Council. Um, they have been taken into account, but the government's reached a view that um, is different to that which has been reached by the Law Council and has determined that um, there are sufficient mechanisms available for ensuring that um, native title holders are able to um, consider and exercise free prior and informed consent provided by the bill. The matter um, in the second part of your question is what good faith means, and good faith has its ordinary meaning at law. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. The pursuit of profit has led corporations to seek energy sources and resources impinging on Indigenous lands and water. Why is this government seeking to impose majority decision-making structures which are not, I repeat, which are not in line with our traditional practices over what happens on country? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, Senator Thorpe, this goes to the matter I raised just a moment ago, and that is that um, there remains at all times the opportunity for a um, native title group to impose whatever conditions they like um, upon the exercise of the process for their group. And that means that if the native title um, holders wish to, for instance, place a condition that says unanimous agreement is required, that is entirely within their power to do so, and um, their right to impose that condition remains always. The majority default rule that is established by this amendment is one that is um, displaceable at any time upon the placement of a condition by the very same native title group. So um, I trust that resolves your concern about that. It allows the decision-making to uh, about the threshold that needs to be reached to remain really always in the hands of the group um, that will be affected by the decision. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I ask the Minister, was the majority decision-making uh, process within the Native Title Bill a direct response to the McGlade case in WA? Minister. Yes. I think that's fair to say. Um, the McGlay decision did put into doubt um, the validity of Section 31 agreements and um, provided in effect that one needed unanimous um, agreement. Now, of course, that created some impracticalities because there were circumstances where, for instance, one or more of the native title holders had passed away and it wasn't practically possible to get the consent of that native title holder. Um, to a particular determination. So um, this is an arrangement that allows for a default of majority um, decision making, displaceable at all times upon the decision of the people affected by, um, the, by the determination to impose a condition that some other or higher threshold be imposed for their particular matter. So while the short answer is yes, 
Um, it's about providing certainty in light of the Maglay decision. It is certainty provided with the opportunity for native title holders to at all times maintain control about the thresholds that apply to them. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, could you tell me if the National Native Title Council supports this bill? I'll Minister. take that one on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Minister, could you also uh, inform me which mining companies uh, asked the government to fix this problem for them? Minister. Um, I'll take the, the detail of that on notice for you, but I can tell you that the consultation process that has been undertaken has not been one-sided, has involved um, all of the different groups that have an interest in the native title system. There has been um, public consultation on an options paper for native title reform that went from November 2017 through to February 2018. There was a second stage of public consultation, again open to anybody, on exposure draft legislation from October to December of 2018. Then meetings were held with key stakeholders across the country and over 80 submissions were received on both the options paper and the exposure draft legislation. Um, then an expert technical advisory group was convened by the government and it comprised of nominees from the National Native Title Council, the National Native Title Tribunal, the Federal Court of Australia and government and industry have also provided some technical assistance through the process of developing the bill, although as I understand it they weren't part of the expert technical advisory group. In March 2018, the government also held a roundtable with members of the National Native Title Council and other Native Title Corporations and representative bodies to discuss the reforms. Um, so, to the extent that Senator Thorpe, you're, you're concerned about the quality of the consultation process with all of those um, groups that are interested in the Native Title system, um, it has been um, multi-stage. It has been public so that anybody can participate, and it has been supplemented by um, the expertise of people who um, know how, I guess, to give technical effect to the matters that were the subject of those submissions. Um, but as to the detail of precise names, I'll take that on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, which mines do the Section 31 agreements which this bill seeks to retrospectively validate relate to, and how many are there? The, your question goes to retrospectivity, and um, I can, before I go to that, if it's okay, um, just clarify a matter I took on notice a moment ago. Um, and the National Native Title Council does support, um, based on the advice I've been given, the the bill. So um, I, I hope that's of use to you. As to the question of retrospectivity, um, the only measure in the bill that applies retrospectively is the validation of Section 31 agreements, and that goes to the matter raised by the decision in McGlade and the Native Title Registrar and others, of which um, Senator Thorpe, I know you're familiar. So for those listening at home, under that measure, Section 31 agreements who were entered into, that were entered into prior to the commencement of Schedule 9 will be validated, provided that at least one member of each relevant native title party is a party to the agreement. So Schedule 9 commences on the day after the Act receives the Royal Assent. This means that the validation of Section 31 agreements extends to the day after Royal Assent, if that makes sense. And this time frame was agreed with stakeholders during the consultation process on the basis that the effect of the Maglay decision on Section 31 agreements hadn't yet been tested, and so its impact and its effect was uncertain. Mm -hmm. And all parties um, who were a part of that stakeholder consultation process acknowledged that the uncertainty was um, not a desirable quality to continue. So, if you have further questions, I guess about retrospectivity, I, I can I can come back to that. But um, importantly, the amendments which allow 
the applicant to act by majority do not apply retrospectively. And the bill clearly provides that the ability for the applicant to act by majority applies only after the provisions commence. Um, that's at item 55, part 2, schedule 1 of the bill, if that reference helps, um, being six months after other provisions in the bill commence, and that's on a date to be fixed by proclamation. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and there was another question to that was uh, how many are there? So how many mines do the Section 31 agreements? Um, how many mines are are there, and what does that? How do they relate to this, Minister? Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The advice I can give you is that um, stakeholders across the sector um, indicated that there were hundreds of Section 31 agreements that might require validation as a result of the McGlade decision. Don't have a precise number, but um, the state governments, um, in particular, who were providing feedback through the consultation process, indicated that there were um, was a number in the hundreds. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, can you outline how much extra resourcing will flow to registered native title bodies corporate to support them to be able to deal with the added burdens imposed on them because of this bill? Thanks very much for the question. Um, the, the question of funding for, for PBCs or um, RNTBCs is um, one that is, is relevant. The Australian government, of course, as you know, provides support to native title corporations to meet their statutory obligations, to be continually improving their compliance with uh, good governance principles and um, to be always building their organisational capacity and their ability to um, have an ever-increasing um, ability to deal with governance arrangements. So the National Indigenous Australians Agency provides funding to a wide-reaching number of projects to support PBCs, including native title operations and management training delivered by the National Native Title Council and tailored governance training through a specialist training provider um, known as Shane Carroll Associates. PBCs can also access training, including accredited training for a certificate four in business governance through the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations. Thank, thank you, Minister. It being 7.20 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. The committee reports to the Senate. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Chandler. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Acting Deputy President. It is right to call the treatment of gender dysphoric children with puberty blockers experimental or innovative in the sense that there are currently limited studies and evidence of the efficiency or the long-term effects of the treatment. That's from a recent judgment of the English High Court. There is no other field of medicine where such radical interventions are offered to children with such a poor evidence base. That's from US psychiatrist Professor Stephen Levine in evidence to the English High Court. Children have been very seriously damaged. That's according to Dr David Bell, a recently retired senior psychiatrist at England's Tavistock Youth Gender Clinic. This is the expert evidence which is only now being allowed to come to light through the British media and court system. It was in 2018 that Dr Bell wrote an internal report warning that the Tavistock's Gender Identity Development Service was not fit for purpose and children's ends are being met in a woeful, inadequate manner and some will live on with the damaging consequences. Instead of being listened to, Dr Bell was subject to disciplinary action for raising these concerns. One of the governors of the clinic resigned, stating, In my 40 years of experience in psychiatry, I have learned that dismissing serious concerns about a service or approach is often driven by a defensive wish to prevent painful examination. He went further. The need to adopt an attitude which examines things from different points of view is essential. This is difficult in the current environment, as the debate and the discussion required is continually being closed down. It was not until two years later, when one of those young people who had been let down by this system went to the High Court, that the media and the public at large started to listen. 
That's two years in which large numbers of children were put through a service which has been described by its own senior clinicians as not fit for purpose and as having very seriously damaged children. Only last month, England's Care Quality Commission rated the Gender Identity Development Service as inadequate, highlighting the exact same concerns which whistleblowers have been raising for years. It said that records provided insufficient evidence of staff considering the specific needs of young people, such as autistic spectrum disorders. The service did not record how many patients had a diagnosis or a suspected diagnosis of an autistic spectrum disorder. Records did not demonstrate consideration of the relationship between ASD and gender dysphoria. Further, the Care Quality Commission explicitly stated staff did not always feel able to raise concerns without fear of retribution. How do Australian gender clinics rate on these measures? Well, we simply do not know. Although the concerns brought to the fore in the English High Court last December quite clearly have major relevance in Australia, there was muted or non-existent coverage in most of our major media outlets. To suggest, as some have done, that these are British issues with no relevance to Australia defies logic. Do Australian gender clinics have access to research about the links between gender dysphoria and autism spectrum disorder that are unknown to clinics in the UK? Do they have a scientifically based explanation for the explosion of in numbers of teenage girls presenting with gender dysphoria? Do they have records demonstrating proper consideration of other psychological factors before proceeding to irreversible medical interventions? Do they have records tracking the ongoing physical and mental well-being of patients 5, 10 or 15 years after being given puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones? How do they explain the increasing number of detransitioners? How do they align the experience of detransitioners with the oft-stated narrative that a distressed teenager asking for permanent physical alterations won't change their mind down the track? If Australian gender clinics and the state governments running them do have this data, it's obvious that they should release it so concerned medical practitioners, parents and the general public can see it. State governments are supposed to have this data, having conducted an audit and review of youth gender dysphoria treatment in the last year. Why haven't the results been released? Why is the Victorian government this week seeking to criminalise just speaking about the concerns that are being openly discussed in the UK, concerns that are shared by Australia's National Association of Practising Psychiatrists? Australia has a choice. Are we going to spend the years ahead pretending there are no legitimate concerns about teaching children that they can literally be born in the wrong body and then changing their bodies to fit that idea? Or will we listen to these concerns and demand this area of medicine be scrutinised transparently Thank and independently? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Wong. Thank you, um, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak on the passing of a beloved union and Labor comrade, George Wetherill, who died on Sunday, the 23rd of January 2021, at the age of 84. Uh, the South Australian trade union movement and the Labor family have lost a great union leader and a friend, a man who represented our party in the Legislative Council and father of our former Premier Jay Wetherill. George was born in Northern England in the late 1930s and he grew up in the shadows of the Great Depression uh, and endured the trauma of World War II. The experiences of poverty and inequality were harsh to an extent difficult to comprehend today, and they forged the values that guided George and many others through their lives. George was relentlessly optimistic, some might say despite the challenges he faced. I suspect it was perhaps because of them. He was from a working family from Hartlepool in northern England, one of ten. They lived through the bombing raids and he lost his father young. Perhaps that hardship generated in him, rather than uh, pessimism, that relentless optimism, accompanied by both shrewdness and pragmatism. After arriving in Australia in 1960, it did not take long for George to establish himself as a leader in the trade union movement. Uh, and in fact, at, the, at one of the eulogies, it was recounted the story that he was elected a delegate despite not actually being there, just because he was the pommy bloke who must know something about trade unions. So, as I said, he was elected a shop steward at the South Australian ENWS, 
Engineering Water Supply Department for the Australian Government Workers Association, known as the AGWA. And over the next quarter of a century, he won elections to offices, various offices within the union. In doing so, he played a critical role in setting the political direction of that union and establishing a political legacy that continues to this day. When George became involved in the AGWA, it was in control by the right, and it was a union that was regarded as too passive to deliver to its own members. George became a key player, supporting left allies to take control on the, of the union. The response from the right at the time was brutal, and George garnered extraordinary respect amongst comrades and members by staring down threats of violence and by, for his capacity to bring others with him. The eventual victory of the left Paved the, in that, within that union, paved the way for the development of a union that would become and remains one of the most important agents for progressive change within South Australian politics. The change in leadership and philosophy in the AGWA brought about through the, uh, the actions of many, including George, smoothed the way for a merger with the Miscellaneous Workers Union, Workers union the MISOs, the predecessor of what is known as the United Workers Union. And this amalgamation cemented its place as one of the most important agents of progressive change in our state, a position it has held ever since. And it has provided a base of support to elect progressive candidates like Mark Butler, Jay Wetherill and me into parliament. Before my own generation, George also gathered support to win a fiercely contested ballot and filled a vacancy in the Legislative Council where he served from 1986 to until 2000. George Wetherill always knew who he was and always remembered where he came from in every aspect of his life, including his work in the parliament. He had a powerful sense of justice and he was moved to correct injustice wherever he found it. He was a man of great courage and seamlessly, seemingly boundless optimism. Perhaps he was the happy warrior poetry says we should all wish to be, an unflinching defender of the rights of working people and their families. And he was also a first-class strategist whose struggles helped build a multi-generational legacy for progressive politics in South Australia. I want to place on record my sincerest sympathy uh, to his family and friends, his wife, Joy, uh, uh, his children, uh, Jay, Dana and Lee, uh, their partners uh, and his grandchildren. And I particularly want to place on record my acknowledgement uh, of uh, how hard this must be for his son, particularly Jay Wetherill, uh, who, for whom George uh, was such an important figure, uh, and to say to Jay and to his family uh, that we uh, are with you in this loss uh, and that George's legacy continues to this day. Hear, hear. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise this evening to speak on the government's intention to return the job seeker payment to $40 a day. Despite, despite still being in the midst of a pandemic and a recession, in just 58 days this government will end the job seeker COVID supplement, condemning over a million Australians to a payment of $40 a day. The COVID supplement, first introduced at the rate of $550 a fortnight in March 2020, transformed people's lives and lifted millions out of poverty. It was the first time that the unemployment payment was a rate above the poverty line in 25 years. The COVID supplement of $550 a fortnight enabled people on the job seeker payment, youth allowance and parenting payment to be able to afford nutritious food three meals a day, children's school activities, essential medications, housing costs, new clothing and shoes, heating and cooling, amongst other things. Since March last year, my office has been contacted by many, many people who have shared with us the impact on their lives of, for once, being able to live above the poverty line because of this $550 COVID a fortnight COVID supplement. I want to share with the Senate the positive impacts of no, living, no longer li living below the poverty line and having to choose between paying rent or buying groceries. And these are the lived experiences of people who have outlined their um, circumstances to us. 
With the increase, we could afford to make necessary repairs to our only car. We didn't have to stress about going to the doctor or affording the medication we needed. We were able to pay off our credit card debt completely. Every cut back in the payment has meant an increase in our financial stress. It won't be long before our credit card debt climbs again as we try to make ends meet. Because of the increase, we are able to afford better quality groceries. I was able to buy new clothes for the first time in years. I have health issues, so I could afford to get a cab or Uber to a doctor's appointment during the pandemic rather than taking the bus. Another person said, I was able to get my car serviced and pay a bunch of bills. I was able to happily look for work knowing I didn't have to worry about affording petrol money or lunches. I got casual work, which was just enough for me to do, but the money was low. The supplement helped me retain a proper wage and keep a roof over my head. Another person. With the $550 COVID supplement, I was able to buy food, pay my bills and pay for my medications. The job seeker rate without the COVID supplement, uh, it, with the, with the uh, job seeker rate without the COVID supplement, it was either pay the rent or buy food. So it was always came down to paying the rent. Another person. The rise in the job seeker rent, rate during COVID meant that I could buy my own food and ceased going to the salvos for food. I could also pay my rates, water and electricity bills. I was, thank I was thankful now, I thankfully now have a casual job but you never know what's going to happen, especially with COVID. The old rate was inhumane. I went to see a dentist for the first time in my entire adult life. I got my car rego paid without having to take money out of my food budget. I actually had a budget that wasn't in negatives. I was able to replace some of my oldest furniture with a good quality replacement that will last longer than something cheap. Besides that, we all spent the money. We all kept the economy going. Honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do now. These are the lived experience of people who had been trying to exist on the previous job seeker payment. We are still in a pandemic. We are still in a recession. You heard what people have said, how the supplement improved their lives. So they didn't have to choose between paying the rent and buying food, so they could go to the dentist, so they could actually take steps that helped improve their employment prospects. Taking this payment back to $40 a day condemns people to poverty and makes it even harder for them to find work. Permanently increase the job seeker payment so we no longer condemn people to this abject poverty. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Tonight I rise to acknowledge our 2021 Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, and also recognise her fellow Tasmanian 2021 Australian of the Year Award winners, Brian Williams, Toby Thorpe and Edna Pennicott. The Australian of the Year Awards celebrate the achievements and contributions of eminent Australians. These four Tasmanians are worthy representatives of my home state and important role models. It is an honour to be able to share their accomplishments with you tonight. In taking up her title as Australian of the Year, Grace Tame became the first Tasmanian to hold this honour. A dedicated advocate for survivors of sexual assault, Grace came to national attention via the Let Her Speak campaign when she applied to the Supreme Court for the right to identify herself as a sexual abuse survivor. She became the first Tasmanian woman to do this and has since used this platform to push for legal reform and raise public awareness about the impact of sexual violence. It takes incredible courage to tell anyone that you were groomed and raped by your 58-year-old maths teacher from the age of 15, but Grace reported that abuse to police and ensured her abuser was brought to justice. Under Tasmania's sexual assault victim gag laws, Grace was unable to legally speak about her experience publicly even though her abuser and the media could. So she pushed for that to change. Since then, Grace has told her story over and over again in advocating for others who survive sexual abuse, particularly those abused in institutional settings. 
As a result of the Let Us Beat campaign and Grace Tame's legal case, the Tasmanian government last year amended section 194K of the Evidence Act 2001 to allow victims the right to speak publicly. When accepting her award in Canberra last week, Grace said, and I quote, well, hear me now, using my voice against a growing chorus of voices that will not be silenced, end quote. Through one brave act after another, Grace Tame has gone from being silenced by her abuser and the law, known through the ultimate anonymous moniker of Jane Doe during legal proceedings, to being recognised as the 2021 Australian of the Year. Congratulations, Grace. Brian Williams is the Tasmanian Senior Australian of the Year, winning this title for his more than 50 years of tireless service to Scouts. Under his leadership, Blackman's Bay Scout Group has become one of the largest and most successful groups in the state, with Brian mentoring thousands of young people in this time. Taking this a step further, Brian has trained and supported more than 100 Venture Scout leaders since 1983. He also organised the first Australian venture held in Launceston, with young people from around Australia and overseas spending 12 days filled with fun activities. Tasmania's Young Australian of the Year, Toby Thorpe, advocates for youth empowerment and climate action. Toby's leadership in this space helped Hewanville High School win the International Zaid Sustainability Prize. He organised the first statewide Climate Leaders Conference and led the Tasmanian Youth Delegation for the United Nations Climate Change Conference. Young people have a better understanding of their power to positively impact the world through the example and leadership demonstrated by Toby. And following on from her recognition in last year's Queen's Birthday Honour List, Kingborough Helping Hands founder Edna Pennicott was named the Tasmanian Local Hero. Kingborough Helping Hands provides care packages of food and other essential items to people in the local area facing financial hardship. Edna collects the goods to make up the packages herself and personally delivers many of them. She also runs the after hours mobile van service that provides hot food and support to people sleeping rough recently winning the inaugural Aurora Energy Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of her 40 years of dedicated service to the community. In Grace, Brian, Toby and Edna, Tasmania has outstanding ambassadors to share our community's message with a wider audience. Each of these four Tasmanians have worked for years to challenge attitudes and advocate for others, and I know Tasmanians are proud and grateful for the service they each provide. Nominations are now open for the 2022 Australians of the Year Award. I encourage everyone in this place or listening around the country to identify an inspiring Australian who deserves to be recognised for their efforts and then take that next step and nominate them. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, 2020 is done. Uh, and it was a tough year for all Australians. And 2021 will have its own challenges. There are over 2 million people who don't have a job or don't have enough hours to get by. But if there's one thing that I heard over the summer, it's that people desperately want 2021 to be better. They want hope from their government. They want a plan from their government. They want to rebuild jobs and they want to get our country moving. They want us to rebuild our manufacturing jobs. They want us to get on with the task of creating clean energy jobs, to fix the crisis in aged care, to bring down the price of early childhood education. They want all Australians to have the opportunity that a good, secure job can bring including those essential workers who were so critical to getting us through this pandemic, but who are so often undervalued in their pay packet. And Australians want a government that is on their side. But what is Prime Minister Scott Morrison serving up in 2021? Pay cuts, super cuts, job keeper cuts and job seeker cuts all at the same time. And just as they're about to cut those crucial financial supports, they're trying to introduce laws that will cut workers' wages. This week, Scott Morrison talked about a comeback, but his plans for this year are actually cutbacks. 
cuts that will leave entire regions and communities struggling without JobKeeper support, cuts that will send job seekers back to an absolutely unlivable $40 a day, cuts to wages by getting rid of protections for penalty rates, for overtime, for shift rates, allowing employers to push people back to the minimum wage just at the time that people are doing it incredibly hard. Cuts to super savings by freezing the legislated super increase. So right now the government is telling Australians if you're doing it tough, you need to do it even tougher. You need your support slashed, you need your wages slashed, you need your super savings slashed. This is not just nasty policy, it's bad policy. It's just plain wrong policy. Ripping wages and incomes out of our struggling communities will not get them back on their feet. It will put workers and local businesses on the back foot. You cannot cut to create jobs. We've just been through the biggest economic shock in 100 years, and this government is more focused on punishing Australians than it is on creating jobs. Punishing Australians instead of getting wages moving and getting money back into local businesses. Punishing Australians instead of creating more secure jobs for our essential workers and indeed for all Australians. And it doesn't have to be this way. Our road to recovery should support all Australians. Our road to recovery should be built around practical solutions that help people, not hurt them. It should be built on a big, bold plan for our future, a plan that has good and secure jobs at its heart, a plan that looks out for all Australians. We believe, on the Labor side, in making this country better. We believe in improving people's lives. This week, Scott Morrison admitted he has no real reform agenda for this country. On our side, we believe in the power of government to make things better. This is why Labor is focused on improving access to early childhood education. It's why we're focused on a big comprehensive plan to invest in social housing. It's why Labor has a plan for Australian manufacturing, for bringing down energy prices, for creating green energy jobs, for supporting working women, for fixing the aged care crisis and delivering a dignified retirement, for training apprentices and skilling up workers for new opportunities, for delivering the good, secure jobs that Australians need. Australians don't want to go back to January 2020, to a time before COVID-19. They want us to deliver more than that. They want us to deliver hope. They want us to deliver a better future. A 2021, that is better than 2020, and Labor wants that too. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In recent weeks, Google made an explicit threat to deny service to Australians if this parliament passes the media bargaining code. It is an outrageous threat for a business to make against Parliament. It is pathetic and desperate, but hardly surprising because what Australia proposes terrifies them and may inspire other countries to follow suit. This isn't the first time powerful monopolies have tried to intimidate parliaments and people. For example, 150 years ago, in the age of the robber barons, industries were dominated by monopolies and their ruthless owners. Their names are still familiar to some of us today. Carnegie, Ford, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt. Each of these men turned a business into a cartel and a monopoly. They used their dominance to extract wealth from their customers and from their communities. Each of these men became unimaginably wealthy and used their wealth to influence and become powerful. Each of these men intimidated politicians to serve their personal interests rather than the public interest. They could forge these monopolies because there was no law to prevent it. Governments needed laws, new laws and new tools to fight the robber barons. The US got them in the Antitrust Act of 1890, which prohibited anti-competitive conduct and criminalised the formation of cartels. 
It took many years to apply the new law and break the great monopolies, but once the tools were available, it was only a matter of time. And of course, other countries, such as Australia, followed suit with their own laws. The robber barons of our time are not Standard Oil or Union Pacific, but Google, Facebook and a number of other tech giants. They control the modern digital monopolies and exploit them ruthlessly, earning immense profits in the process. Just as with the cartels and monopolies of the past, government today lacks the right tools to fight them. Our competition policy is designed around consumers and the prices they pay. The tech giants escape this regulation because they charge individual customers nothing and extract the wealth of suppliers, particularly small business. We need to rethink our regulatory framework to ensure that digital markets are free, fair and competitive. Until that happens, we need legislation that provides transparency about how tech giants are tracking users and how they are profiting from the data. So later this year, I intend to introduce a bill to give Australians a digital right to privacy. I will say more on this in due course. I expect Google and others will continue their threats to leave Australia if such legislation is passed. I don't believe them. Unlike the great monopolies of the past, digital dominance depends on network effects. Pulling out of Australia will create a place for startups to develop, scale and commercialise new products free from the interference of big tech. Google cannot afford to give other businesses a toehold to challenge their dominance. Theirs is an empty threat. They want to bully Parliament into serving their interests rather than the public's interests. It will not work. Before I came to this place, I had a long career in business. I've seen the benefits that private enterprise can bring to people and to communities. But those benefits only come with competition. When there is no competition, when a business becomes absolutely dominant, it stops benefiting the community and starts exploiting the community. That's what we often see today in big tech. Their immense wealth comes through exploiting the communities they supposedly serve. And when new laws put even a fraction of that wealth at risk, they respond with bullying and with threats. It is time for this parliament to act. Time to pass the media bargaining code. Time to give Australians a digital right to privacy. Time to create a digital market that is free, fair and competitive. Senator McLaughlin. Acting Deputy President. Unmoved he heard the evening hymn of hate. Unmoved would gaze into his master's eyes. For all the sorrows men for men create, in search of happiness, wise dogs despise. Finding ecstatic joy in every rag and every smile of friendship worth a wag. Honourable Senators, I have just read a few words from the beautiful poem by Major Edward de Stein, late of the Royal, King's Royal Rifles, titled Elegy on the Death of Bingo, Our Trench Dog. It was written in World War I and it is estimated over 50,000 dogs accompanied armies on both sides of that terrible conflict. I wish to bring to the attention of honourable senators the great work the Royal Society for the Blind is doing in Adelaide and which has national significance. I understand the first archaeological evidence of domesticated dog is, 10, year, is in a 10,000-year-old grave in Greece which contained human remains and that of a puppy. Human and dogs have evolved together and become partners for their mutual benefit and sustenance. The bond has not been broken despite the passage of time. Even today we rely on dogs to keep our soldiers safe and also to bring joy to the life of our old soldiers. For the last seven years, the Royal Society for the Blind has expanded its internationally accredited assistance dog program to support veterans who have been clinically diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. Their program has been given the title Operation K9. The Society was founded in 1884 by Sir Charles Good and Andrew Hendry who himself was blind as a child. It was called the Institute for the Blind 
and became later the Royal Society for the Blind in 1974. The organisation provides services to over 11,000 South Australians who are blind or vision impaired. As of January 2021, their Operation Canine has provided 42 dogs to veterans and has a near 100 per cent success rate in matching dogs to those veterans in need. These assistance dogs are individually trained to perform tasks such as interrupting destructive behaviours, as well as providing comfort, support, independence and social interaction. Each dog's training is tailored to the individual veteran's needs, including even retrieving medication. Clinical research undertaken by the University of Adelaide Centre for Trauma Research has demonstrated that within six to 12 months of receiving an assistance dog, veterans were reporting a 20 to 45 per cent improvement in their social and family functioning, a 20 to 40 per cent decrease in depression and anxiety, and a 40 per cent increase in their mobility and exercise habits. Veterans are motivated, motiv motivated into healthy action for the love of their dog. The average cost to train a dog is around $40,000, and the program is currently supported by the Department of Veterans Affairs until April 2021 for the supply of 10 dogs. A recent recipient of a Royal Society for the Blind Dog supported through the Department of Veterans Affairs has remarked, Zena has just been wonderful for me. She has made me feel calmer, more settled, and my housemates have commented already on the changes in me. She has kept me close at night, and I just feel more grounded and less anxious with her by my side. When I go to uni, she has made me feel more comfortable as a part of the crowd and better able to engage with my fellow students. Late last year, I had the opportunity to visit the training centre for the Royal Society for the Blind, where I met Ivan, a veteran, and his wife, Vera, who spoke to me about the incredible difference their dog, Wattle, has made to both their lives. It was a moving experience to hear their story. Wattle was the most beautiful of dogs, calm, attentive and loving. Wattle was the living embodiment of that loving and supportive trench dog that Major de Stein lionised in his poem. However, however, unlike Wattle, the trench dog lovingly described in the poem, Banjo, never played with children on clean grass nor dozed beside the glowing embers, for he was born amid a world of war. Banjo gave comfort in war. Wattle gives comfort after the guns have gone silent and the wounds need healing. I encourage honourable senators to support this initiative. I congratulate the government for investing in a program that provides so much benefit to veterans who are on their own difficult journey to heal themselves of the scars of war. Senator Chikone. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Australia has lost more defence force personnel to suicide than we have lost on the front line. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has reported that the rate of suicide among male veterans is 21 per cent higher than that of the general male population. For ex-serving women, the rate of suicide is twice as high as the general female population. Over the past two decades, there have been more than 460 suicides and in 2018 alone, there were 33 deaths by suicide among serving and ex-serving Defence Force personnel. For every veteran who has died, there are families that are left behind who are grieving. It is a national tragedy, and it's a national tragedy that this government is also failing to act upon. For years now, veterans and their advocates have been raising concerns about the level of suicide with the Australian government. They have shared their stories about the sons and daughters that they have lost and that they have been asking for a royal commission. Instead of delivering a royal commission, the coalition government has offered a flawed and an inadequate national commissioner. Without independence, without the appropriate governance arrangements, one that completely fails to include the most recognised and the significant risk factors for death by suicide. The Prime Minister said that the National Commissioner would be bigger and better than a Royal Commission, but it turned out 
to be nothing more than an empty promise. The government offered less than half the resources that would be allocated to a Royal Commission. Less funding, less staff and less power. And now veterans and their families will be forced to wait even longer for answers as the coalition government has withdrawn its national commissioner legislation. The Liberal and National government have shown themselves time and time again completely unable to deliver real results, real change and real reform for our nation and its people, and especially those who serve our nation. This is just another example of this government's failure to act. Mr Acting Deputy President, I've had so many people call my office and share their stories of losing loved ones, sadly, to suicide, especially those in the veteran community who have served our nation with great distinction. They have come to this place here in Canberra. They have stood on the lawns of Parliament House, directly above this chamber. They have shed tears under this roof of this building. They have asked us, as representatives of our community, to prevent any further loss of life. When I talk to veterans and their families, as I did recently on Australia Day, I hear about their contributions to our community, made by so many, by so many amazing people. So often, these contributions continue well after a veteran's active service ends. A wonderful example of this contribution is Operation Veteran Assist, which I've spoken about previously here in the Australian Senate. Operation Veteran Assist mobilised dozens of veterans and volunteers at very short notice to go out to Gippsland and help with the bushfire recovery efforts from last year. I find it enormously difficult to reconcile the fact that the coalition government are handing out contracts to former government staffers to produce slick PR videos spruiking recovery efforts in Gippsland and the broader region, while there are bushfire victims still waiting for funding, still waiting to receive the funding so they can recover and build their livelihoods. They are living in caravans, they are living in sheds, and they've spent less than half of the recovery funding that was promised. And at the very same time, they are denying Thank you, veterans uh, Senator a royal. Your time has expired. Um, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. And I rise to speak about one of the Central Coast's most resilient, uh, most beautiful, and yet perhaps our most underserviced community. And I'm, of course, speaking about the mangrove mountain community and the surrounding mountain districts, who have been neglected, dare I say, abandoned by their local member, Lucy Wicks, who is missing in action. The residents of mangrove mountain have been failed by a succession of federal liberal governments. They've certainly been failed in the area of the NBN rollout and further have been failed by telecommunications providers that have left the entire community without regular or reliable connectivity for their computers or their mobile phones. Despite being a mere 76 kilometres away from Sydney CBD, residents have told me that the telecommunications infrastructure in Mangrove Mountain has gone backwards backwards in the last 20 years. One resident even wrote me that his ancestors' homing pigeons would be faster and more reliable than their current internet connections. This lack of infrastructure affects the education, healthcare and social lives of the mountain residents. It affects payment times, FPOS terminals and online salesability uh, for these small businesses. And it breaks my heart when I hear great local business leaders who are trying to grow, who are 
employing people who have jobs on their books that cannot be filled because they cannot function properly as businesses because of this government's failure to provide them with basic infrastructure fit for the 21st century. The community also indicated to me that the current state of affairs on the watch of this Liberal National Party government affects the community's ability to live lives of dignity, lives of connectedness. In an increasingly isolated world with lockdowns, AI customer support and growing preference for Zoom over face-to-face -face interactions, the lack of appropriate digital and telecommunications infrastructure can only make our society more divided, more lonely, more stratified. These people cannot get in contact with their service provider. They spend hours and hours on the telephone line waiting for a response, and when they get there, then it drops out. Or they're subject to just you know, answering standard questions, and failure to respond is common. This is a community that's been taken for granted by the local member Lucy Wicks, and despite winning over 72 per cent two-party preferred at the Mangrove Mountain booth, in 2019, she's refused all calls to visit the area since the election, and she is even refusing to reply to emails or letters from desperate residents asking for her help to secure adequate functioning communications infrastructure. The Liberals and Nationals just do this. They just take regional communities for granted. They show up at the communities every three years, they take the votes, and then they disappear till the next election rolls around. Well, not anymore. Not on the mangrove mountain anymore. This community is sick to death of being taken for granted. Malcolm Turnbull and the Liberal Party gutted the NBN, which would have been a great leveller of the tyranny of distance that so plagues our rural and regional communities. Instead, this government, under a different leadership but with the same temperament, rolled out a terrible copper nightmare in Australia has gradually slipped down the internet speed in world rankings in terms of those speeds from 60, uh, to 68th position out of seven, 177 countries when we were formerly up at 20. That's a massive decline in capacity for this country. We cannot build the knowledge-based economy of the future or truly unleash our regional economies until we provide them with the digital justice that they deserve. I was welcomed into the historic Mangrove Mountain Community Hall on the 14th of November, along with my rock star state colleague, Liesl Tesh, to listen to over 60 mountain residents speak about neglect by this government and how the lack of digital infrastructure affects the way that they work, learn and relax every single day. I listened to them. I heard their passion for their community and their desire to make it more livable and vibrant place. I promised them I would fight for digital justice, and I'm here, just, here tonight doing just that. We've already had some success in securing an MBN drop-in session this year for residents, and Labor will keep fighting to ensure that that community is not Thank overlooked you, and that they are hosted Senator with similar sessions. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Let us never forget those among us who face challenges every minute of every day that we cannot possibly even imagine. People who have reached a stage in their lives where continuing to live day to day presents challenges beyond their capability and even makes end of life a blessing and outcome they seek. One of those people is David Bedford, who recently wrote to me, and I know you're watching this, David. Describing David's situation is best done by quoting him directly. David says, and I quote, I would like Anastasia Palaszczuk to please consider legalising euthanasia for all Queenslanders. I am a 38-year-old incomplete quadriplegic who has been in the pain for the past 18 years. In 2002, I crashed my car driving home from work as a chef at Pier Restaurant in Sydney, sustaining a closed head injury, a neck injury, at C2. The ambulance drivers, who were first on scene at that night, gave me a Glasgow coma reading of three. <clears throat> this scale rates a patient's level of consciousness, and it goes from 1 to 15, with one being dead on arrival two being dead soon after arrival, three being if they are within 15 minutes of a hospital, they would get rushed there all the way up to 15, which is fully awake and conscious. I was rated three and was 14 minutes from St Vincent's Hospital. I wish I had died that night, and if I had an advanced health directive in place, I would have. It, the advanced health directive, would have instructed doctors to turn off the life support machine, saving me from 18 years of pain. 
I would have been remembered for who I was and not who I've been turned into. Whilst in a coma on life support, I got a severe bed sore as big as a grapefruit on my tailbone and one on each of my heels that ate away all, down, all the way down to the bone. Although they've now healed, the scars cause me excruciating pain as there are lots of severed nerve endings that I have no choice but to lay on 24 hours a day. Because I only fractured my spine and bruised my spinal cord, I still have full feeling in all of my body, unlike complete quadriplegics who can't feel anything below their level of injury. Six years ago, I got so desperate to end my pain, I wrote an advanced health directive and tried to starve myself, but nurses turned me away from the hospital stating Australia doesn't support euthanasia. I have thought of many ways in which I could end my life, but unfortunately, a lot of those ways involving being assisted by another person which would burden that person with legal ramifications for their actions. This is why I think Queensland must legalise euthanasia, because desperate people do desperate things. Until recently, I wasn't concerned about Australia euthanasia laws because I had an option to go to Switzerland, which allows tourists to utilise their euthanasia programs. However, with the onset of COVID, it has taken away my options. I'm in no hurry to end my life, as I've grown accustomed to tolerating pain and knowing dignitatis was an option for me, gave me great comfort, but without knowing how long these lockdowns will be in place, I am much more likely to go to Switzerland as soon as flights open again. You could prevent this by legalising euthanasia, not only for the terminally ill, but for anyone suffering in pain. Please don't model your euthanasia law on Victoria's law, as it's been described as the most conservative euthanasia law of all the countries that have legalised it. There's no reason to limit it to people in the last six months of their lives dying of a terminal illness unless it's just to be cruel. I know I'm not the only person suffering in pain like this, and giving people pain-killing drugs does not always eliminate their pain. I am given multiple medications on a daily basis to try to alleviate my pain. Unfortunately, after 18 years of taking these medications, I have built up a tolerance and now find those painkillers ineffective. Even with those pain medications, I feel like I have a knife stabbing into my tailbone. I have extra medications that I can request when pain increases, but I can only have that every 12 hours, and it's ineffective, and its effectiveness is questionable. I asked my doctor to increase the strength of my pain relief, but he said that would put me at risk of having a heart attack. I said I'm OK with that risk and would sign a letter absolving him of any responsibility, but he said that would go against his Hippocratic oath to do no harm. Shouldn't I have the right to not be living in pain? I have the full support of my mother, who said, if she ever found out she had cancer, she would help me end my life. Shouldn't the state have the responsibility to legalise euthanasia and not leave it up to my mum getting cancer? We are living in the 21st century after all. To conclude, David said, to conclude, says David, if you take just one thing away from this speech, consider completing an advanced health directive of your own. So if you're ever in a coma, it would give your doctor direct instructions of your wishes. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you. <clears throat> the last time the Prime Minister visited Cairns was to campaign for the LNP in the Queensland state election. When he was there, he told Far North Queenslanders that he would have their back. But now that thousands of workers in far north Queensland are about to lose their jobs, the Prime Minister is nowhere to be seen. This is a Prime Minister who turns up when he needs you, but turns his back when you need him. We know in Cairns 3,600 businesses are currently relying on JobKeeper. That is more than any other postcode in Queensland, and it's more than most of Australia's big capital cities. It is an extraordinary number, and it indicates the level of support required to support businesses and jobs heavily reliant on tourism and heavily reliant on international tourism. Because we know it has been over 12 months now since this government closed international borders. And we understand that there was a health imperative to do that. 
but it has been a long slog, a long slog for businesses and workers in far north Queensland. And two weeks ago, the former Chief Health Officer, Brendan Murphy, told reporters that it would be unlikely that international tourism would start until next year. So it could be 24 months before international tourists set foot in Cairns again. These businesses, let me be clear, are making decisions right now about whether to make workers redundant. They are not waiting until the 30th of March. And this government cannot wait, cannot wait until the 30th of March to tell these workers what the plan is to support their jobs. It certainly hasn't helped that they have been getting mixed messages from government MPs about what the support might look like. Only a couple of weeks ago, local MP Warren Ench, the member for Leichhardt, told people in Cairns that extending JobKeeper was a no-brainer. He said that the support would be there until it was needed. But now we know that what he was doing was telling people in Cairns one thing when the Treasurer and the Prime Minister had another idea. They won't be there to support far north Queenslanders when they need help. They will not be extending JobKeeper and they will not be supporting the thousands of jobs that are currently on the chopping block in Cairns. These mixed messages have certainly not helped. And the uncertainty about future support is not helping either. At the moment, there's been some vague uh, a notion about getting some sort of package together, speaking to tourism operators. But there is nothing on the table from this government. If you're a tourism worker in far north Queensland right now, you do not know what this government's plan for your job is. And today, the minister representing the tourism minister cited many types of funds and grants and all of these things that were announced in the budget to try to help regional tourism. But I bet if we scratch the surface of these programs that have been announced, none of that money has been spent. Because most of that money was marketing money. Marketing money to who? Marketing money to tourists that cannot come to Australia, that cannot come to Cairns. That money has not been spent. And the grants have only just opened. So this is a government that makes big promises and fails to deliver. And they've done it again when it comes to tourism workers. They've got their list of grants and programs that they like to read off in question time. But what they do not have is a plan for these jobs and for these businesses. Workers in far north Queensland know that this government is leaving them behind and they absolutely will not forget. And they also know that this government has had seven years to diversify the economy in Cairns and has failed to do that as well. They know that this is a government that turned its back on these workers when they needed them. And they will never forget. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Faruqi. So, Acting President, I rise tonight to speak about the scourge of far-right extre extremism and its normalization in our politics and our culture. A couple of weeks ago, we saw the end of the catastrophic Trump presidency in the United States. The litany of policy failures, corruption scandals, criminal investigations into senior officers and a fundamentally racist political agenda was stopped off by Donald Trump trying to steal an election and incite a violent far-right insurrection at the U.S. Capitol building. People dismissed those of us who called Trump a dangerous authoritarian and a fascist. They said we were overreacting. They said we had no idea. But Trump's legacy speaks for itself. It gives me no joy to say we were right. Every person in our political class who indulged Trump and gave him an easy run has some serious explaining to do. That means everyone from the Prime Minister Scott Morrison down. The problem is that while Trump has temporarily been sent off to play golf in Florida, 
the white supremacy and autocratic politics he represents still remains. History tells us that failed attempts to install fascist autocracy are often followed by successful attempts. America is by no means out of the woods just yet. In Australia, Trump-style politics have infected our own. While the far right has long been part of Australian political landscape, what's new is that the far right conspiracy theories, talking points, and talking heads are now a norm, and on channels like Sky News. Government backbenchers like George Christensen appear to have no shame in spouting Trumpian racism and extreme right-wing views, and without any sign of sanction from the Prime Minister. We saw the Deputy Prime Minister, Michael McCormack, shamefully comparing the attempted violent white supremacist insurrection at the US Capitol to the Black Lives Matter racial justice movement. It matters for us because we are so far from resolving our own problems with far-right extremism and white supremacist politics. I've said it before, and I will say it again. Australia is yet to grapple with being the country that raised the Christchurch killer. Since the deadly Christchurch mosque attacks almost two years ago, the evidence for the growing far-right threat on our shores has continued to pile up. Late last year, a New South Wales teenager was arrested facing terrorism-related charges, with police saying that he had an extreme right-wing ideology focused on neo-Nazi, white supremacist, and anti-Semitic material. In January, it was widely reported that a group of 40 young white men went on a camping trip in regional Victoria, making white supremacist gestures for photos to be shared on social media and terrifying locals. I welcomed the announcement of the PGCIS inquiry into extremism, critically including far-right extremism established late last year, and I look forward to seeing what the committee is able to uncover. I would strongly advise the committee to pay careful attention to the Aotearoa Royal Commission report into the Christchurch mosque attacks and the lessons it can teach us for how we approach terrorism, security, online extremism, racism, and religious hatred. The committee should also engage with and solicit submissions from the Muslim and Jewish communities and other communities targeted by far-right violence. There are careful policy and legislative responses that must be considered, but bigger and perhaps more difficult than our policy response is changing our political culture. We have to ask the basic questions and really engage in some introspection. What sort of behavior and rhetoric do we consider acceptable from our political and media elites? Where do we draw the line? And crucially, when somebody crosses that line, what are the consequences? Are there any consequences at all? One aspect of Trumpian politics that has seemed to filter into our own is the real lack of accountability or shame for wrongdoing. Speech matters. What we say matters. How far-right violence is reported matters. Unless there is accountability for failing to meet the high standards expected of us, it will go on. I hope that 2021, the government will finally reject the lure of post-truth politics and Thank populist you, extremism. Senator Ricky, Senator Wish Wilson. Acting Deputy President, we've just witnessed what decades of powerful people lying has led to. Now, truth in politics goes back a long way. I'll give you that. But the post-truth world, this concept that somehow you can create your own reality if you're powerful enough, you have a big enough platform, you have the media in your pocket, goes back to possibly one of the greatest lies of all, the lie that led us in to the Iraq war in 2003. If powerful people lie with no consequences, with no accountability, then we are bound to repeat the mistakes in our history. In just a few weeks' time, it will be the 18th anniversary of the biggest protests and marches that we have seen in this nation. Half 
a million people around this country marched to stop Australia joining the coalition of the willing and going to an illegal, unilateral, unethical war, a war which nothing good has come from, Acting Deputy President, except instability in the Middle East, more global terrorism and the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. And I can't think of a more important time in history than now to be nominating Mr Paul Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021. And I'm very proud that the Australian Greens, uh, Senator Rice, my colleague and I, have formally nominated Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for that most distinguished prize. Granting him the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize would convey the vital link between peace and a free press. This is more urgent and relevant than ever. The achievement of genuine and lasting peace requires truthful information in the hands of movements, parliamentarians and people. Assange is being prosecuted for exposing real numbers of civilians who had been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, thousands upon thousands of people who were the victims of bombings, maiming and torture. He has also published information about journalists killed by Western forces in Iraq. The information released by Assange in WikiLeaks has been used as evidence in court cases all around this globe, freeing prisoners exposing scandals, torture, murder and illegal surveillance. For this work, Assange is in the health ward of Belmarsh Prison, facing extradition and charges attracting a virtual death sentence in the US, the country whose war crimes he exposed. Julian Assange has sacrificed everything, everything, so that we can better understand our world the impacts of lies and lies in politics especially, and the wars that we find ourselves seemingly eternally caught up in. Awarding Assange and WikiLeaks the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize would demonstrate that in facing truth about war and militarism, courageous action can be taken to realise peace and justice. I remind the Chamber that everything published by WikiLeaks was 100 per cent factual. That's never been denied. But it embarrassed many powerful people, Acting Deputy President, including many who took us to this illegal war. Half a million Australians protested, but it made no difference at all. It made no difference at all. And I have a message for you, Julian. If you are listening, I am standing in the Australian Senate and I am saying to you, I am proud to have nominated you and WikiLeaks for this award. You have a lot of support and it is growing by the day. Have courage, as you always have, and have faith that we will get you out of Belmarsh Prison and we will not let you be extradited to the US. Senator Steelejohn. Yeah, tonight, aware that in my community right now, uh, so many people are losing their homes. Uh, 56 is the latest count. I'm sadly certain that will rise. Losing their homes to a, a climate-driven crisis, uh, an event. Uh, which will mark, I think, a very difficult moment for our WA community. I've been given the reason to reflect upon all that home is and all that homes make possible. The way that having somewhere to call your own, having a roof over your head, enables you to get through so much to do so much, to retreat if you need to, to grow where you can, to bring people into your life, to recover, to develop as a human being, to laugh and to love. All of these things are made possible by having a safe place to call home. 
Now, many people tonight have lost that home. Many may be losing it right now uh, while I am here. And yet it is also true that for uh, 9,000 people across our state, across WA, uh, they didn't have a home regardless uh, of the fire events that we are struggling through. They are part of WA's homeless community. 25,000 people are on the public housing waiting list in our state. 4,000 people are in crisis or are on the priority waiting list. 3,000 of those folks have a disability. Their waiting list is a year long uh, and uh, in 2020, uh, the state government uh, added only 27 houses uh, to the public housing stock and plans uh, to build only another 47 more. At the same time, uh, they have sold off public housing, making hundreds of millions of dollars at the same time. Now, this situation uh, has developed uh, because of a lack, I think, of basic empathy. Anybody that has spent time uh, with somebody that lives without a home, anyone that's heard their stories, uh, anyone that's had friends that have stared down the barrel of eviction, man, you can't be moved you cannot fail to be moved uh, to action without a basic lack of connection with the humanity of the person you're sitting across from. It is an outrage uh, that in 2021 we have 400 people across the CBD of our city which the state government has no plans to house, even during a lockdown even when other premiers during their lockdowns found a place uh, for people without homes, Mark McGowan and his Labour government are doing nothing. Oh, no, wait, hang on. Hang on, I can hear people say, oh, the, the response has been much better this time. We've learned from our mistakes during the first lockdown. Yes, oh, wow, how good of you. They have, they have increased the distribution of PPE. So, no house, but you can have a mask. Now, a couple of weeks ago, when uh, many homeless folks gathered in Fremantle, across from the office of the social uh, minister, Simone McGurk, uh, and said, look at us, look at this problem, address it. What was the Premier's reaction? to pour scorn upon it, to deride it as the work of activists, and to move people into accommodation uh, only weeks at a time where they still have no permanent solution. This is not good enough. Everybody deserves a home to call their own, and that is what I am proud to say the Greens are fighting for at this election. Uh, Senator Fiavanti Wells. President, in my last speech regarding Cardinal Pell in this place, I noted that alleged facts regarding crimes for which he was convicted were implausibility heaped on improbability, especially when considered within the broad historical context of when the crimes were alleged to have occurred. Those crimes for which he was ultimately acquitted by the High Court in a unanimous 7-0 judgment, however, were not the only allegations made against Pell. They were but the tipping point of a relentless campaign against him, waged over decades and which continues to this day. Today I want to address some of those other accusations that have been made against Pell. These accusations, like those which were taken to court, are implausible, but did not have the opportunity to be examined at any trial, though trialled by media, nor have they been tested in any court except in the court of public opinion. 
As stated last time, Pell's Melbourne response provided monetary compensation, counselling and a direct personal response to abuse survivors was lauded at the time of its launch by the media and even Victoria Police. Two decades later, the Royal Commission proposed a strangely similar redress scheme to the world-leading one established by Pell in 1996. Like any system, the Melbourne response was not perfect. Criticisms that were repeated over the years without substantive rebuttal were sensationalised by a misleading 60 Minutes report in 2015, aired just days prior to Cardinal Pell's scheduled third appearance before the Royal Commission. It produced maximum damage to his reputation and was crucial in poisoning the mind of the public against him. I want to address these criticisms without the hysteria that often accompanies assessments of his work. The first criticism was that the Melbourne response was established to save the Catholic Church money by capping payments initially at $50,000, then $55,000, $75,000 and since 1 January 2017, $150,000 with the opportunity for earlier claimants to obtain a top-up payment linked to the new cap. The Royal Commission's Redress and Civil Litigation Report revealed that, actually, Pell's Melbourne response was more generous than other schemes in state-run institutions. Queensland, cap $40,000, average payment $13,000. Tasmania, cap $60,000, average payment $30,000. South Australia, cap $50,000, average payment $14,100. And Western Australia cap 45,000, average payment 23,000. The Melbourne response at an average $38,800 per claimant paid out the most to individual claimants. 60 Minutes also challenged the independence of eminent psychiatrist Professor Richard Ball and independent commissioner Peter O'Callaghan QC, each appointed by Pell to assist in the Melbourne response. Regarding Professor Ball, it was suggested that there was a conflict of interest in his role of leading the professional support components of the Melbourne response because he occasionally treated and acted as an expert witness in cases involving pedophile priests. 60 Minutes failed to mention, however, that the conflict was addressed by the Archdiocese expressly precluding Ball from having contact with victims of any priest perpetrator he was treating, nor did 60 Minutes note that the Royal Commission itself stated that it had no doubts when it came to Ball's integrity. Instead, Ball was portrayed as duplicitous. In one egregious example, host Tara Brown misrepresented two documents produced by Ball in relation to pedophile priest Kevin O'Donnell. The first document was described as a secret report to O'Donnell's lawyers examining his 50-year history of abuse, which O'Donnell admitted had continued until some three or four years prior. The second letter, described by Brown as directly contradictory to the first, was addressed to the sentencing judge and described O'Donnell as having no inclination or opportunity to re-offend. Holding up these two letters side by side, Brown attacked Ball and, by extension, Pell's promise of independence of the response. The report conveniently omitted that the letters were written by Ball in July 1995, some 15 months before the Melbourne response was established. Brown's implication was that Ball provided evidence in O'Donnell's favour during the course of his appointment with the Melbourne response, something that was patently false. Importantly, 60 Minutes omitted to cite the limited scope of engagement given to Ball by O'Donnell's lawyers on 19 July 1995 to limit your inquiries and your opinion to the issue of the effect the imprisonment would have on my client, given his age and his medical condition. O'Donnell's lawyers commissioned Ball's report for sentencing only and provided to the court at their discretion. Ball was not asked to or capable of providing anything to the court directly. 60 Minutes also attacked the independence of Commissioner O'Callaghan because his formal retainer to act as commissioner came from the church's own solicitors. 60 Minutes omitted that O'Callaghan accepted as true 97 per cent of the complainants complaints made to the Melbourne response, a staggering statistic that exposed questions impugning his independence as shallow. It also aired the allegation by David Ridsdale, nephew and victim of convicted ped pedophile Gerard Ridsdale, that in February 1993 Pell tried to bribe him into silence. However, Documents provided to the Royal Commission revealed that Catholic Church authorities already knew the police were investigating 
uh, Ridsdale prior to his alleged bribe. David Ridsdale's own statement to that commission said he did not want to report the matter to the police or otherwise go public. In this light, it made no sense that Pell would try to bribe his silence. There was simply no reason for him to do so under the prevailing circumstances. Brown also went as far as to accuse Pell of lying in a previous 60 Minutes interview back in 2002. In the 2002 interview, Richard Carlton asked Pell if he had been shown a photograph of Emma Foster, the daughter of Anthony and Chrissy Foster, with slashed wrists after a suicide attempt. Pell had met with the Fosters in their parish after he had heard of the dreadful experiences of their daughter. It was in that meeting the Fosters say they produced the photo of their daughter, Emma. When Carlton produced the photograph, Pell said, I've never seen the photo with the slashed wrists. When Carlton mentioned that the Fosters had said they'd given it to him some six years earlier, Pell responded, well, I don't believe I've seen it. I've got no recollection of that. More than a decade later, at the Victoria, Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry, Pell was asked whether, when shown a photo of Emma Foster after she had slashed her wrist, he responded, hmm, she's changed, hasn't she? In responding to this question, Pell replied, probably, but that the production of the photo was something sudden and that he didn't have a chance for a considered response. In the later 60 Minutes episode, this was sensationalised as a bombshell admission that followed years of denial. Pell had never denied seeing the photograph, let alone persisted in such a denial for years. He had merely said that he did not recall seeing the photograph. It does not appear that between that interview and his 2013 testimony before the Victorian inquiry that Pell publicly mentioned the photograph at all, let alone engaged in some persistent denial it had been produced by the Fosters. Alas, truth does not make for good television, nor does it assist in building a narrative about an unsympathetic Pell that 60 Minutes and other outlets, including the Fairfax Media, the ABC, The Guardian, to name a few, were so eager to portray. Pell did not receive a fair trial and saw his unjust jailing almost universally celebrated by a public whose opinions had been shaped by a biased media so eager to delight in his conviction that they broke a court-ordered suppression order to do so. Too few voices were raised in his defence, and those who did speak out were vilified. It is important that when facts are obscured, the truth, with the benefit of hindsight and calm reflection, be placed on our parliamentary record and spoken in this place. This is simply because, as Pell said on his release from prison in April this year, the only basis for long-term healing is truth, and the only basis for justice is truth because justice means truth for all. I look forward to more truth-telling on this issue. To be continued. Senator Polly. I rise to speak on ovarian cancer, as I do every February for Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. This is an incredibly important cause, and it is a time when we recognise and support women diagnosed with ovarian cancer and their families. This year marks Ovarian Cancer Australia's 20th anniversary. From its humble beginnings, this organisation has become the leading national body taking action for Australians affected by ovarian cancer. The challenges of 2020 have placed extraordinary pressure on Australian charities, and as a result, Ovarian Cancer Australia has had a year like no other. Despite the challenges, Ovarian Cancer Australia shifted to a new norm by increasing their telehealth capacity and taking more of their work onto a digital platform in order to provide their essential services. Despite these efforts, since the start of the pandemic, there have been a significant drop in cancer cases being diagnosed in Australia. Understandably, COVID-19 has placed a strain on all of us in some way and caused a lot of fear and anxiety around contracting the virus. This has seen a lot of Australians deferring medical attention with new symptoms or attending routine follow-ups appointments. 
Cancer does not disappear as a result of reducing testing. It just goes undetected, and that is why it is so important to be aware of the signs and symptoms of, of ovarian cancer and to talk to your GP and rebook any missed medical appointments. This year, to help raise awareness through February, we suggest hosting a teal tea for friends and family and colleagues. Ovarian cancer is the eighth most common cancer in Australia. Every year, around 1,580 Australian women are diagnosed, with the overall five-year survival rate for women diagnosed with ovarian cancer being just 46 per cent. That means that of the four women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer every day, there will, three will die from the disease. There is no effective screening program or early detection test for ovarian cancer, so the best way of detecting the disease is to know the signs and symptoms. These symptoms can be mild or be very similar to less serious medical conditions, but it is important to listen to your body, trust your instincts and see your doctor. As well as this, it is imperative that we all take the time to become informed of this disease so that all Australians are able to identify ovarian cancer and take action so that we can change these tragic statistics for future generations. The most reported symptoms for ovarian cancer include increased abdominal size or persistent abdominal bloating. Um, we know that uh, a lot of the symptoms are very similar to the symptoms uh, that women regularly feel. These symptoms, if they persist for two weeks or more, you should go and see your GP. If you're not comfortable with your doctor's diagnosis and you're still concerned about the unexplained persistent symptoms, you should always, always seek a second opinion because you know your body better than anyone else. So you have to listen to your body and you must persist until you're satisfied you have been correctly diagnosed. Unfortunately, it is not uncommon for these symptoms to go unnoticed and even when presented to your doctor to be misdiagnosed or disregarded. This was evidence in the national study which took place in 2015 by the National Support and Advocacy Organisation Ovarian Cancer Australia found that the most vast majority of women experience more than three of the common symptoms of ovarian cancer before their diagnosis and that most of the diagnoses were provoked by these concerns. Despite this, 47 per cent of diagnoses require two or more visits to a GP. 21 per cent of women had to go to three or more GPs and 18 per cent were presented to the emergency room. For a disease where early diagnosis dramatically increases your chances of survival, it is so important to advocate for yourself and if something doesn't feel right, as I said, you must persist. We need more resources are needed to educate and find a cure for ovarian cancer so that we can give hope to the women and reduce the number of women who die from this disease. It is alarming to consider that in my home state of Tasmania, wait times to see a gynaecologist are on average 26 days for urgent referrals, 138 for semi-urgent and 286 days for non-urgent referrals. Given that the symptoms of ovarian cancer are associated with other non-serious conditions, women could be waiting for, for months to receive a diagnosis and treatment. This is simply unacceptable and we all deserve better. Unfortunately, the likelihood of survival has not increased over the last 30 years. Ovarian cancer has the sixth highest mortality rates of all cancers amongst Australian women. But I'd now like to turn to uh, another issue that I want to speak about as being a, uh, a very proud Tasmanian. I know that our um, 
Chief Whip here, um, Senator Urquhart, being a Tasmanian, and Senator McKim, would share with me and want to congratulate the 2021 Australian of the Year, a proud Tasmanian, Grace Tame. As a survivor of child sexual abuse, she displayed immeasurable courage and bravery to speak out about her trauma and to advocate for others to have who have not been able to speak out, who have been victims of this atrocious crime. For too long, victims of sexual abuse could not speak out about their experiences, even if they wanted to. In what could only have been a gruelling process, Grace was required to obtain a special exemption from the Tasmanian Supreme Court for her to be able to speak out. But she didn't stop there. She kept fighting to have the archaic laws changed. This law allowed her abuser to speak out and to brag about his crime, but put a gag order on Miss Tame. She wanted the world to know of the harrowing details of her case and to warn us of the disturbing and sinister process of child grooming. She was vulnerable, and in what was a clear imbalance of power, she was taken advantage of at the hands of a calculating and very manipulative perpetrator. Her courage and advocacy for sexual assault survivors is inspiring to each and every one of us. Her encouragement of individuals to tell their stories has an immeasurable impact on them and our community. I think the hashtag Let Her Speak campaign will continue to lead and to give courage to those marginalised girls and young men who have been abused and who deserve to be heard and supported. No one should ever be ashamed or be shamed into being silenced and to just have to tolerate what had happened to them. Your title provides for Grace Tame. Her title provides her with an unparalleled platform to be able to continue championing her cause and the issues that she has been acknowledged for. It was a brave move from a young woman who had to tell her story, a story that unfortunately hadn't been told often enough in this country. But through her bravery, she has shone a light on the issues around sexual abuse of children, grooming of children that is happening every single day in our communities. So I wanted to put on record, as so many people have through the media and other forums, through social media, to congratulate her on being the Australian of the Year. As a proud Tasmanian, I wish you all the very best you, for Senator. the years to come. Polly, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, today I raise once again the plight of temporary visa holders who have been stranded overseas due to Australia's international border closure. In particular, I want to talk about the children who have been separated from one or both of their parents for up to a year. I am aware of cases involving 42 children from 34 families who have had their lives and families ripped apart by the government's cold-hearted approach. The pain, the anguish and the trauma that is being caused to these children and their parents is incalculable, and there is no end in sight. They remain locked out of our country simply because they are on temporary visas and cannot get an exemption to return home to Australia. Today I'm going to read out the names of these children so colleagues can understand that we're dealing with real humans, real children and real families. Firstly, German Singh Chechi, who is only 18 months old and who is staying with an extended family in India. She is separated from both of her parents 
at 18 months old. I'm aware of nine children who were born in Australia and have lived their whole lives in Australia. Danny Talebi, 12 months old. Danny's father, Hassan, is an asylum seeker and cannot leave Australia. Tavia Singh, 13 months old. Delisha Patel, 15 months old. Zirwa Daniel, 25 months old. Adash Patel, 21 months old. Kaylin Kausi, two years old. Naimet Daliwal, three years old. Maiz Samiula, three years old. Amrin Lahoria, four years old. Each of those children is stranded overseas with one parent while the other parent is in Australia. Then there are four mothers that I'm aware of that were forced to have their babies overseas. These four children have never met their fathers. Mirza Osman Ali Baig, three months old. His mother, Afrin, was forced to have him in India. Barza Hassan, five months old. His mother, Ayman, was forced to have her in Pakistan. Noah Kausi, six months old. His mother, Melanie, was forced to have him in Mauritius. Yosef Moza, seven months old. His mother, Sarah, was forced to have him in Egypt. Remember, they were forced to have their babies overseas and they've never met their fathers. We have 28 children of skilled visa holders and international students who we invited to come to Australia. Mahin Usman, Usman, 18 months old. Mayra Guleria, 19 months old. Amelia Anas, 22 months old. Tejavsi Pradeep, two years old. Devan Silva, three years old. Navira Hashmi, four years old. Harsab Panu, four years old. Kian Malik, four years old. Omar Salahadan, four years old. Diana Saga, five years old. Ananya and Ishani Singh, seven months old and 13 months old. Faid Nafi, seven years old. Tosa Ekram, eight years old. Ali Yosaf and Mohammed Jawad Patel, eight years old and five years old, respectively. Kritika Kaura, nine years old. Sanyukta and Soham Sen Sarma, 15 years old and eight years old, respectively. Leander Lara, Kenny Lara and Emmanuel Jevan, 13 years old, 11 years old and 19 months old. Shamanta and Nashita Islam, 13 years old and nine years old. Jorko and Davor Miloshevsky, 16 and 14 years old. And two other family, children from two other families aged nine and two. All of those children are stranded overseas with one parent and separated from their other parent who is in Australia. They have suffered rejection after rejection after rejection by this government. And the government says they don't meet the government's criteria for a compelling and compassionate case. Some of these families have been rejected 60 times. In what world, colleagues, does a child being separated from their parents or a parent for over 12 months not count as compelling and compassionate? This pain and trauma has to be stopped. We have to look after these families and allow them to be reunited as soon as possible. And I again implore the government to grant exemptions to all families where a child is separated from one or both of their parents, irrespective of their visa class. But it's not just children who have been separated from their parents. Couples have also been torn apart by Australia's travel ban. I'm currently advocating for 199 couples which are separated. Some separated couples are on temporary visas. Some are Australian citizens whose partners are stranded offshore because they are on temporary visas, while others are couples separated while they wait, while they wait for their partner visas and prospective marriage visas to be pro processed. Many are experiencing such extreme stress and pain 
due to the 10-plus month separation from their partners that they are experiencing mental health issues for the first time in their lives. I ask senators, how would we all feel if we couldn't see our partners or our children for 10 or more months with no end in sight? I also, uh, in my office, have on my books 358 people or families separated from their homes and lives who have come to me desperate for help. Entire families on temporary visas that are stranded overseas. While they aren't separated from each other, they are separated from their jobs, their incomes, their assets, their homes, their communities and their lives. These are families languishing overseas with only what they packed in their travel bags, sleeping on couches, staying with family and friends and waiting and pleading for the government to address their situation. Then there are the skilled visa holders that we invited into this country because we wanted their skills. They too are stranded overseas. Chefs, construction workers, teachers, mechanics, lawyers, IT consultants, accountants, people that work in the aged care sector. The businesses they work for are suffering losses from the ongoing absence of key team members during what are already very difficult economic times. I'm also aware of people on student and graduate visas who've now paid thousands of dollars to come and study here and are watching their visas run down and expire through no fault of their own. People on temporary visas have a legal right to be here in Australia. They are not tourists or people hoping to come here for a holiday. They live here. Their homes are here. Their jobs are here. Their lives are here. Their families are here. They work here and pay taxes here. We have an obligation to these people to do the right thing and let them come home. I implore the government to address these issues and I implore the government to address the people in these horrendous circumstances directly. Tell them what your plan is for them. Show them the respect and courtesy that they deserve. We invited them into our country. Many of them are guests in our country. Others work in our country. Many have built lives in our country. Their children go to school in our country. They own businesses in our country. They pay and have paid taxes in our country. We are a better country than this. When you invite people into your homes, you don't slam the door in, the fa in their faces when the going gets tough. But that's exactly what we have done to countless people who are living their lives in absolute distress because this government believes that they should not be allowed to return to their homes here in Australia. We've got to do better. Senator Scar. <clears throat> Mr President, I am a passionate believer in Australia's manufacturing industry, and hence I am a passionate supporter of the Scott Morrison government's advanced manufacturing strategy. If the last year has taught us anything, it is that we must make more things here in Australia. As a sovereign country, we need to be less dependent upon overseas supply chains. We need to add value to our vast natural resources. And we need to unleash that great Australian entrepreneurial spirit, which has been at the forefront of some of the greatest inventions the world has ever seen. The government's modern manufacturing strategy has four pillars. First, getting the economic conditions right for business. Second, making science and technology work for industry. Third, focusing on areas of advantage. And four, building national resilience for a strong economy. And recently, I had the opportunity 
to see how the government's manufacturing strategy has translated to assisting manufacturing businesses on the ground to grow and to prosper. I visited two great Queensland businesses with Minister Karen Andrews, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Now, Minister Andrews is a great Queenslander and she's doing great work in overseeing the government's advanced manufacturing policy. The first business we visited was Trump's Food and Product Processors. Trump's are wholesalers, distributors and processors of nuts, dried fruits and more to the retail food service and manufacturing industries. They are a third generation Queensland owned business, three generations, established in 1939 by Dr John Leslie Dart, who was actually an eye specialist in Brisbane. Dr Dart's son, Mr John P Dart, took over the business and continued to grow it. And Mr John P Dart's son, Declan Dart, is now the managing director. Three generations in one family building a great Queensland manufacturing business, and it was a privilege to visit them. Trump's food and product processors received assistance from the Morrison government to invest in an auto-coding software system and automatic labelling hardware, which has increased their efficiency, increased their production, increased their employment. It's a win-win-win all round. I was so impressed with the facility and the passion of the staff. You can tell a business has a great culture the moment you step into it. And there was no better example in the case of Trump's than when in January 2011, Trump's operation at Rockley was inundated by the Brisbane flood. However, the company's employees, suppliers and customers rallied around them and helped the business get back in the extraordinarily short period of time. Mr President, I should also note that Mr Declan Dart's father, Mr John P Dart, the second generation in this extraordinary tale, this great Queensland success story, has recently passed away. I say to the Dart family what a legacy Mr John P Dart has left, a legacy which I'm sure will continue to go from strength to strength. The second company I was delighted to visit with Minister Andrews was a company called the Evolve Group, and the managing director of that company is a Mr Ty Hermans. The Evolve Group has helped develop, manufacture and bring to market inventions with a specialty in plastics and composites. They recently received funds from the federal government's Innovation Connections Program, which promotes collaboration between small and medium-sized Australian businesses and the research sector to develop new ideas with commercial potential. Now, Mr Hermans has been undertaking some absolutely inspiring work in this, part, in this space. And during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, he actually managed to source equipment from China, which enabled face masks to be produced. And they're being produced today. Minister Andrews and I saw them being produced today in the facility at Crestmead, south of Brisbane. Mr President, I was so impressed with the vision, the Aussie know-how, the technology and the culture again of that organisation. So impressed with their industrial designers, where every single millimetre can make such a difference to the commerciality of a product. So impressed by their reuse of plastics. I actually picked up a pool filter, which had been manufactured out of recycled Coke bottles, recycled out of plastic Coke bottles. Just absolutely amazing stuff. This isn't recycling. It's upcycling, and it's being done here in Australia. I say to Mr Ty Hermans and his team, government can only do so much. It is the entrepreneurial spirit of Mr Hermans and his team that is driving the success of this company, with a little bit of support from the Scott Morrison government. Finally, Mr President, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate another great Queensland company, Illum. Today, they announced that they've been awarded a $300 million contract from the US Department of Defence to provide 8.5 million at-home COVID test kits for the United States. Just think about that. Just think about that. A company in Queensland, my home state of Queensland, in Brisbane, has just been awarded a $300 million contract 
to manufacture take-home COVID-19 tests and export them to the United States. And that's happening here in Australia. It's just absolutely inspiring. Alum is at the forefront of creating digitally connected diagnostic devices, allowing individuals to self-test for diseases such as the flu. I pay tribute to Dr Sean Parsons, the managing director, and to that great bunch, that great group of original investors and shareholders who had faith in Dr Sean Parsons and his vision and who invested in that company. I also pay tribute to all of the staff who have been part of that journey. And when I visited the business in 2019, you immediately got a sense of the culture of teamwork that was apparent in that company. The employees really enjoyed working for that company. You could see it. They were part of the journey, and that has all the hallmarks of a successful organisation. So there we have it, Mr President, three great Australian manufacturing companies at the forefront of their respective industries today. And there's some common themes there. Visionary entrepreneurial leadership, culture of great teamwork, great Aussie, Aussie know-how, and support from the Scott Morrison government. And with those things, there is absolutely nothing that's going to stop the growth of the Australian manufacturing sector, and that's got to be a wonderful and absolutely great thing, a terrific thing, for my home state of Queensland and for our beautiful country. Now, I'll ask the leave of the Senate to go back in the list to Senator Lambie, if uh, later speakers are happy with that. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. One of, one of the only good things to come out, out from last year was when the government upped job seeker payments by $550 a fortnight. I know how much that money meant to people. It gave more than a million Australians a chance to breathe. They finally had their head above water. There are people out there who had been getting by for years on hardly anything at all, and they had found that really hard. And for the first time in a long time, they saw a meaningful rise in their incomes. They could pay their rego or put their aircon on without having to worry about the cost, or pay their kids or buy their kids a cheap laptop to do their schoolwork online. For the whole lot of people who lost their jobs through the pandemic, those that went on job seeker payments kept things on track while they waited for things to pick up again. The government says they're going to take away that coronavirus money in March. When that happens, a single person will have to find a way to live and look for work on $283 a week. And I can tell you what, we've seen all this before and it's not much to live on. And there's going to be a lot of people out there who just can't get by on such a tiny amount of money. Some of them will have to stop paying rent on their homes. They might find themselves having to move further away from where the new jobs are. They might not be able to afford the car registration anymore. I don't want the government to push people into desperation in a couple of months. Government policy shouldn't create desperation. That's pretty basic standard, I would have thought. But I also understand where members of the coalition are coming from and when they say that the supplement needed to be scaled back. If we'd kept the coronavirus supplement at 550 forever, we'd start to see problems with people choosing to stay on welfare instead of getting back into work. And I get that. This is the thing. If we go back to the old job seeker rate, people just aren't going to be able to keep their heads above the water. At the same time, the government isn't going to raise the rate. They're determined to go back to the good old payment rates when the coronavirus supplement ends in March. There's some people who want to hit the government over and over again about how awful they are for not raising it. I get that. It is awful that people are going to have to go back to living on nothing. But no matter how much we stomp our feet about it, there's going to be job seekers who need help and who are not going to get it. No matter how much outrage there is going on and no matter whether or not they're getting food in their bellies for every meal that they should. There's other people out there who say, we've just got to focus on getting people into work instead of raising the rate. And they're right too. But the thing is, Living on nothing makes it harder to do that. You can't afford the shoes that you need, the suit jacket, the bag to show up for a job, job interview and look like a good candidate and compete with the rest of them. What makes it worse is that when the government winds back the COVID-19 support, they're going to go back to the old income test that we had before. That test takes 50 cents out of every dollar someone on JobSeeker earns after they've worked for more than three hours a week. No carrot at the end of the stick. 
it takes 60 cents out of every dollar they earn from working more than seven hours a week. Once again, no carrot at the end of the stick. The government likes to cut taxes because taxes discourage people from working. When the government clips 30 cents in every dollar you earn, they say that's enough to make people want to earn less. I agree. What I don't get is how losing 30 cents in the dollar stops you from wanting to work, but losing 60 cents in the dollar apparently isn't a problem. We reward people from going from job seeker into a job by taxing them at a higher rate than what Malcolm Turnbull is currently paying. We pat them on the back, say we're proud of your mate, and then we shake them down for half their money. How is this supposed to help and encourage people to go back to work? I want to find a way through this. That using the old method is not, it is just, it is unthinkable, it is just not working. I'm not talking about money for nothing here, and I'm not talking about keeping it that I'm not keeping it the way it is either. We can just do better than punish job seekers for getting a job. It's just not encouraging, it's not working. There's much better ways of doing it, and we could come out on top. And so could the other people, and so could people out there that are on job seeker. But right now, you need the carrot at the end of the stick, not punishment. You're supposed to be going, woohoo! We've gone from seven hours to twelve hours to eighteen hours. That's how it's supposed to that's supposed to work. That's the reality of it. That's how your cashless debit card's supposed to work. It's supposed to have a carrot at the end of the stick. That's tricky forest, creating parity. You've got to have the carrot at the end of the stick. But we're still using the old method. We have a perfect opportunity to reset on how we deal with this, and we're not doing that. And I have to ask why. I want to now speak about the media bargaining code, because I find this quite amusing, to be honest with you. The major parties are falling over themselves to support the media bargaining code. I get that. Google and Facebook haven't got a lot of friends in this place right now. Plenty out there. Trust me, they love them. But cool your jets, guys, because this code is not as crash hot as you think it, is, it might appear. Google and Facebook bring eyeballs to news companies. They're how people find their news these days. The cost of delivering those eyeballs isn't free. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars for Google and Facebook to make a product good enough to take over the whole market. It's paid for with advertising. Google's basically got a monopoly on the search engines. If you want to run any advertising against search results, you've got to go through Google. The code would mean that some of that advertising revenue that Google gets from companies would be required to hand over to news companies. Google's got three options here. It charges more for advertising to keep its profits at the same rate, or it charges the same amount for advertising and its shareholders just take a hit, or option three, it pulls out. It goes elsewhere. No media companies get a benefit. No Australian consumer gets a benefit. I get that Google's a big bad boy right now, but let's be honest, it's only as big as it is because it has a better product than its competitors. How about that? That's how it works in big business. It is using its money to improve the standards of its products, and that's a good thing for consumers. We get a better service. We don't have to pay for it. If you don't believe me, spend a day using Yahoo and good luck to you with that. So Google's got a monopoly, right? And it's got three choices. If Google's made to pay more for that monopoly, they're just going to pass on that cost to their consumers. Because there's nobody else who can compete with them on that price. They're a monopoly. They don't have any competition. News Corp and Nine don't care about that. They're not the ones who'd have to pay the piper. The ones who pay for it are the people who rely on digital ads to promote their businesses. And this is what really, really gets me. They're plumbers, they're forests, they're pizza shops, they're hairdressers, they're shoe stores. And they ain't making millions, I can tell you. Their advertising budget is tiny, absolutely tiny, and is measured in three or four figures. Taxes can't turn monopoly into a market. All you, are is, all you are taxing is the end user. For Google, that's the advertiser. That's the small business out there. 
I'm no big fan of Google or Facebook. Facebook, don't get me wrong, and I think we need more good journalism in Australia. I'll tell you what, we could certainly do with that. I think we'd all have to agree on that. And we aren't going to get that by sitting on our butt and waiting for some decent rain. But if we want Google and Facebook con to contribute to a better society, let's just tax them. Don't create a code. Common sense tax them. Just make them pay some tax. I don't know if they should get a special set of rules, but I don't think they should get a special exemption from them either. And if we want decent journalism, let's pay for it out of the tax. Make it tax deductible. Expand grants for quality journalism. Invest in regional news gathering. Back public broadcasters. Don't keep taking bricks out of its walls, saying it's got enough left to not notice the difference. Because sooner or later, you don't have enough left. Invest in newswire services like AAP that are independent, non-for-profits that exist only to deliver news, unbiased and accurate from, everywhere to, from anywhere to everyone, for no other reason than because news matters. This code deserves a bit more scrutiny than the free run it's getting right now. Not everything that hurts a, bit, hurts a big bad company of the day automatically becomes good. Not when the ones that end up paying the bill aren't the big bad companies at all. They're smaller than News Corp and Nine. They are smaller than them. They're the ones in my backyard. They're the ones in my backyard trying to survive, to keep their doors open, to keep their businesses open. That's why it's so much easier to ignore it while they're being thrown under the bus. And it is just not fair. It's not fair that you go and pay an advertising much more money for Order, small business. Senator Lambie. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I have a duty to raise and fix issues that are both hurting and concerning everyday Australians. As a senator, I work for the people. Tonight, I raise a matter of great concern for everyday Australians, particularly our hard-working coal miners. Australians workers are feeling afraid for their jobs, for their livelihoods, for their future. Workers need fairness, integrity, trust and accountability. I'm concerned for the many workers and businesses, small and large, that have suffered from state and federal government COVID restrictions. Business leaders and workers are all looking for direction from this government, yet at the same time a government authority is doing the wrong thing and abusing workers. What I've witnessed since coal miner Stuart Bonds and I took up the cause of the exploited, abused and discarded Hunter Valley casual coal miners is a mass of evidence pointing to a potential systemic failures and possibly corruption inside a government agency. An agency that Hunter Valley CFMEU bosses and Minerals Council of New South Wales executives jointly govern and direct. We Australians cannot afford our own government to continue shonky behaviour at a time when we should be spending our money wisely. Thanks to Stuart Bond's voluntary help for abandoned workers like Simon Turner and others, the coal LSL scam was uncovered. Simon Turner and many workers wrote for help from their local MPs, including Joel Fitzgibbon, six times. And to this day, Joel Fitzgibbon has ignored their letters six times. Joel Fitzgibbon has been the member for Hunter since 1996, so it's surprising that he does not know that coal miners are the key to this area's future. The agency involved is the Coal Mining Industry Long Service Leave Funding Corporation, better known as Coal LSL, an Australian corporation established to regulate and manage an Australian government corporation established to regulate and manage long service leave entitlements on behalf of eligible employees in the black coal mining industry. What I hear is that governance isn't just lacking, it's completely absent. Yet I'm, I'm yet to hear why casuals get a different long service leave rate to permanents on the same rosters, same work. Why? As an example, coal LSL system seems incapable of checking whether an employee actually receives their correct long service leave entitlement. Coal LSL just accepts an employer letter and pays the employer. No validation or checking of payments to entitlements to actual payment to employees. Now, a recent analysis of information that Coal LSL themselves provided reveals evidence of duplication, even triplication, of transactions paid to employers. The reporting recently provided to me is unclear. Levy reimbursements during 2018, for example, include a category for details not readily available. What does that mean? Or, for example, the $264,000 of refunds, not reimbursements, 
paid out from July 2017 to November 2018. What are these refunds? Where's the transparency? Coal LSL makes lump sum payments that, again, make reconciliation complex, difficult. For example, one of BHP's operational services entities in the Hunter Valley received $187,881.77 in a single transaction in May 2020. For who? It seems that Coal LSL may not be able to confirm employees are even real people as they do not collect ABN or tax file numbers. They simply get a name and a date of birth. They're operating in the dark ages and need a modern system to prevent fraud. In some cases, we've heard of companies in Singleton being reimbursed for coal long service leave, even though they did not work on coal mining. In one case, Coal LSL paid reimbursements totaling approximately $57,000 to the wife of the owner of a Queensland company with no state office. Why? We have learned of an employee not receiving onboarding information about the Coal LSL scheme, particularly in regard to the employee option to opt out of the scheme and save money. In one case, recently a coal miner reported that Coal LSL debited his entitlement for 250, for 250 hours of long service when he actually had not taken any leave from his employer. Where's the governance? Concerns have been expressed to me that Coal LSL's current processes might enable a bogus company to register and then to possibly launder money through Coal LSL and then reclaim the funds cleaned and available to be transferred to criminals. Where are the checks in the system? Now the CEO, listen to this, whose annual remuneration is a staggering $430,187 and her governance officer have clearly been asleep at the wheel. I have personally challenged Coal LSL many times as Senate estimates, and even they do not understand how entitlements are accrued, invested, reconciled and paid to individual coal miners. The CEO could not provide a satisfactory response to a simple question in regard to how Coal LSL accounts for monies paid in and monies paid then to employees. The question is that if bogus companies have been paid in the last seven years, then how could this not be picked up? I'm informed that Coal LSL takes registered companies at their word. That has already led to Coal LSL admitting serious errors in miners' accounts and entitlements under my questioning. As Coal LSL has revealed in Senate estimates, it has not listened to the complaints of many coal miners who found discrepancies in their entitlements. Once raised, what's more, Coal LSL is slow to or un unresponsive. Now, I encourage coal miners to check that Coal LSL has correctly stated their entitlements so they're not ripped off. Simon Turner, an exploited Hunter Valley coal miner, is a case in point, where after years of requests and complaints, Coal LSL took the word of his rogue employer, Chandler MacLeod. Over solid evidence over Simon's and over Simon's legitimate request for a fair go. Coal LSL is lax at informing employees of their options, with many casual miners not told that they're entitled to choose to not contribute to the scheme and to instead take their employers' ca cash contributions as cash in hand. Let's face it. At the moment, Coal LSL receives the employer contributions for many casual coal miners who it never has to pay out if employees do not stay for the eight-year qualifying period. Where does this mountain of cash go and how is it accounted for? What I do know is that many casuals would be better avoiding Coal LSL. There are many, many examples of Coal LSL failing in its obligations and failing to have appropriate checks and balances to verify that employees are getting their entitlements. For all we know, there may be systemic corruption on this government's watch. Have unaccountable union bosses and Minerals Council of New South Wales executives on this Morrison government authority lined their pockets using bogus companies at the expense of coal miners throughout Australia? We just do not know. Clearly, it's time for change. We're talking about an authority that thousands of workers rely on to protect long service leave entitlements. An authority with a culture biased towards pleasing the employer, not on protecting and being accountable for employees' entitlements. This is not the coal LSL clerical staff's fault. It's the board and management who must stand up and be held to account. Governance does not exist and the culture of coal LSL is not solutions or customer focused. Clearly it's time for change. For too long, coal LSL has operated as a rogue government authority. Until I brought them before Senate estimates, they were never called upon to explain their actions. It was the suffering of exploited and abandoned workers like Simon Turner that put a spotlight on, on coal LSL and its culture that ignores abandoned workers. 
Clearly, it's time for change, and that change must be now. Today, Stuart Bonds and I are strongly advocating for change in coal LSL and a reconciliation of all accounts and entitlements to ensure that workers and employees are not being ripped off. Workers and employers are not being ripped off. Stuart Bonds and I pledge to work for justice for workers hurting from the actions of unthinking, uncaring, unaccountable government authorities like coal LSL. Authorities under the joint control of shadowy union bosses and a minerals council acting for uncaring mining conglomerates. The same mining companies and union, union bosses that enabled the exploitation of casual miners in the Hunter Valley. Clearly, it's time for a change. Coal LSL needs to be taken out of the hands of self-interested parties. Coal LSL management needs a broom put through it, a chance and a change to build an open, honest, transparent, transparent accountable culture to prevent the entitlements of everyday to protect sorry the entitlements of everyday australian workers a change to build an open honest transparent accountable culture to protect the entitlements of everyday australian workers i implore all workers and everyday australians rural and city to vote with your feet please go and tell your local union branch member of parliament and senator that you expect that workers rights and entitlements are to be protected tell joel fitzgibbon that the time for talk is over and it's time for action. Tell Joel Fitzgibbon, the New South Wales Minerals Council and the CFMEU Hunter Valley Union bosses that coal LSL, like all government bodies, must demonstrate the highest standards of integrity to protect workers' interests, to behave with common sense and transparency. Workers in Australia deserve integrity and support. Thank you. Senator Betts. The union movement's disgraceful Stop the Bus campaign invites the rightful retort, Stop the BS. The unions involved know the campaign is based on falsehoods and cynically designed to scare people. In doing so, they distract attention from the important work of the Registered Organisations Commission, which recently recommenced its investigation into serious allegations of unauthorised use of funds from the Australian Workers' Union under its former National Secretary, Mr Shorten. This brings to an end three years of diversions, vilification and failed legal challenges by the AWU and the ALP <coughs> in their attempts to prevent the ROC undertaking this investigation. This follows the decision of the full bench of the Federal Court in November to comprehensively reject the desperate attempts of the AWU to shut down the investigation. For three years, the AWU abused its members' money, engaging in frivolous and vexatious lawfare to try and prevent the investigation. Its desperate tactic was to attempt to destroy evidence. Fortunately, a brave whistleblower inside the AWU alerted the ROC to this activity and the ROC was compelled to procure search warrants for the AFP to seize this evidence before it could be destroyed. This was back in October 2017. Since then, the AWU has desperately tried to challenge this process in the courts, but the courts have found that the actions of the ROC and the AFP were all beyond reproach. Every single claim made by the AWU in relation to the actions and motives of the ROC, the AFP and the government in this matter have been comprehensively rejected by judges. The AWU asserted collusion between government and the ROC in commencing the investigation. It lost. It asserted collusion between government and the AFP. It lost. It asserted that the ROC had acted at the direction of the government. It lost. It asserted the ROC's decision to investigate was made for an improper political purpose. It lost. It tried to challenge the decision of the Victorian Magistrates Court to grant the search warrants. It lost. It asserted that the AFP's decision to execute the search warrants was invalid. It lost. It sought a court order to prevent the ROC from ever looking into these matters at all. It lost. So now, after three years, the ROC can finally receive the documents seized by the AFP that the AWU was so desperate to hide. Whilst ultimately futile, the AWU's doomed and expensive court process did have the effect of delaying the ROC's ability to commence its investigation. 
it had presumably hoped to frustrate the process for enough time for Labor to win the last election, after which Labor would abolish the ROC. In this endeavour, as well, thankfully, it lost. There is one element of the AWU's tactics which demands closer scrutiny, and that is what the ALP under Mr Shorten would have done if it had won in 2019. It's well known that Labor policy was to abolish the ROC, but this would have required legislation which may by no means be assured. It took three years to pass the legislation in the first place. It may have taken just as long to abolish the ROC. To forestall this possibility, the would-be shortened government had another dirty trick up its sleeve to frustrate the ROC's investigation. Mr Shorten was planning to immediately defund the ROC. This would not require legislation that could be done at any time by an incumbent government. By starving it of funds, it would have prevented the ROC from both defending itself against the AWU's costly legal challenge and it would have starved it of resources to conduct any investigation once the AWU's legal case inevitably failed. All this is there on page 26 of the ALP's election costings document. Yet Mr Shorten's costings document reveals that it would have slashed the funding for these organisations but not provided extra funding to either ASIC or the Fair Work Commission to ensure that appropriate probity might be exercised by registered organisations. Equally notably, the ALP costings just did not include those much-needed increases. In other words, there would be no resources anywhere for anyone to continue the work of the ROC. This would have meant that all investigations and all legal proceedings that were underway would need to be dropped. For whose benefit? Only one person's, Mr Shorten's. This plan reflects an extraordinarily devious and manipulative intent. By shutting down an agency that had an investigation on foot in which Mr Shorten was a key person of interest, he would have used his powers to evade any possibility of being held to account. This would have represented the most significant conflict of interest ever for an Australian Prime Minister. It also would have been the most politically corrupt act ever by an Australian Prime Minister. Shutting down or nobbling law enforcement agencies that may be investigating members of a government is the stuff of Putin's Russia or tin pot dictatorships. The idea that we would have seen such actions in Australia is truly sinister and worrying. We should all be grateful that it never came to pass. Now, thankfully, The Rock can undertake this much needed investigation. But of course, the AWU promised that it would cooperate. It did not do so. Indeed, the current AWU uh, Secretary, Mr Walton, in a report in the Australian newspaper on the 9th of March 2019, said, and the quote is, AWU National Secretary Daniel Walton has promised to release all documents once the legal process is completed, even if the union loses the current court case. Not surprisingly, Mr Walton has not lived up to that promise. I also remind the Senate of Mr Walton's comments at a press conference on 24 October in which he said, the AWU has and will always cooperate with any investigation, be it with a registered organisations commission or any other body set out to investigate us. We've cooperated from the beginning. If so, why the three years of lawfare? The claims, of course, are brazenly dishonest, as Mr Walton's so-called promise to release the evidence. If Mr Shorten is found to have misappropriated funds from his, unions, from his union, then he will be no different to other former union bosses, such as Cathy Jackson, Craig Thompson, Michael Williamson 
all of whom were found guilty of similar conduct at their union, the HSU, at the same time of Mr Shorten's alleged breaches over at the AWU. The difference between the HSU and AWU is that the new leadership of the HSU cooperated and cleaned up and sought to protect their members. The current leadership of the AWU is continuing, continuing to work and conspire with the old leadership of the AWU to ensure that these things are not cleaned up, to ensure that these things are not exposed and brought to light. In the weeks, months to come, Mr Shorten will finally be held to account for any wrongdoing in which he may have engaged. But we should remember the old truism that it's not necessarily the crime but the cover-up that is worse. Just as Mr Shorten should be held to account for any misuse of his position at the AWU for his own benefit, so too should Daniel Walton and anyone else who has misused their position at the AWU to run an equally scandalous cover-up. More importantly, the Australian people need to be reminded that Mr Shorten put forward to the Australian people specific policies designed to ensure the nobbling of an investigation into his personal activities whilst he was secretary of the AWU. That makes him a person unfit for public office, and it remains to be see, seen what is ultimately determined in this matter, but I look forward to the ROC's full investigation. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. As Australian Greens spokesperson on foreign affairs, it's a sad reality that I too often have to rise to speak in this place on human attacks on human rights around the world. And we will continue to speak out about human rights violations wherever they occur, because we believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all people. That's why we call out human rights violations here in Australia wherever they occur, and we'll do the same in other countries wherever that happens. Like millions around the world, I'm incredi incredibly concerned about the declaration of emergency law by the Myanmar military and the unlawful detention of Aung San Suu Kyi, President U Win Mint and other individuals. The November 2020 general elections reflected the will of the people of Myanmar to keep building their democracy and must be respected. We urge the Myanmar military to release those that have been detained and to cease interference with election outcomes and democratic tradition, transition. I visited Myanmar in January 2019 as part of a mentoring program for women MPs organised by the International Women's Development Agency, IWDA, and worked with the program over the last two years, including hosting a group of women MPs who visited us here in Australia. Now, I'm now really worried for their safety and the safety of the other MPs who have recently been elected. Being involved in the IWDA mentoring program made us very aware of how the road to democracy is a bumpy one, but we did not foresee that the military would be so brazen as to take control and to overturn a democratic election result. There are steps that the Australian government can and should take immediately. Australia must scrap all military ties with Myanmar until democratic processes have been restored. And we should impose targeted sanctions on General Min Aung Hlaing and all others involved in this action by the military. And we should also accept any political refugees from Myanmar seeking protection in Australia. Moving to Sri Lanka. Sadly, we have seen the release of a report by the United Nations Human Rights, Commission, Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner. And that report warned that the failure of Sri Lanka to address past violations has significantly heightened the risk of human rights violations being repeated. It highlights worrying trends over the past year, such as deepening impunity, increasing militarisation of government functions, ethno-nationalistic rhetoric and intimidation of civil society. And there are two particular issues I want to mention tonight. 
We have heard from many community members and groups that they are devastated by a Sri Lankan government policy forcing the cremation of the bodies of people who have died from COVID-19, even where this goes against the wishes of family members. And it's particularly concerning, given there is no advice from the World Health Organisation recommending cremation, and it appears to be a particular persecution of Muslim people for whom creation goes against their religious practices. And I'm also very concerned by reports of the destruction of the Mulivaikal Tamil Genocide Memorial Monument inside the premises of the Jaffna University by the Sri Lankan state, and a pattern of destroying Tamil mon monuments. And so to all Sri Lankan community members who've been in touch, I want to say that I hear you, and we're incredibly concerned about what's been happening. We call upon the Sri Lankan government to protect the human rights of all of its citizens, and we urge our Australian government, particularly Minister Payne, to raise this issue with their Sri Lankan counterparts at both ambassadorial and ministerial level. As well as speaking out for the human rights of those in countries around the world, tonight I want to particularly highlight the human rights of Australians who are stranded overseas, the stranded Aussies. And Amnesty International has been very vocal on this issue. I want to thank both Amnesty and the many individual Australians and community groups who have campaigned in incredibly hard on, the str on the stranded Australians. As Amnesty International said, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights say that everyone has the right to return home to their country and shall never be deprived of the right to enter their own country. Of course, we recognise the importance of complying with health advice, but the clear role here is for the Commonwealth to step up and to show genuine leadership by creating more quarantine facilities. I mean, section 5110 of the Constitution explicitly provides a head of power for the Commonwealth with respect to quarantine, and the Commonwealth has a real responsibility here. Instead, Prime Minister Morrison has abandoned Australians overseas and tried to pretend that quarantine is a state responsibility. So let's be very clear. We call on the Australian government to do everything it can to build and fund new quarantine facilities or repurpose existing facilities that are safe and comfortable to enable Australians stranded overseas to return home. Yes, this may in incur an additional cost, but this is a real responsibility that we have to Australians overseas to ensure that they have a viable pathway home. I mean, we've heard some incredibly hard stories through the COVID-19 committee from people stranded overseas. And expanding quarantine capacity would allow families to be reunited. It would bring people together who haven't seen each other for years, and it would mean that Australians could be brought back safe and sound to a country where they can rely on their networks and support from their and our government to respond to this pandemic rather than being left stranded overseas. The Prime Minister must do more. If he cares about Australians, he needs to expand Commonwealth quarantine facilities. I also want to speak tonight about the situation in the Western Sahara. The Australian Greens condemn the violence and breakdown in the UN-backed ceasefire in Western Sahara. And any acts of aggression by the Moroccan government are unacceptable. We urge the UN to broker a ceasefire as soon as possible. And more than that, we strongly support the right of the Sahrawi people to self-determination. They've been waiting for decades for a long-awaited referendum, and the United Nations should finally organise a free and fair referendum on independence in Western Sahara without further delay. The Australian government should do what it can to support those efforts. We call on them to use all diplomatic channels available to advocate for an immediate cessation of hostilities and support all efforts to organise a free and fair referendum on independence in Western Sahara. I also want to speak briefly about police brutality against pro-democracy demonstrators in Thailand. People have been protesting for months there. And we believe that the right to protest is important and must be protected. I, mean, I understand that in Thailand, in some instances, police have set out barriers and barbed wire to prevent peaceful marches from reaching the parliament. And beyond that, they've used water cannons laced with dye and chemicals 
as well as tear gas grenades and pepper spray grenades. Water cannons were fired as part of an effort to disrupt and disperse protesters, some of whom were students and children. And reports indicate that protesters have been injured, including from tear gas, and some of those injured include very young children. So we call for action by the Thai government to protect human rights, and we call on the Australian government to make representation to its counterparts bilaterally and, as possible, through multilateral forums to advocate for the rights of protesters and to ensure they are protected. I want to conclude my contribution tonight supporting the protesting farmers in India. They have encountered an incredibly difficult situation. Even before the current protests began, farmers had long faced shrinking plot sizes and declining farm incomes. And now they are facing laws that would leave them even more at the mercy of the multinationals. Eleven rounds of negotiations have failed to resolve their concerns. And they've protested for months, and it's tragic that 60 farmers have died during the protests. It is an incredibly concerning issue. The and time. One, um, excuse me, Ms. Acting President, the clock was not right at the beginning. I've only got one paragraph to go. <laughs> is, that, is that correct? Yes, it's a mistake. Sorry, my apologies. Thank you. It's an incredibly concerning issue and one that we call on the government of India to address. The Indian government must abandon its unfair changes to their agricultural laws and to do more to protect its farmers and to ensure that their human rights and well-being are ensured. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Chair. I rise tonight to speak on the current situation in Western Australia, where an absolutely dreadful uh, wildfire is uh, racing through the north and east of the city of Perth, heading uh, down towards Ellenbrook. It's already destroyed at least 56 homes. Uh, many others are damaged and, unfortunately, uh, over the course of the evening we could see that uh, property toll increase. Uh, now, thankfully, at this stage, and obviously this is a, still a situation very much uh, in progress, uh, there have been no, uh, no loss of life uh, caused by the bushfire. Everyone is accounted for according to the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia, and that is obviously very good news. And uh, We must thank all those members of the firefighting service in Western Australia uh, who are putting their lives on the line, protecting the property and lives of other West Australians, be they professional firefighters or volunteers. They are standing in the fire front and uh, seeking to control uh, what is an extraordinary blaze and one that is being fanned by extremely strong uh, winds uh, at the moment from the east. Uh, as we think about the nature of fire in our environment. We need to cast our minds back um, to the generations before and the way they dealt with the bush. The bush in Australia, in Western Australia, has been actively managed. It was actively managed by Indigenous Australians and it was act actively managed by uh, our farming communities and um, the forestry uh, workers of the timber industry uh, when it existed in significant fashion. In my hometown of Pemberton, where there used to be many thousands of workers employed uh, in the forestry industry, there was a cadre of people who understood the bush, who understood fire, who understood uh, the heavy equipment, machinery needed. But the point is that people could be put on the ground. Now we have news coming through this evening that a large uh, water bomber has landed in Perth uh, coming from Sydney. And that's great. And they are an extremely useful tool, particularly in protecting property. But we must not get carried away by technology as the complete solution. We saw uh, in this fire season a significant fire on Fraser Island in Queensland where something like uh, 117 water bombers were used over the co uh, course of, uh, 17 water bombers were used over the course of many hundreds of missions uh, to try and control that fire and the success was was not terribly good water bombers particularly in areas of heavy bush cannot replace people on the ground 
And so we as a society need to think about how we're going to manage those in bush environments to make sure that as our populations do increase and as we see more and more houses in peri-urban areas, uh, in the last 10 years something like 300,000 new dwellings have entered peri-urban areas in Australia. We must find ways of protecting those people, of managing the environment uh, around our capital cities but also in regional areas, and we must actively manage the land. Locking up and walking away is never a solution. As I've said, this land has been actively managed uh, uh, basically forever, since, since there have been humans on this continent. Uh, when my father was a young man, you could gallop through the bush around our family farm in Pemberton. In fact, we had the large uh, coastal leases from our freehold land down to the coast. And that land, um, when uh, the, first, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first members of the colony to go south, to take up land for agricultural purposes, they found bush that you could ride a horse through. Uh, this is not country that can be locked up and left. It needs regular cool burns in order both to be safe for human habitation but also to keep the environment relatively clean and open. There are now pieces of bush, pieces of carry forest uh, uh, extensively throughout the southwest, where you literally cannot even physically walk through that bush. That is not how it was. That is not how it has been for thousands of years. And whilst we restrict, make it difficult for that land to be actively managed, while state governments fail in their responsibilities to actively manage the state forest under their jurisdiction, we are going to find a situation where these wildfires are, are, are continue to grow in strength uh, and continue to be a serious threat both to life and property. Uh, water bombers, yes, they are part of a modern arsenal of techniques that firefighters can use. But it's not going to replace those people on the ground, people with the knowledge and skills, and not just when a fire is happening. It's got to be an active management of the environment before those fires even occur. And to do that, we must be much more active managers of that land uh, right throughout the year, and that needs to start as soon as possible. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Before I start commence my um, adjournment speech, I seek leave to table a document uh, entitled the Attorney General's Report No. 6, 2018-19, Army Protected Mobility Vehicle Light, confidential report issued under paragraph 37 of the Auditor General's Act uh, that has now been released under FOI. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. For the first time, the parliament is now able to see the material that was prepared for parliament by the Auditor General, but was then subsequently censored by the Attorney General using a never used, a never before used power under section 37 of the Auditor General's Act. I obtained it under freedom of information laws after the AAT found that there was nothing sensitive in it and ordered the Prime Minister to hand it to me. Now, I want to give some context here, some background. On the 11th of March 2017, the Auditor General commenced a performance audit into the procurement of the Hawkeye Light Protected Mobility Vehicle from Talis Australia Limited by the Department of Defence. By about December 2017, so some seven or eight months later, the Auditor General held a draft report substantially in the form in which he intended uh, to table it in the Parliament. Both Talis and Defence were aware of the content of the draft report as it stood at that time. On 5 January 2018, 
Thales applied to the Attorney General for a certificate under paragraph 37.1b of the Auditor General's, uh, sorry, of the Auditor General's Act. Uh, in respect of certain contents in the draft report, on the basis that the public publication of this content would be contrary to the public interest because it would unfairly prejudice Talis's commercial interests. On the, it took some time, so the Parliament was then delayed having access to any audit. Uh, on the 28th of uh, June 2018, the Attorney General issued a certificate uh, under Section 37 of the Act which stated, in his opinion, inclusion of certain information contained in the public report would be contrary to the public interest for one of both of the following reasons. It would prejudice the security, defence or international relations of the Commonwealth, and it would unfairly prejudice the commercial interests of anybody uh, or person. So there was a claim being made by the Attorney-General that the information that the auditor had prepared was in actual fact national security sensitive and commercially sensitive. On the 11th of September 2018, a redacted report was published by the Australian National Audit Office. On the uh, 6th of September, so uh, just, the, just prior to that point, the Auditor General actually sent a confidential version of the, what I'll call the public report to the Prime Minister's office. Now, because of the uh, unusual exercise of the power, the JCPAA conducted an inquiry into the censoring. Report number 478 of the JCPAA was a report entitled Issuing of a Certificate under Section 37 of the Auditor General's Act. 1997. In that inquiry, the Auditor General made a submission which is highly instructive. In amongst that submission, he said, much of the information required to be admitted from the audit report to Parliament was analysis by the ANAO. Further, the required omissions reached into the Auditor General's conclusions relating to the audit objective, which was to assess the effectiveness and value for money of the acquisition. So a primary focus of the Auditor General is, do our procurements achieve value for money? And he was being prohibited from providing his views to the parliament. He also said, the Auditor General remains of the view that the public interest was clearly balanced in favour of disclosure of his full audit conclusions uh, and the ANAO analysis on the basis that the Parliament, the Executive and public would reasonably expect to be informed as to whether Defence conducted an effective procurement process. Further, the Auditor General has not received any information which would suggest the particular information the subject of the certificate could otherwise be withheld from Parliament on the basis of a claim of public interest immunity. So there you have it, the very experienced Auditor-General making it very clear that what was in his report was not sensitive. Now that would, might well have been the end of it, except I was disturbed by the censoring and I sought the report under FOI. The government fought tooth and nail, tooth and nail, to prevent me having access to this. First claim was that the PM's office was performing an Auditor General's function, and therefore uh, it, it, uh, the document couldn't be obtained under FOI. Somehow the Prime Minister th thinks that the Auditor General somehow resides in his office. Second uh, attempt was a. Uh, 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 an attempt by the Prime Minister's barristers uh, to claim that it involved complex constitutional issues and issues of parliamentary privilege. And then we got finally down to does it have national security or commercial issues associated with its disclosure? It's interesting, during the proceedings, barristers for the Prime Minister submitted this, and I read this, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen in an FOI argument. 
I quote, the respondent says that the publicly available information cannot be disclosed because it's in, uh, it is uh, inexorably in interwoven with the analysis that the respondent claims is exempt from disclosure, and disclosing the publicly available information in the context in which it appears in the report will um, inf um, inferentially disclose much of the substance of what the respondent seeks to protect by its, ex its exemptions claims. We've got a barrister for the Commonwealth arguing that, you, that uh, the Commonwealth shouldn't be required to disclose publicly available information. The AAT found that it was neither national security sensitive or commercially sensitive. So let's have a look at what was considered sensitive. Just uh, looking at some of the information in the report I've tabled on, uh, uh, on page uh, six. Defence has not clearly demonstrated that the acquisition provides value for money, as it did not undertake robust benchmarking in the context of a sole source procurement. That's the Auditor General saying that if you do a sole source contract, so you go only to one player, you must, in, uh, as a matter of good practice, go and see if you can establish whether the price is reasonable that you are being charged by the person who is the recipient of that sole source contract. Somehow that statement was considered by the Attorney General as national security sensitive. It wasn't national security sensitive. It was embarrassing for the Department of Defence. It wasn't commercially sensitive. It was embarrassing for the Department of Defence. Again, and I quote, publicly available information suggests that the non-audited per unit price difference between the Hawkeye and the joint light tactical vehicle exceeds the price difference advised to the government at second pass. The Auditor General saying that uh, defence misinformed the minister and somehow that is national security sensitive. Somehow that is commercially sensitive. We've got a vehicle cost comparison that was conducted by the Auditor General that is basically considered to be um, confidential, even though the analysis was done uh, by uh, officials in the uh, Auditor General's office using publicly available information. So two things come from this. Firstly, it, this goes to the Attorney General's competence in respect of making judgments about national security. He clearly failed in, his, in the exercise of judgment in this instance. And it makes me worry about things like Witness K, Richard Boyle, David McBride, uh, media raids, all of those sorts of things where permission uh, has been obtained in respect of things like prosecutions, some of them are now censored because of national security when we've got an attorney general who simply doesn't understand national security. But it also goes to the general transparency or, or lack thereof of the Morrison government. So many OPDs in this place have been refused by this government, and then I've obtained them under FOI. There's this fairy dust claim over every uh, matter before the National Cabinet, when in fact the National Cabinet uh, is not a, not a traditional cabinet, and we'll find out at some stage that it doesn't actually qualify. Democracy requires engagement, and it requires informed engagement, and we're not getting that. Senator Wong. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I did want to take the opportunity just before we wrap up tonight to join Senator Brockman in expressing my concern on behalf of the opposition about the bushfire situation uh, that we face in Western Australia at the moment. Uh, as Senator Brockton, uh, Brockman has outlined, uh, it appears at this stage that there are at least 56 homes which have been destroyed. Uh, I think that everyone across Australia has breathed a sigh of relief throughout this summer that we haven't seen the sort of bushfire damage that we saw last Christmas. Um, so it is obviously uh, extremely concerning to see homes being destroyed at this point in time. Uh, can I encourage everyone in Western Australia who may be uh, in the line of these fires uh, to listen very carefully to emergency broadcasts and follow the emergency warnings that are being issued? Uh, and again, I join with Senator Brockman in thanking uh, the firefighters and community members who are putting their lives on the line to keep their communities safe right now. Uh, this is another reminder that disaster season is far from over. We have known for months now that with the La Nina conditions we face uh, this summer, 
Uh, we face a higher than average risk of floods and cyclones in our country's north, uh, but also uh, it has been flagged for some time uh, that we face potentially fires uh, above average risk of fires in certain parts of Western Australia, and unfortunately it does seem that that is now coming to pass. So all of us wish our uh, Western Australian uh, friends the best in uh, what must be a very worrying time. While I'm on my feet, and again just briefly, uh, I did want to recognise um, uh, the change in my responsibilities and thank uh, Labor Leader for giving me the additional role of representing the Queensland resources industry and resources workers uh, in this parliament. Um, and I think that the fact that uh, Mr Albanese has appointed me, or anyone for that matter, to the role of Shadow Minister for Queensland Resources demonstrates uh, that he gets very clearly the importance of the resources industry to my home state of Queensland. Uh, having been on the road with Albo uh, in mining communities over the years, I know that he understands very clearly the jobs, the exports and the royalties um, that really matter to our state and which arise from the resources industry. Uh, there can be no doubt uh, that Labor supports workers in the resources industry. We are the party who has always stood for and will continue to stand for secure jobs, secure pay and a secure future for workers in the resources industry. And that's why we've been so vocal in recent years about the rampant casualisation and abuse of labour hire that we have seen in the resources industry, unfortunately, by some employers. Uh, it is something that is yet to be matched by this government who like to talk a lot about how much they like mining workers but haven't actually done anything to fix the problems of casualisation and labour hire, which have been identified over and over again by mining unions and by the federal opposition. Uh, there is legislation now before the parliament, finally, from this government, which is hopelessly deficient in terms of addressing the casualisation issues. Uh, and we hope that at some point the government backs up its rhetoric about casualisation with, um, uh, with ac serious action. We know on this side of the chamber uh, that uh, we will continue exporting our, our coal, gas and other resources for years to come, uh, and we support the workers in those industries uh, over that time. However, we also support strong action on climate change, and that's where there is a significant difference between the government and the opposition. Unlike the government, Labor has committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050, and I would note that a number of the largest resource companies in this country have also committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050. BP, BHP, Rio Tinto, Santos and many others have themselves committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050. So you would really think that if some of the biggest resource companies in this country can reach net zero emissions, then you would think that the government of Australia would actually be able to match it as well. But as we all know, uh, the Queensland Liberal National Party, including Senator Stoker, are completely in cl uh, climate change denial, refuse to back the resources industry uh, in their own commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050. So unlike the government, we do support action on climate change because, of course, it reduces emissions and is good for our climate, but it also is good for jobs. And unfortunately, this government's refusal to deal with the reality of climate change and take serious action is actually holding back jobs in my home state of Queensland. So, as I say, Labor, unlike the Greens and unlike the LNP, believes that our resources industry has a strong future and also we should be creating and capturing the job opportunities that uh, await in renewables and manufacturing powered by clean renewable energy. I do not understand for the life of me why the LNP in particular want to stop central Queenslanders and other regional Queenslanders from grabbing the jobs that are available Order. in renewable industries uh, and in manufacturing powered by cheap clean energy because of their own internal divisions. Of course we should support the existing industries in our existing resource industries, but why would you want to stop new jobs from being created in regional Queensland as well in the way that the LNP seems to want to do? So on the one hand in the political climate we have at the moment, we have the Greens who say that you can't have the existing jobs, we've got to get a, rid of the existing jobs in our existing resources industries and we should only be about the new jobs in renewables. 
On the other hand, we've got the LNP who don't want to know anything about the new jobs and are actively trying to stop them from going ahead while saying that they want to support existing, uh, existing industries only. Labor believes that there's actually a future for both. There is a secure future for our resource industry workers, and we're right behind them in doing that. But also, we should be grabbing the new uh, jobs that are available in new industries as well. That's what sets Labor apart. It's about time both the Greens and the LNP woke up to themselves and made sure that we are about more jobs in more industries, not about abandoning jobs in old and new industries. The Senate stands adjourned and will remain and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.